You are now tuned into Then Radio. If you enjoy our videos, we ask that you consider joining our Patreon to support our channel. Don't forget to like and subscribe so that you never miss a new video. We hope you enjoyed today's episode, and as always, thank you for watching. It's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Cotter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure is... The Echo of Death. Or Nick Cotter and the Phantom Clue. No, no, please, don't kill me, don't kill me. Hold him still. They're just like that. This has got to look right. No, I'll, I'll do anything you say. I'll forget everything I know. Only don't... <laughs> All right, he's dead. Now, come on. Hello? Yes, this is Nick Carter speaking. A case? What kind of case? A disappearance? Well, that's hardly in my line. Uh... Oh, I see. Yes. Yes. Yes, I understand. All right, expect us late this afternoon. Did you get that on the extension, Patsy? I should say so. Echo Valley Lodge, private amphibian plane waiting for you at the airport. Come at once, never mind the fee. <laughs> who is this Howard Manstead who tosses money around like confetti? A well-known millionaire sportsman, Patsy. But uh, wouldn't it be more to the point to ask about the man who's disappeared? Oh, you mean James Thurlow, the columnist. Why, he's... He... Say, who is he, anyway? That's what you get for not reading the financial pages of the paper, Patsy. Well, come along. We've got to find a taxi and get to the airport. Well, aren't we going to take anything with us? Oh, yes, of course. I was forgetting. I thought you were. I'll need my new dress. We'll want my... Scubby. Call him and tell him to meet us at the airport. He knows Thurlow. They write for the same paper. But why aren't we going oh, to... Oh, and take... one other thing, Patsy. Bring along volume three of the encyclopedia, E to H. Scubby Wilson and volume three of an encyclopedia. That's just what a girl needs for a visit to a millionaire's hunting lodge. <laughs> So seldom visited because of its somewhat inaccessible location, Echo Valley is a natural freak of singular interest. I have friends you could say the same thing about, but the encyclopedia doesn't mention them. Quiet, Scabby. Let Patsy finish reading. Echo Valley is of great interest to scientists. Sounds occurring in certain areas of Echo Valley may be repeated as many as 13 times, echoing from cliff to cliff in gradually diminishing volume. Why do encyclopedias always use so many words to say so little? Hmm. That's what I wonder about newspaper reporters sometimes, too. So we'll change the subject? <laughs> what else does it say? That's all. Well, that's no help. Thurlow certainly wasn't carried off by an echo. Oh, he's probably just lost in the woods. In any case, I don't see why Manstead insisted on you coming out to look for him, Nick. You're no Indian guide. Patsy, if Thurlow isn't found alive, it may cost the public millions. Millions? Well, he's just a columnist, isn't he? Just a columnist? He's the smartest financial reporter in New York. And Thurlow's more than just a reporter, Patsy. In the financial column he writes, he sometimes tips the authorities off to big stock swindles and other kinds of financial skullduggery. Right. It was Thurlow who broke open the Nemo Bank scandal three years ago and sent the whole board of directors to prison. And for some time, Patsy, Thurlow has been hinting in his column that he was on the verge of revealing some kind of tie-up between certain politicians and uh, one or two big operators that would rob the public of millions. Oh, then if anything happened to him now, before he's had a chance to tell anybody what he knew, the scheme would go through his schedule. Right. That's why he went to Echo Valley Lodge. Manstead, an old friend of his, invited him out so he could work in peace for a few weeks. Scubby. Huh? 
Is it true that Thurlow was on the verge of a nervous breakdown when he left? Oh, he was walking around in circles talking to himself, Nick. Hmm. He had almost all the dope he wanted, but he still hadn't got the name of the guy behind the whole scheme. He took along a whole bunch of records of stock transactions. He said they might give him the clue he needed. And, hey, look ahead of us. Echo Valley. It is, isn't it, Nick? No doubt of it, Patsy. But look, that isn't any echo flying toward us. A plane. Nick, it's a plane flying up out of Echo Valley. Yes. Yes, it's a private amphibian. I thought this plane of Manstead's was the only one in these parts. Now, the pilot's seen us. Huh. He's turning out of our line of flight. You suppose he wants to avoid us? I'll bet he doesn't want us to see his markings. He is trying to avoid us. Oh, pilot, swing over so we can get a look at that plane down there. Right, Mr. Carter. He knows we're trying to get closer to him. Look at him bank to avoid us. He's turned back. He's heading away from us now. A pilot, overtake that plane if you can. Yes, Mr. Carter. Say, isn't that the Manstead hunting lodge down there, right on the edge of the lake? Yes, Cubby, it is. But we're not going to land until we get some idea what that plane's up to. Look, he's diving straight down now. He's going to try to get away underneath us. Oh, he'll never make it. Those private planes aren't built. His wing is breaking off. Couldn't take the strain. He's heading straight for the ground if he hasn't got a parachute. Oh, but he has. Look, he's jumping. The other shoe's jumping. And there goes his plane into the trees. Well, that was a narrow escape. He didn't have more than 500 feet of altitude. Oh, he's come down on the top of that tall pine. He's caught there. See, his parachute won't come loose. Yes. Well, we'll have to land and rescue him. Besides, I want to know why he was so anxious to avoid having his plane identified. Oh, pilot. Yes, Mr. Carter? Land in the lake and taxi up as close as possible to the place that fellow came down. Yes, Aren't we almost there? Yes, there's the clearing. Just ahead. Only a few more steps. Oh, and they say exercise is good for you. Oh, there. There's his parachute. I think I can see him hanging among the branches. He's hurt or he'd call to us. Come on. His shroud lines are caught among the branches. I can see that much. Well, he's just, just dangling there. Yeah. Hey, you up there. Can you hear us? You all right? He doesn't answer. Look, I'll climb up and see if I can... No. Wait. What is it, Nick? Look at those shroud lines. They're... They're wrapped around his neck. Yeah. Look at the way his head is twisted to one side. Yes. His neck's broken. He's dead. What? Oh. When he landed in the tree, he got tangled in the lines and... I wonder. Nick, what do you mean? Look down at your feet, Scubby. Huh? A cigarette butt. Why, well, somebody must have been here before us. Maybe. But its position makes me think the cigarette was smoked by him up there. Oh, but that's impossible, Nick. It's been just about an hour, Scubby, since he crashed. He knew we'd come after him. So if he was hurt and couldn't get out of his chute harness, what would be more natural than for him to smoke a cigarette and wait to be rescued? But he... he's dead? Because somebody reached him before we did. And murdered him. And so that's the story, Mr. Carter. As much as we know, anyway. Thurlow just wandered away yesterday morning and never returned. Hmm, I see, Mr. Manson. And you don't think this mysterious airplane we met just before we reached here has any connection with Thurlow's vanishing? Well, I don't see how it could. But then, as I said, I haven't the slightest idea where the plane could have come from or who was flying it. Yeah. Now, let's go over the facts again, if you don't mind. Oh, of course not. Thurlow arrived here a week ago? Yes, with his wife. I had them flown in in my plane. They had the lodge to themselves with my permanent housekeeper to look after them. And you arrived yesterday? In the middle of the afternoon. But Thurlow wasn't here when you arrived? No, he'd already gone out. Hmm. He told his wife he was taking his revolver along and would take pot shots at the trees and rocks. So you never actually saw him. That's right. 
The woodsman I employ to look after the property asked me to come and examine some trees he wanted to cut down. About sundown, I got back to the lodge and Thurlow still hadn't returned. Mrs. Thurlow was becoming worried. I ordered the floodlights we used for landing the plane at night, but he didn't show up. And then in the morning, you called me. Well, first I phoned the nearest forest ranger station. And after that, Mrs. Thurlow was so agitated, I had promised I'd send for you. Where is Mrs. Thurlow? I'd like to ask a few questions. Well, she's sleeping now. She was up all night, and this morning the housekeeper gave her a sleeping tablet. Shall we wake her? No, 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 no not just now. There's still an hour of daylight left. I'd like to take a look around outside. Perhaps I'll... Fi- I'll open it. Uh, Mr. Manstead. Johnny. What is it? His hat. We found it. Thurlow's hat? Where? Near the waterfall. Why, that's not far. It's only a mile from here. It's still light. Do you want to come with us and look for him, Mr. Carter? Yes, I think I do. There, there. There's the hat, Mr. Manstead. In that bush. But what in the world could Thurlow have been doing in here? This isn't the trail to the waterfall. It isn't a trail at all as far as I'm concerned. It's a jungle. It used to be a trail to an old one-room cabin, but there's no reason Thurlow would go there. Well, maybe if we yell, he'll hear us. He might be in there with a busted ankle or something. Go ahead and try, Scabby. Thurlow! Thurlow! Good gosh, will you listen to that? Well, that's one reason this is called Echo Valley. The cliffs around the waterfall down the trail make a perfect sounding board. Well, if he didn't hear that, he must be dead. If there's a cabin in there, we better take a look at it. Right. I don't see what in the world Thurlow could have come this way for, but maybe he did. Let's find out. There it is. Where, Manstead? Oh, there, between those two trees. See it? Oh, yes. It's only another 40 yards. Well, come on, then. Oh, Scubby, wait. Well, sure, Nick, what is it? That bare patch of ground there. Those footprints. Thurlow's footprints. You sure, Scubby? Sure. I've seen those pointed shoes of his too often not to recognize the footprints any place. Come on, Nick. Um, yes, yes. I'm coming. Thurlow's a tall man, isn't he, Scubby? He's a tall man like I'm Henry Ford. He's about five feet five. Why? I thought it... Well, never mind. There's the cabin. Gosh, it doesn't look as if it had been opened in years. Well, it hasn't that I know of. But there are Thurlow's footprints going right up to the door. And somebody's opened the door recently. Look at these broken spider webs around the door jamb. And it won't open now. Oh, here, let me try. It ought to open without any trouble. Yeah, but... <laughs> doesn't budge. <laughs> That's strange. Let's take a look through the window. The window's boarded over. The boards haven't been touched. I nailed the window up myself three years ago. Nobody came here since. And someone has come here. Thurlow. And he must be inside now. But the window hasn't been touched. And the door is barred on the inside. It looks bad. We'd better break the door down. Suppose we have old Johnny use his axe on it. That'll be quicker. Of course. Johnny, smash the door open for us. Stand back, please. That door was locked to stay locked. Starting to go. Yeah. That does it. It's open. If you don't mind, I'd like to go in first. Of course. Uh, it's dark inside. Here, take my flashlight. Thanks. There he is. Thurlow. He's... He's dead. He came here, bolted himself in, and shot himself with his own revolver. Yes, he's dead, all right. And it does look like suicide, doesn't it? <laughs> now, now, Mrs. Taylor. Jim couldn't have killed himself, Mr. Carter. He couldn't have. I'm sorry, Mrs. Thurlow. I wouldn't intrude on your grief if it wasn't necessary. Now, first of all, what kind of mood was your husband in yesterday morning just before he disappeared? He was very agitated. Agitated? Well, do you know any reason why he should have been? I, I think he just found a clue to the identity of the man he was seeking. 
The one behind this plot to upset the stock market. Did he say who it was? No. No, he just said he'd stumbled on a clue. And he was so shocked he could hardly believe the evidence. That was why he went out into the woods. He wanted to be alone to think the matter through. Perhaps his notes will tell us what he found. Yeah, I thought of that, Nick. After Mrs. Thurlow woke up and I talked to her while you and Scubby were out with Mr. Manstead, we tried to read his notes. But they're in some kind of a shorthand that nobody can read but himself. I can make out a few words here and there, but not enough to help. Well, we'll have another try at it later. Uh, please go on, Mrs. Thurlow. Well, that's almost all, Mr. Carter. Jim went out about ten in the morning. I stayed here in my room reading. About half an hour later, I thought I heard a shot. All of a sudden, I was terribly frightened. Frightened? Of what? Uh, I don't know. It was just a feeling. Then, then I heard the far-off echo of somebody hammering. It was... Oh, it, it sounded like somebody hammering down the lid of a coffin. And I'm positive it meant that Jim was dead. <laughs> it's probably someone chopping down a tree, she heard me. Anyway, she went back to her reading and forgot about it. And around one, man said from the village... It's a little town about ten miles from the hills. For Johnny to come for him in the station wagon. Manstead phoned. Well, didn't he fly in by plane yesterday? Seems not. A plane was in New York getting a new propeller, so he took the night train. Is that so? Anyway, Johnny went to meet him. He got here about 2.30. The rest of the story is just the way he told it to us. Nick Thurlow must have killed himself. There just isn't any other answer. I wonder, Patsy. I wonder. <laughs> Hello? Yes, speaking. Did you get the dope I wanted? He was? And the plane? Then check every airfield within 50 miles of the city. Yes, I know what's a big order, but somebody's playing this game for big stakes. No, that's all. Call me back when you've learned something. Oh, uh, oh hello, Carter. I, I didn't know anybody was here in the library. I took the liberty of phoning New York. I was trying to check on that mysterious plane that we saw crash yesterday afternoon. I see. Did you learn anything? Nothing yet. You know, I have a theory about that plane, Carter. I'd be interested to hear it, Mr. Manstead. Well, we're only 100 miles from the border, and in the past, planes engaged in smuggling aliens into this country have landed in this region. Now, I'm willing to wager this chap, who was so anxious to avoid being seen, was engaged in doing something like that. Hmm. Certainly sounds plausible. Nick! Oh, Nick! Oh, yes, Scubby. Oh, there you are. Oh, top of the morning to you, Mr. Manstead. Good morning. Say, I was looking for the two of you. Forrest Ranger Thompson and two of his men are down at the landing waiting in your launch, Mr. Manstead. They want to get started down the lake to bring in the body of that flyer who, uh, <clears throat> who was so unlucky when he bailed out of his plane yesterday. Uh, of course. Uh, you're coming with us, aren't you, Carter? I guess, indeed. I'm just as interested as you are to see if your theory turns out to be right. Oh, what about Patsy? Shall I go find her? Oh, no, Scubby. She's staying here in the lodge with Mrs. Thurlow. They're going to spend the morning going over Thurlow's notes, trying to decipher them. Well, let's get going. I want to get back in time to phone a story to my paper. <laughs> I'm afraid it's no use, Miss. Please, just call me Patsy. It's just impossible to read these notes of Jim's, Patsy. They're not only in his own shorthand, but most of them are in code, too. Here's something that seems as if it might mean something. See, it says, I can H-B it. H-B. Mm -hmm. Hardly believe. I can hardly believe it. Yeah. Of course, that's what it means. And here's some more. It's clearer. Shall I tell Manstead what I know? The next line. Better not. Instead, must get back to New York. Well, that's clear enough. But the next line. My life, M-B-N-D. That doesn't mean anything to me. My life, M-B-N-D. My life may be in danger. Oh. And then there's just one last sentence that he never finished. To think that the one man in the world 
And that's all there is. Oh, oh, if you'd only finished. To think that the one man in the world... Oh, who do you suppose he could have meant? I can't even make a guess. The one man. Mrs. Thurlow. What's that? Mrs. Thurlow, we're going to go and take a look at that cabin now while all the others are away. I have a theory, and we're going to find some evidence to prove it. It has to be there. It just has to be. Hello, Nick, my friend. Hey, what's troubling you? You've been sitting out here on this rock for an hour ever since we got back. Looking mean enough to bite your grandmother. Scubby, that poor devil of an aviator whose body we brought in was murdered. And Thurlow was murdered. And I can't prove it. But, Nick, couldn't you be wrong? The aviator certainly looked like a natural accident. And Thurlow, if I ever saw a case that looked more like suicide, well, I don't know where it was. Well, that's just it. The aviator, I can explain. Someone slipped through the woods, reached him before we did, climbed the tree he was caught in, and strangled him with the shroud lines in his parachute while pretending to help free him. But Thurlow, his own footprints leading into the cabin. The window boarded over and the door bolted on the inside. If somebody killed him, well, how did they get out? I don't know, Scubby. It isn't possible. And it was done. I'm going to break the... Hey, Scubby, what's that in your hand? Oh, just a shiny new nail I picked up somewhere. Somebody must have been fixing something. A nail? And Mrs. Thurlow said she heard the echo of hammer blows the morning her husband died. Yeah, said they sounded like somebody hammering down the lid of a coffin. <laughs> they sure have imagination. But that's just what she did here. Huh? She heard the echoes of somebody nailing down the lid of a coffin. <laughs> must be a clue. There must be. But we've been all over the cabin inside and out a dozen times now, Patsy. If there was anything here, we'd have found it. Mrs. Thurlow, somehow your husband was murdered here. And his body left inside this cabin so it would look like suicide. And I'm going to find out how the murderer got out, leaving the door and window bolted, or, or die. I'm afraid you're much more likely to die, Patsy. Oh, oh Mr. Manstead. Yes, Mr. Manstead. After we returned to the lodge and I learned the two of you had disappeared in this direction, I thought I'd better find out what you were up to. You? You killed my husband? Of course he did. Who else could your husband have meant by the one man in the world he'd never have believed guilty? But, but he was Jim's friend. That's what he wanted you to think. He pretended to be a friend so he could always keep check on what your husband learned. And he invited you both here so he could commit murder if he decided it was necessary. Oh. A very interesting theory. But I'm afraid I can't give you a chance to tell it to anyone else. Johnny! Right here, Mr. Manstead. Come inside and close the door. What are you going to do to us? He thinks he's going to kill us. He hasn't got that gun in his hand for fun. Johnny, the old mine shaft is close by. Now, if these two ladies out walking had the misfortune to stumble into it, it would be very tragic, wouldn't it? Lots of people fall down old mine shafts. So they do. And I'm afraid another such accident is about to happen. You can't get away with it, Mr. Manstead. Nick Carter won't let you. Oh, well, perhaps even clever Mr. Carter may have to have an accident. Help me silence him, Johnny. Quickly. No, no, Nick! Nick! Quiet! No! Quiet, I say! <laughs> All right, now, Johnny, knock them both on the head to keep them quiet. All right, let Manstead, go. let go of her. You, Carter! Nick, look out, his gun! Drop it, Manstead, or I... <laughs> Johnny, kill him! Kill him! Johnny, put down that axe or I'll shoot. Yes, sir. He, he's dead. I'm afraid so. That's it. Uh, either of you hurt? No, Nick. You came just in time. But how... How did I know Manstead was a murderer? I knew that from the time we found this cabin. But it took an echo to prove it. The echo, Mrs. Thurlow, that you said sounded like someone hammering. But, but I don't understand. Scubby's bringing Ranger Thompson. As soon as they get here, I think I'll be able to clear up a lot of mysteries. So Manstead was behind the plot that Thurlow uncovered. He invited Thurlow here in order to find out what he knew. He discovered Thurlow had evidence which would tell him the truth. 
and therefore decided to eliminate Thurlow. But, Mr. Carter, Manster didn't get here until after Thurlow was dead. He came by train. And... Oh, Ranger Thompson's right, Nick. He appeared to come by train. Actually, he flew in the night before, in a plane whose pilot was used to taking big fees for keeping his mouth shut. That was the plane that we saw crash. Something delayed it from leaving in time to avoid us, and in the pilot's effort to keep away from us, well, we all know what happened. But, Nick, why was the pilot murdered? That was Johnny's work. As soon as Thurla saw the crash, he sent Johnny by a secret trail through the woods to make sure the pilot didn't live to talk. Otherwise, his murder scheme would have collapsed. Isn't that right, Johnny? Yes, sir. So Manstead flew here the night before he murdered Thurla. In the morning when Thurla left the house, he and Johnny waylaid him. Is that it, Nick? That's it, Patsy. They brought him to the cabin here. Manstead put on his victim's shoes and made a trail of footprints. I see. Then they killed Thurlow, put his shoes back on him, and left him in the locked cabin. A clear case of suicide. But Manstead made a mistake there. His footprints were too far apart. They were the steps of a tall man. When Scubby said Thurlow was a short man, I began to suspect. Well, it certainly does sound plausible, Mr. Carter. But you've still got to convince me Manstead could get out of that cabin and leave the door barred from the inside. Make it good, Nick. Johnny knows the answer. You all remember that Mrs. Thurlow said she heard the echo of hammer blows. You mean she really did hear someone hammering? Exactly. This is a small cabin with a roof lightly nailed in place. Now look up there. What's that flashing in the sun? Looks like nail heads. Somebody's hammered new nails into that roof all along this side. Nick! Is that the clue I was looking for? That's the clue you were looking for. Scubby and I saw it yesterday, but we weren't smart enough to know what it meant. Here, I'll take Johnny's axe and push the blade in under the eaves and pry upward like that. What's the... the whole roof's lifting up. Well, blow me down. Manstead and Johnny pried up the flimsy roof before they killed Thurlow. Then leaving the door barred, they climbed out. And Johnny nailed the roof back into place. Right. So they were hammering the lid in the coffin, so to speak. Thurlow's coffin. And due to the curious echoing qualities of the rocks, the sound carried to the lodge, and Mrs. Thurlow heard it. I didn't think it meant anything until I noticed the nail Scubby picked up someplace. The nail Johnny must have dropped. And then I remembered the hammering sound Mr. Thurlow spoke of. And suddenly the whole thing was clear. Well, it sure wouldn't have been clear to me if you hadn't explained it, Mr. Carter. I certainly wouldn't ever have worked it out with just an echo for a clue. Oh, but that was an unusual echo. Remember how cleverly it answered? And when it comes to answers, Scuffy, Nick Carter is the man who gets them. This was another strange experience of Nick Carter called The Echo of Death, or Nick Carter and the Phantom Clue. The Curious Adventures of Nick Carter, Master Detective, are brought to you every Monday night at 9.30 Eastern Wartime. We'll let Nick himself tell you about next week's story. What'll it be about, Nick? I call it Death Across the Tracks. It began with the murder of a detective. A railroad detective who lived in the station alongside the tracks. He was working on a case, but he had it only partly solved when he was murdered. And I picked it up from there. I'll say you did, Nick. You almost picked up a few bullets into the bargain the way the victim did. (laughs) When you called it death across the tracks, you were right in more ways than one. This sounds more and more intriguing. And how did it wind up, Nick? Well, we'll tell you that next week. But I can say this much. I had a stroke of luck. Nick always calls it luck when he uses foresight. Good night, folks. (laughs) Yes, good night, folks. And good night, Patsy and Nick. In tonight's strange adventure, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark. Patsy was impersonated by Helen Choate. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was under the direction of Jock McGregor. Next week at half past nine o'clock Eastern Wartime, listen to another curious adventure of Nick Carter entitled Death Across the Tracks. Or Nick Carter and the mystery of the midnight train. This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. And here's a special note. Beginning next week, Nick Carter will be heard over most of these same stations on Mondays at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Wartime. 
The Cisco Kid will be presented on Tuesdays at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Wartime. This is Mutual. It's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure is... Death across the track. For Nick Carter and the mystery of the night freight. Mr. Nicholas Carter, I've learned one thing about you during this long, long train ride. That's interesting, Patsy. Provided it doesn't reflect upon my ability as a detective. But it does, Mr. Carter. One of your rules is never to overlook an obvious clue. Quite right, Patsy. Well, this time you've missed one. But we're not in the case yet, Patsy. Until we arrive at Midland Junction, I don't start to investigate the murder of James Fitzpatrick, the railroad detective. But when we get off at Midland Junction, then I'll That's be a bit... That's just we aren't going to get off at Midland Junction. You overlooked the very obvious clue that's printed right here in this timetable. Yes? Yes. This train doesn't stop at Midland Junction. Why are we stopping way out here in the country? Because Midland Junction happens to be way out in the country. Yes. They're stopping the limited just for us? Just for us. You see, the clue you found is counteracted by another you didn't know about. And that is that I happen to be handling this case for the Midland and Eastern Railway. It was their best detective who was murdered. They called on me to pick up where he left off. Well, come along, Patsy. This is where we got off. Okay, I'm coming. Watch that high step. Thank you. Uh, you're Mr. Carter? That's right. And this is Miss Patsy Bowen. How do you do? How do you do? I'm Roger Baybrook. I'll talk to you about the case after the limited pulls out. Um, stay right here until I come back. Roger Baybrook? Well, I've heard of him, Nick. Isn't he that big real estate man who bought up a whole county just so he could run it the way he wanted to? That's right, Patsy. And this happens to be the county. He owns nearly everything in it except the right-of-way of the Midland and Eastern Railway. He just came in on it. Look at all those men with shotguns Baybrook's bringing back from that water tank. They're deputies, Patsy. Probably out looking for the man who murdered James Fitzpatrick. Mm, I suppose one of them is the sheriff. They all look dumb enough. Why is it, Nick, that whenever we land half a mile from nowhere, we always find a hick sheriff who thinks he can give lessons to the great Nick Carter? That's really the exception rather than the rule, Patsy. I uh, hope that rule won't apply in this case, Miss Bowen. Oh, you, you startle me, Mr. Baybrook. <laughs> Don't mind Patsy, Mr. Baybrook. You'll find me quite ready to cooperate with the local sheriff from the moment I meet him. You've already met him, Mr. Carter. You, you mean that you're the sheriff? Well, you see Mr. Baybrook's badge, don't you, Patsy? Oh, yes, sure. Mm. Mr. Carter, I shall now give you the details of the murder of James Fitzpatrick. Let's go into the railroad station. That's where it happened. All right, Sheriff. Hello, Mrs. Fitzpatrick. How do you do, Sheriff Baybrook? Mr. Fitzpatrick, this is Mr. Nicholas Carter. How He's do you taking do? charge of the case. How do you do? After I've shown him the scene of the death, I shan't annoy you further. This isn't a matter for sympathy. I'm the station agent here, taking my husband's place while he's in the Army. Jim Fitzpatrick happened to be my brother-in-law. But as far as his death is concerned, I regard him strictly as a railroad detective who was killed on these premises. So, of course, it's my duty to help to find the murderer. And mine, too, Mrs. Fitzpatrick. Oh, here's the office where it happened, Mr. Carter. James Fitzpatrick was seated in that chair with his back toward the window. I see. The night freight had just taken on water at the water tank about 100 yards up the track, and was passing by the station. Mm -hmm. A shot was fired from about the middle of the train. The bullet smashed the window and found its mark in Fitzpatrick's back. A revolver bullet, Sheriff? No, a rifle bullet from a high-powered Manlicker rifle. A firearms expert identified it this morning. I see. And what was the speed of the train as it passed the station? About 20 miles an hour? Well, that or a trifle less. There were about 30 boxcars, each fully loaded and sealed. The assassin must have been perched between two of those cars. Yes, undoubtedly. The top of a boxcar would be well above the level of the window. Precisely. 
Well, Sheriff, have you any suspects? Yes, my deputies are looking for Weasel Taggart and his gang of freight car thieves. We feel sure they've been responsible for the epidemic of freight car robberies we've had around here. Uh, had Jim Fitzpatrick connected Weasel with those robberies? Yes, he had. We feel sure that's why Weasel killed him. Uh-huh. I'm going to make it my job to scour the country for Weasel and his gang. Well, you can handle the rest of it. Goodbye. Uh, well, goodbye. Well, he's a funny bird. One, two, three, four people, Mommy, counting you and me. Oh, hi, Charlie. Hey, if Mr. Baybrook hadn't gone away, there'd be five people here. But now there's only four of us. Well, but there'll be five again when Uncle Jim comes in. If he brings in Weasel, there'll be six. When is Uncle Jim going to bring in Weasel with those handcuffs you showed me, Mommy? I don't know, Charlie. Do you like to count, Charlie? Oh, gee, yes. I like to count all kinds of things. Especially (laughs) freight cars. Now, come along, Charlie. Now, get your supper ready. Oh, call me if you need me, Mr. Carter. I've really got to see you. Quite all right. I will. (laughs) He's a bright little chap, isn't he, (laughs) Nick? Yes. And he's established one point for us, Patsy. Hmm? Before he was killed, Jim Fitzpatrick was on the trail of Weasel Taggart and expected to get him. Oh, you better answer that, Patsy. All right. Hello? Hello, Miss Special Privilege. How does it feel to have a limited stop for you? Scubby Wilson. <laughs> but how? When? Well, where, Patsy, I Scubby came, came ahead of us on the early local, Patsy. At present, I take it, he's over in Halsey's General Store, that being the only building visible on the other side of the tracks. Is that Nick talking, Patsy? Yes, he deduces that you're at Halsey's store. Right. Come on over if you're still hungry. Hungry? Well, how'd you know I was hungry? Because you always are. Uh-oh. Well, bring Nick along with you, and while you're eating, he can talk to Jeremiah Halsey, the encyclopedia of Midland Junction. If Nick can sort out the clues that Halsey hands him, he'll have this case right in his pocket. We'll be right over, Scubby. Hello, Scubby. Oh, hi, Nick. Uh, Mr. Halsey, my friend. The intelligent one is Nick Carter, and the beautiful one is Miss Patsy Bowen. Oh, Scubby. How do you do, <laughs> Glad to see you. How do you do? Come in, Pat. Mr. Halsey owns this general store, Nick. It's the only store around here. Well, I may own it now, but if Weasel Taggart has his way about it, I may not own it long. Weasel's tried three times now to steal my stock away from me. <laughs> Maybe next time he'll succeed. Come on, Patsy. The food department is over here. You don't have to ask me twice. Uh, tell me, Mr. Halsey, when did Weasel Taggart try to rob your store? Oh, three different times. Only I'm not expecting them again until they rob some more freight cars. Well, what's the connection? Oh, uh, by the way, miss, there's some good pies on that top shelf in the bakery department. Apple, 10 cents, and cherry, 15. Okay. Yes, Mr. Carter, every time Weasel's gang robbed some freight cars, Jim Fitzpatrick got together a bunch of deputies and went out hunting them. I see. And that left nobody here about, so they tried to rob my store. And what did you do about it? Well, scared them off every time. Just outsmarted them. Uh, that's what you got to do with people who try to take what belongs to you. Now, take Roger Baybrook, for instance. From the first day I saw him, I knew he wanted to buy up this whole county. So I went ahead and bought up a lot of property myself. I knew just what he wanted, and I sort of tried to beat him to it. Well, we did a lot of buying and selling, him and me, and after it was all over, Baybrook owned ten times the amount of property as I did, but it cost him a hundred times more. Now... Who would you say was the smarter? Well, that depends on the property, Mr. Halsey. But if your story is correct, Baybrook did pay too much for that old right-of-way belonging to the Midland and Eastern. Well, he wanted it because it ran across the middle of his farm. He could have got it free if the franchise hadn't been renewed. That's what he was waiting for after young Tom Prentice tipped him off to it. Only Jim Fitzpatrick found out his game and blocked it. And how did Baybrook feel toward Jim Fitzpatrick after that? Well, he was mad enough to murder him, only he didn't say so. Baybrook just swore he'd get eaten with the railroad, and he has, by getting himself elected sheriff. Uh-huh. He's there from every time a cow gets killed on their tracks. It'll cost them more in damage suits than he pays them for that strip of land. Um, Mr. Halsey, get it back to Jim Fitzpatrick. No, 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 don't jump at false conclusions, Miss Carter. I didn't say Baybrook actually threatened Jim. Uh, you heard me mention Tom Prentice. Yes. Well, he's Mary Fitzpatrick's brother. He worked for the railroad and embezzled some of their funds. So he told Baybrook about the right of way, hoping Baybrook would pay him for the information. I suppose Jim found out about that, too. Oh, of course. And Tom wouldn't pay the money, so he went to jail. 
Here, 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 you can't eat all those cherry pies. I'm saving that last one for Mary Fitzpatrick. Here, come on now. Hand it over. Eat a cup of apples and say Uh, Be right back, folks. I'm going into the ship department for a paper bag. Well, Nick, did the local encyclopedia turn out to be a gold mine? I was just striking pay dirt, Stubby, when he got sidetracked on those cherry pies. I'd say this store was a gold mine. Gosh, it's as big as a barn. It's filled with just about everything. Everything except customers, Patsy. If I hadn't been around, Halsey would have been alone all afternoon. And why in the world does he keep all this big stock? A big stock brings a big trade. That's the motto Halsey keeps quoting. He's forgotten that half his customers have moved away since Baybrook bought up this land. Well, back again, folks, with a pie all wrapped up for Mary. Oh, uh, that reminds me, Miss Carter. I was telling you about her brother, Tom Prentice. Yes. How long ago did Tom go to prison? Well, I can't exactly say, Miss Carter, but I can tell you how long he's been out, and uh, that's since uh, yesterday. Oh, you've seen him? Yes, sir, right here in this store. Stop to say hello like he'd just been back from a trip. But uh, let's get over to the station before the night freight comes along and blocks us off. It's kind of dark, and um, if you want uh, flashlights, I got some nice 69 centers in the hardware department. I have my own light, thanks. Come on, kid. Mrs. Fitzpatrick, we're back. Hello. Mr. Holt, you'll be along in a few minutes with a friend of ours, Scubby Wilson. Hello, Mrs. Carter. Well, hello there, Charlie. Hello there, Charlie. Charlie, I told you to stay in bed. Oh, but, but I have to work, Mommy. Uh, if Uncle Jim isn't here, I've got to count the freight cars and report. <laughs> <laughs> How high can you count, Charlie? Gee, I only counted a 20 last night, then Mommy yelled and awful loud. Are you going to yell tonight, Mommy? No, dear. Now run back to bed. Now hurry now. You can count the cars while you're in bed. The big slate is just about started. Oh, uh, okay. Hello, Mr. Holden. Oh, hello, Charlie. Uh, hi, Mary. Hello there. Thought you told me you liked cherry pie, mm. so I brought one along for you. Thank you. Oh, say, just got a good idea. Maybe Mr. Carter ought to look over those bills of laden and other papers Jim used to keep. Yeah, you might find a clue there. Are you, uh, they still in uh, Jim's desk? Well, either there or in the safe. Uh, come on, Miss Carter. Let's go into the office. You can try what's in the desk first. All right. Yeah, yeah. There they are. Right there. I don't imagine there's much here that can help. You can't tell. You might find something. No, Mr. Halsey. I'm afraid there's nothing here in the desk that I can use. Uh, you're sure now, Carter. Did you look real careful through that pile of papers in the wire basket? Yes, I did. Uh, what about that old safe in the corner, Mrs. Fitzpatrick? Maybe they're in there. Well, I don't know the combination, Mr. Carter. Jim never gave it to me. Don't let that worry you, Mrs. Fitzpatrick. Nick opened the safe doors almost as easily as you opened an icebox. Well, I'll go over and give it a try anyway. Oh, oh, there's killers out there again, right? The freight like it did last night. Are you hurt, Nick? No, Patrick. If I hadn't gotten up in that desk just when I did, that bullet would have gone right through my head. We gotta stop that freight. The killer's on it. I'll telegraph the next station to flag it down. Haven't got the sheriff to search the train. That won't do any good. The killer will jump off as soon as the train gets out of town. There must be some way of catching him, Nick. Hey, yeah, you hear that? Hey, Brooks, deputy just must cornered him. Let's get out there and find out what's happening. Careful, he's got a gun. There are the deputies, Nick. Crouching behind that pile of railroad ties. You down there. Toss out your gun and come up with your hands raised. I have no gun. I'll come out like you want, but don't shoot. How you won't shoot? If you ain't lying about that gun, just keep your hands in the air and you won't get hurt. <laughs> okay. I'm coming out. <laughs> keep reaching. Come out of here. Don't take all night. You shot me in the leg. We ought to put another bullet for your heart, you dirty killer. I'm not the killer. Hey. Hey, you know who that is? Yeah, Tom Prentice. Is it your brother, Mrs. Fitzpatrick? Yes. After what happened last night, I made him hide in my attic. Well, why didn't you tell us? I was afraid he'd be blamed for killing Jim. Well, never mind explanations now. He's been shot. He needs a doctor. I'll go call one you. Oh, Tom. Tom, why did you leave the station? Why didn't you stay where you were? I heard the gunshot, Mary. The freight was passing, and I knew the killer was on it. I wanted to hop the freight and try to catch him. You thought the killer was on it. Now, that's a hot one. You were on it, Prentice. If our bullets hadn't made it hot for you, you'd still be on it. I had just hopped on when you started shooting. I tell you, I was going to try to find him. Hey, hey, what's happened? What's going on here? What's going on here? What's going on? Calling Nick Carter. 
Another case for Nick Carter, master detective. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, master detective. This week's curious adventure is... Murder in the Crypt. Nick Carter and the Jekyll God. came here this time any more than he did the other times I was here. <laughs> Those footsteps coming this way. It, it's Anubis. Anubis. Oh, it can't be. I am Anubis, guardian of the dead. No, no. I must be dreaming. I am Anubis, the jackal god. But you're not... No. No, Condition good. Come in. Are you Dr. Waldemar? I am. I'm Lieutenant Riley from headquarters. You called me about a museum guard who disappeared? Of course, of course. It's about Shelby, the chief attendant here at the Egyptian Museum. Where and when did this Shelby disappear, Doctor? He failed to report to me as usual before leaving last night. And the guards on the door say he did not leave the building. Mm. We've hunted everywhere for him, but we haven't found him. Oh, you've hunted everywhere, have you? Yes, Lieutenant. Everywhere except in the crypt of Snefru. The, the, the what of who? The crypt of Snefru, an Egyptian king of the fourth dynasty. Mm. And where is this crypt? In the basement? No, it's on the second floor, directly above this office. Mm. It was installed especially for Professor Glidden, the archaeologist. He alone has access to the crypt. It has a special lock on the door. Oh, you mean he has the only key, huh? Precisely. I called Professor Glidden's apartment a while ago, but he did not answer. I presume he is on his way down here now. I hope he can shed some light on this mystery. Hmm. Nick, isn't this the Egyptian museum across the road? Yes, Patsy, it is. Never been in it. Mm-mm. Looks too much like a mausoleum for me. <laughs> Are we going in to look at the mummy? That, Patsy, depends entirely upon Professor Glidden. Who's he? That bearded man who is beckoning to us from the doorway of the museum. Oh, I see him. Is he a client of yours? Yes. He phoned just before you arrived at the office this morning. What does he want? That, I don't know, Patsy. Suppose we join him and find out. You say, Professor, that the Archaeological Society gave Dr. Waldemar the money to complete the museum. Yes, Mr. Carter. Mm-hmm. Provided that he would install a special crypt where uh, I could place the relics from the tomb of King Snefru for examination and classification. So the crypt is officially your property? For the present, yes. When my work is finished, it will be open to the public. I see. And uh, just where do I come in? I want you, Mr. Carter, to be present when we search the crypt. So there will be no question that Shelby is not there. This is Dr. Waldemar's office? It is. Oh, good morning, Gooden. Uh, this is Lieutenant Riley from headquarters. Hello there, Lieutenant Riley. <laughs> Hell, Hello, Nicholas Lieutenant. Carter and Patsy, too. We haven't seen each other for a long while. Uh, now, don't tell me that you're looking for this man Shelby, too, Nick. I am, Riley. At the request of Professor Glidden. Oh. So since Dr. Waldemar has asked you to perform the same service, Riley, why don't we work together? We're glad to, Nick. Fine. 
So you wouldn't object if Lieutenant Riley helped search the crypt, would you, Professor? Not at all. Well, Riley, shall we adjourn to the crypt? Right, Nick. The crypt is on the second floor, right over this office. Come, come, Glidden, unlock the door. This is an intricate lock, Waldemar. It takes careful handling of the key. There. Uh, where's the light switch, Professor Glidden? Uh, just inside the door to the right. Very well, I'll... <laughs> well, would you look at that now? <laughs> I never saw a statue to resemble that beast. The body of a man and the head of a dog it has. I'd call it the head of a jackal, Riley. Mm-hmm. Am I right, Professor Glidden? You are, Mr. Carter. That bronze statue is a life-size figure of Anubis, the jackal god. Anubis was the guardian of the dead, and his statue was set at the entrance of ancient tombs to keep out thieves. And the jackal face is enough to scare anyone away. Come along, Riley. Let's look around inside the crypt. Okay. Well, here's a mummy case, which I suppose contains old King's nephew in person. Quite right, Mr. Carter. Well, yeah, now, here's the old boy's throne. <laughs> it looks like the original Morris chair. Let's see. There's nobody hiding under it, Riley. Okay, Nick. Yep. See, now, look over there. In the alcove over behind the statue... Now, what is it, an ancient Egyptian bathtub? That, Riley, is a sarcophagus. Huh? A stone coffin, the one that once contained the mummy case we just saw. Gosh, now, it's a big thing now, ain't it? What's all this crazy writing on the front of it? Those are hieroglyphics, Riley. Inscriptions about old King Snapru. Hmm. What's inside this thing, Nick? Oh, probably nothing now, Riley. Just a big oak. Now, what is it, Nick? This sarcophagus is not empty, Riley. Huh? Shelby's in it. Oh. And he's dead. Once again, Lieutenant Riley, I must reply that I know nothing of this matter. As I've told you, I scarcely knew Shelby. Now, look here, Riley. Your evidence against my client is purely circumstantial. Uh, Nick, it's a disgrace to the memory of old Sim Carter, the way his one and only son tries to misinterpret the bald facts. The bald facts in this case is this, Riley. You have no proof that Professor Glidden even came to this museum last night. Look, all I want is one more bit of circumstance, Nick. Dr. Waldemar, can you think of anything else that might be, well, interesting in this case? Now, let me see. Look, Nick. A strange woman coming down the corridor toward us. Oh, she looks like something revived from ancient Egypt. She walks like a cat. You can't hear the slightest footstep. Quiet, Patsy. She's stopping close enough to overhear us. Uh, Lieutenant Riley, huh? I have it. Ask the professor just how he knew that Shelby was missing when he telephoned Carter this morning. I huh? shall answer that question, Dr. Waldemar. Who, say, where did you come from? Who is this lady, Dr. Waldemar? Allow me to introduce Madame Dacklar, our librarian. Oh, you have a library in this museum? Oh, yes. The library is in the other wing near the elevator. I was the person who informed Professor Glidden that Shelby was missing. I telephoned him this morning. After the search began. And Professor Glidden telephoned me, Riley, asking me to come here to protect his interests, which I have so far tried to do. Mm. Madame Dakla comes from Cairo. She's an Egyptian, well-versed in ancient lore and legend. Madame Dakla, do you really believe those old Egyptian legends? I must believe them. With my own eyes, I have seen the living Anubis walk through the corridors of this museum. But that statue couldn't possibly get out of a lost crypt. To Anubis, anything is possible. It is his duty to guard the treasure in the crypt. What treasure, Madame Dacla? The treasure that is found in the tomb of every Egyptian king. Anubis, the avenging jackal god, knew that the museum god Shelby sought the treasure. So Anubis sought Shelby and killed him and put his body in the crypt as a warning. Anubis is all-powerful. You mean you've actually seen this, uh, this jackal god walking around this museum recently? Anubis, the guardian of the dead, leaves the crypt of King Snefru and prowls these corridors every night. I have seen him do it. Gosh. That will be all, Madame Dacla. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, Nick, suppose we go through that crypt again and see what we can learn. An excellent suggestion, Riley. Patsy. Suppose you go around and wait in the library with Madame Delka. 
We'll join you there later. Ah, Nick. This crypt is as solid as a rock. We've tested every inch of floor and walls and ceiling here. Yes, Riley, every spot we've tapped seems to be solid stone or concrete. Uh, Nick, suppose we check those measurements again, eh? Oh, no use in that, Riley. The room's 30 by 30, with four feet out for the door on one side, and eight feet out for the alcove on the other. Mm. Uh, how big did you say that sarcophagus was, Nick? It's eight feet long and six feet wide. Practically the same size as the alcove it's standing in. Mm. And it's four feet, six inches high. Why? Well, I was just thinking, Nick. That's an awful big chunk of rock there. Well, Professor Glidden says this one weighs over 1,100 pounds. Uh, it's over half a ton. This goes to show that the floor in this crypt must be solid to support such a weight day in and day out. There's an answer to this case somewhere, Riley. Uh, yeah. Even if I don't know yet where it is. Come on. Let's get back to the office. Yeah. If I'd followed my better judgment, I'd have locked Professor Glidden in a jail cell first. It wouldn't be wise just yet, Ralph. Uh, you're wrong there, Nick. And I'll tell you why. This door here is the only way in and out of that crypt. And this key, the only key there is now, belonged to Professor Glidden. Riley, I want to learn the motive behind Shelby's murder. There were some strange things going on around this museum. Three ancient anklets, one job. Come in, come in. Oh, it's you, Mr. Carter. Bowen. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, are you convinced that only Glidden could have entered that crypt upstairs? I never like to accept the obvious, Dr. Wallabar. Oh, there goes the closing bell. I must put these Egyptian relics back in the vault. Oh, we're right ahead. A large vault, that is, Dr. Waldemar. Yes. The museum requires a large vault. I had this one built here in the wall, especially. Was it included in the original plans for the museum? Well, no, not exactly. This wing of the building was still unfinished when the architect died. In completing it, we made some minor changes. I see. Doctor, do you think Madame Dacla... You must excuse me for a few minutes, Carter. I must speak to the attendants before they leave. It was one of poor Shelby's duties. It will only take a few minutes. By the way, Patsy, hmm? there's something on Waldemar's desk that should interest you. You mean that odd-looking jar? Mm-hmm. It contains some ancient Egyptian perfume, he said. Hmm. Smells like roses. Very strong. You better put it in the vault, Patsy. Waldemar must have overlooked it. Can you smell it, Nick? Powerful stuff. Yes, I can smell it all right. Put it in one of the shelves in the vault. Oh. What's the matter, Patsy? I just tripped on a small step at the front of the vault. You didn't spill any of that priceless perfume, did you? Oh, I'm afraid... Yes, I did spill a few drops of it, Nick. Well, don't tell Waldemar. Oh, I hear him coming. Come out of the vault and look. Okay. Well, Carter, another day is done. Oh, if you please stand away from the vault, Miss Bowen. I should like to close the door. Thank you. By the way, Doctor, was there any treasure buried with King Sneferu? Probably. It was the custom... But it is also probable that such treasure was stolen centuries ago. Well, isn't Glidden interested in the matter of treasure? Possibly. But he's more interested in translating the hieroglyphics on the sarcophagus. Hmm. Well, Patsy, I must be going. You must be going? You mean you're going to leave me here in the museum? Only for a little while. I want you to go back to the library and have a talk with Madame Dacla, Patsy. You talk about what? I'll tell you that while we're walking to the other wing. Good night, Dr. Watermark. Good night, Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter isn't interested in ancient manuscripts, Madam Dacker. He wants to see the architect's plans for this museum. Oh, but he should ask Dr. Waldemar for those. I don't think Dr. Waldemar has them. Mr. Carter wants the original plans. I shall be glad to see if I can find them for you. 
I shall try the file cabinet by the door. Well, they're not under A for architect. And they are not under B for building plans, either. I shall try under M. Mm. Museum plans. What's that camping sound out in the corridor? Yes, yes, here they are. In this folder. Plans for Egyptian museum to be erected Look, in the... coming through the door. Anubis. Welcome, Anubis. Anubis gives no greeting to those who defy him. I have never defied you, Anubis. You have sought the treasure that I guard. Never, never. I have always... <gasps> Let go of here, whoever you are. Let go. Away, away, you are. Hey, hey, now, what new mischief is going on here, Nick? O'Reilly, you're just in time. Huh? Patsy was just going to tell me. Who was it took Madame Dracula away, Patsy? It was somebody, somebody who looked like Anubis, the jackal god. What? Really, Nick? Madame Dracula had the plans of the museum in her hand. They're gone, too. Nick, this time we're going to look in that crypt upstairs first. Come on. Find that light switch now, Nick. Right, Riley. Yeah, there she is, laying right at the feet of that that creature Anubis there. You mean the statue of Anubis, Riley? Well, it may be a statue now, Nick, but I am near to believing that the thing comes alive when it chooses. Madame Dacla alive? Oh, oh, she... she she's still breathing, Patsy. Oh, and, uh, what do you make of it, Nick? She's oh. in drug, Riley. Quick, get her over to the door where the air is pressure. Yeah. That's right. Ah, she's coming around now. Where, where am I? You're all right, Madame Dacca. Oh, but I am, I am in the crypt now. And the last I knew, I, I was in the library. I knew it. I knew steel doors are no barrier to I knew this. Uh, help her outside, Patsy, so, so I can lock the door. Here. You lean on me, Madame Dacca. But I tell you, it is useless to lock that door. I knew this can pass through all barriers. Maybe so. But Professor Glidden can't. Come on, Madame Dacla, I'll take you back to the library. Then I'm going to put the professor in jail where I can keep my eye on him. From now on, there'll be no problem. Patsy. Hmm? When Riley opened the crypt just now and found Madame Dacla, did you notice the peculiar fragrance in the place? I must have been too excited to notice it, Nick. What was it like? It was the perfume of roses, Patsy. Musty, ancient roses. You should have recognized it. You mean it was like the perfume from the bottle I spilled in Waldemar's office? Yes, Patsy. It smelled exactly the same. I admit nothing, Lieutenant Riley. I can't tell you how either Shelby or Madame Dacla got into the crib. It's like I've been trying to tell you, Clinton. It's very simple. You had two keys, but you only gave me one. And as I've been telling you, Lieutenant Riley, there was no duplicate key. Stay out. I'm busy here. I said stay... Hello, Riley. <sighs> Hello, Glidden. So it's you again, Mr. Nicholas Carter. Well, I don't care whether Professor Glidden is your client or not. We're not releasing him. I don't want him released, Riley. I just want to ask him a few questions. Tell me, Professor Glidden, when you sent those relics of King's nephew to the Egyptian Museum, did Dr. Waldemar have any chance to examine them? Why, no. They were all heavily boxed and crated. That is, everything except the sarcophagus. That was handled separately. Waldemar installed the sarcophagus in the crypt before I arrived. I see. I I seem to recall that Shelby helped him set it up. The boxes and crates were all upstairs when I got back. But I opened them alone and set up everything myself, including the statue. That's all I wanted to know. I'm sorry, Professor, that you'll have to spend the night here. But I hope to arrange a release by morning. All right, Sergeant. Take the professor to his cell. Yes, sir. Come along, Professor. Hey, Riley. Mm. Will you do something for me? Why should I? Why shouldn't you? You'll learn something yourself. And that's always a help in a murder case. Mm, all right, Nick. When can I lose? Fine. Pick up Patsy. She has all my notes. And you may need them. And both of you go to the crypt. Where will you be, Nick? I have to attend to another matter first. Now, listen carefully, Riley. Mm -hmm. Here's what I want you to do. When you get to the... How long have we...
we been in this crypt, Lieutenant Riley? Oh, it's about 15 minutes, Patsy. If you didn't have a luminous dial on your watch, I'd say it was hours. Why did Nick say that we should stay here in the dark? <laughs> You'll have to ask Nick that when he gets here, Patsy. Where did Nick say he was going? Well, no, it might be that he's calling on Madame Dacla. What? Oh, it's just a questioner, you understand. Oh, Riley, of all the ridiculous notions. <laughs> well, Dacla's boyfriend, Anubis, is right here beside us, Patsy. Do you see it? Yeah, this statue of Anubis must be solid bronze, Patsy. If nothing happens here, something will happen when I find Mr. Nick Carter. <laughs> Only ten minutes more, Patsy. I'm getting so used to this darkness, I can see the sarcophagus plainly. It looks so big. Yeah, it is big. It's almost... What's that? I don't know. It sounds as if something was happening at last. Riley! Hey, what is it, Patsy? You're not, you're not getting hysterical now, are you? Riley, I smell something. The perfume of roses. And it's getting stronger. Now, what is the perfume of roses to do with all this here? Riley, look. Look at that sarcophagus. Patsy, what we're looking at can't be happening here. Oh, but it is. That sarcophagus is rising straight up in the air. And I've always said that, that, that Sian was believing. Look, I see what's doing it, Riley. You, you, you can't tell me that, that anything that will make a stone coffin weigh, weigh in half a ton go floating up in the air five feet on the floor, Patsy. It's on top of an elevator, Riley. Uh, an elevator? Sure, that's what's lifting it. Well, glory be. You're right, Patsy. That's what that rumbling sound was. The man coming out of the elevator with a flashlight. Wait till I draw my gun, Patsy. I'll fix it. You're too late, Riley. Uh -huh. I have you covered. It's Dr. Waldemar. Why, Riley, that elevator is the vault from Waldemar's office. Quite right, Miss Bowen. I have you both covered. Don't try anything, either of you. Well, what would you be trying, Waldemar? There will be two new victims in this vault, Lieutenant Riley. Uh, two fools who, like Shelby, found out too much. But I'm sorry it isn't three. Nick Carter would be a welcome addition. You really mean that, Waldemar? Nick, where are you? Carter, how did you get here? I've been waiting for you in King Sneffru's sarcophagus. And now if you... I'll kill you first, Carter. I doubt that. <laughs> okay, Patsy. Look out, Patsy! He's knocking over that statue! It's falling over! <laughs> Professor will be along any minute now, Patsy. He called me at the hospital and asked, they asked me to meet him here outside the crypt in 15 minutes. Said he wanted to examine the elevator in the crypt. Was Waldemar dead, Nick? No, Patsy. I only wounded him. He knocked himself out when he staggered against the statue of Anubis. Waldemar made a complete confession when he recovered consciousness. He's admitted that he was hunting for the king's treasure and wanted to find it before Professor Glidden finished translating the hieroglyphics. And he was using the elevator to make secret trips between his office and his crypt. Exactly, Patsy. When Waldemar completed the new wing of the museum, he modified the original plans and put his office at the end of the first floor corridor. And he built this crypt on the second floor, right over his office. Evidently, the elevator was already installed, and Waldemar brought the sarcophagus up on top of it. And there was a sarcophagus standing in an alcove that was really the elevator shaft. Mm -hmm. The elevator itself became the vault in Waldemar's office. He disguised it with shelves and loaded them with curios. But it was still an elevator. And you think Shelby found out about it? Shelby must have helped Waldemar arrange things, since it was more than a one-man job. And then later, Shelby decided to look for the treasure on his own. Apparently. Waldemar confessed that he murdered Shelby for those very reasons and left the body in the crypt to blame the crime on Professor Glidden. And Waldemar put Madame Dacla in the crypt so Glidden would be blamed again. Exactly. But he didn't have to kill Dacla. She knew nothing, you see. He merely grabbed Dacla in order to get the original plans of the museum. Here comes the professor now, Nick. Oh, hello, Professor. Right on time, I see. I'm oh, so glad to find you here, Carter. I, I wanted you to be here when I examined the crypt in the elevator. I want no more surprises. Well, I don't think anything else is going to happen up here, Professor, but I'll be glad of the chance to do a little extra looking around myself. Oh, there's that Anubis again. He's on his face this time. It was quite clever of Waldemar to disguise himself as Anubis. He really did resemble the statue. Look, Nick. Where's Patsy? There at the statue lying on the floor. Uh, why, the head is completely turned around. Yes, the fall must have knocked it loose. Oh, give me a hand with it, Professor. We'll set it up again. Oh, certainly, Carter. Uh, it's pretty heavy, but... Yes, it is. It... Oh, what? Go! 
Oh, Nick, is it real? I imagine it is, Miss Bowen. Why, this must be the treasure of old King Snuffroos. So that's where the royal treasure was hidden. Valdemar must have looked everywhere except in the head of this statue. So Anubis was really the keeper of the treasure. Well, congratulations, Professor. Mm-hmm. And I hope this discovery makes up for all your troubles. It does indeed, Mr. Carter. I shall now be able to visit Egypt again. Just one problem that still bothers me. And I suppose, as usual, that the problem represents the crux of the whole case. It does. When I put that jar of perfume on the shelf, did you already know that the vault was an elevator? I did, Patsy. The elevator floor wasn't quite level. That's why you tripped as you went into the vault. But of course. But, Nick, what made you think it was an elevator in the first place? It's quite simple, Patsy. There had to be an elevator to take the sarcophagus up to the crypt on the second floor. But, Nick, there's an elevator in the other wing of the museum. They could have taken the sarcophagus up that way and wheeled it across to the crypt. Patsy, how large is the sarcophagus? Well, it's eight feet long and six feet wide and four and a half feet high, didn't you say? Mm Mm-hmm. And how wide is the door to the crypt? Four feet, according to your measurement. Exactly. Now, Patsy, do you think you could put a sarcophagus four feet six inches high through a door only four feet wide? Of course not, Nick. Of course not, Patsy. Not even Dr. Waldemar could do it. Up through the alcove was the only way. Waldemar probably hoped that no one would think to compare the size of the door to the size of the sarcophagus. And nobody did, except Nick Carter. This was another strange experience of Nick Carter, master detective, called Murder in the Crypt, or Nick Carter and the Jackal God. Another of the curious adventures of Nick Carter, which are brought to you regularly by WOR Mutual. And now, Nick and Patsy, what about our story for next week? Well, next week's story is full of action, isn't it, Patsy? Action is right. You see, Nick investigated a murder on a lonely place called Skull Island. Yes, and there were only four people on the island who could have committed the crime. But it took a model of a clipper ship and a sea serpent to find out who the murderer was. It also took Nick Carter and a smart piece of deduction on his part to work out the answer. But what did a sea serpent have to do with the murder? Well, we'll tell you all about that next week. In the meantime, I'm glad I don't have to say sarcophagus again. So long. (laughs) So long, everybody. And so long to you, Nick and Patsy. In the strange adventure you have just heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by John Clark, Patsy by Helen Choate. The story was written for Nick Carter by Walter Gibson. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was under the direction of Jock McGregor. Next week at the same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter entitled Murder on Skull Island, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Sea Serpent. This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. The Return of Nick Carter is produced in the studios of WOR and is broadcast over most of these stations every Monday evening at 9.30 Eastern Wartime. This is Mutual. Patsy, out you go. This is it. This is what, Nick? A studio of magnificent pictures, of which Joseph Stone is the owner and director. Well, there goes another illusion. I thought movie studios were all bright lights and glamour. This place looks like a stage set for the deserted village. Well, it's been locked up for the past ten years or so. Oh. Oh. 
That's funny. The gate's locked. And that's our cue to turn around and go home again. You've got a nice, tasty jewel robbery waiting for you to solve back in town, and you should be working on that. Instead of being way out here at the end of nowhere, playing around a forgotten movie studio. I guess I'll have to pick the lock. Okay, if you must. Patient Patsy will bear with your little game. This is no game, Patsy. Why, what do you mean? The house of Lulu Doré, the star of Stone's new picture, was broken into last night while she was at a dance. She was wearing her jewels, including the famous emeralds. Fortunately, though, nothing was stolen. There. There we are. All right, Patsy, go ahead. Huh. Seems funny there isn't a gatekeeper around. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Well, I guess they haven't got a full staff for the studio, considering they moved back from Hollywood just to do this one show. Why did they do that, Nick? Oh, Doré had a run of the pay contract for the show she's doing on Broadway and couldn't go west. Hey oh. there, where do you think you're going? Oh, so there is a door... Uh, Gateman. I'm looking for Mr. Stone's office. Well, you can't see him. I'm afraid you don't understand. I'm Nicholas Carter. Mr. Stone's expecting me. I'm taking my orders from Lieutenant Riley of the Metropolitan Police. He says to admit no one. Riley? What's he doing here? Investigating a murder. Murder? I thought you said robbery, Nick. What murder? Come on, get out of here. I got my orders. Come on, Patsy. Let's find Riley or Joe Stone. He! You can't do that. Come back here. It's all right. I'll explain to the police. Hurry, Patsy. Hurry. What, what is this, Nick? Should I plan to find out right now? And I take it this fellow Boyd, who's been killed, is a fairly unimportant chap, eh, Mr. Well, Stone? Well, yes, he, he was just a darn good electrician. Oh, there doesn't seem to be any connection between his murder and the attempted robbery of Miss Doré. Well, no, there doesn't. Is Lieutenant Riley here now? Yes, yes, he's over on stage five. It's that building over there. Do you want me to come with you? Yes, I wish you would, Mr. Stone. There may be points I'd like to ask you about. Well, I'd be glad to help, of course, if I can help. There's one thing I don't understand, Mr. Stone. You say Boyd was shot in the back with a poisoned arrow from a blowgun. It's an odd weapon. should be fairly easy to trace. You don't have to trace it very far, Mr. Carter. The blowgun and the arrow were mine. Yours? Yes, well, you see, how... 11 years ago, I tried to do a picture about a voodoo witch doctor who used the blowgun in it. I don't suppose you remember the picture, Mr. Carter. It was called the voodoo curse. Oh, yes, yes, I do. You had a bit of trouble over it, I believe. A bit of trouble? It practically drove me into bankruptcy. I'd imported a real voodoo witch doctor from Haiti, and he put a curse on the whole studio. Oh, come now, Stone. You don't really believe that. I don't know what I believe anymore. Eleven years ago, we had fires, we had explosions, we had mysterious thefts. We, we had just about everything. It got so that everybody was scared to work here. I had to close the studio, and, and now we have a murder. Why should the witch doctor put a hex on you? Oh, I had an argue with him, though, with a salary of some sort. He, he swore he'd break me, and he almost did. Now, here, this is stage five here. Well, well, Nicholas Carter. Hi, Riley. And Patsy. Hello. Well, what might you be doing here? He's come to help you, Lieutenant. Well, that's very obliging of him, I'm sure. Say, was that a crack? Why, of course not. Well, let's get to work. Riley, where was the body found? Right over there by that door, Nick, where the chalk marks are. Hmm. I wonder what he was doing way over here. He, he was setting up the stage, as I told you. But all his equipment's over there, clear across the set. Riley. How was he pacing when he died? He was lying on his face with his head towards that door, Nick. Shot in the back, wasn't he? Yep. We figured from the angle of the arrow that the blowgun fella must have been sitting up there on that catwalk when he killed him. Mr. Stone, what's behind that door that Boyd was heading for? Well, special electrical equipment, I believe, for special effects. Would Boyd have known that? Well, yes, of course. He worked on this stage years ago. He, he probably would have remembered. That's it, then. He was going into that room to see if he could find some special equipment he needed. That accounts for his being way over here. And you think there was something in there the killer didn't want him to see, Nick? Right, Riley. Let's go in. The door's locked, Nick. Oh, Stone, uh, give me your keys, will you? Keys? I, I, I have no keys for these rooms. Well, did Boyd have any? Well, I believe he had borrowed the caretaker set. Riley, did you search the corpse? Of course I did, Nick. No keys? No keys. I, I can get a locksmith out from the village. What? You have no duplicates? Well, the place has been locked up so long. I, I never expected to come back here was trying to sell it, as a matter of fact. Pick the lock, Nick. This seems to be your day for doing that. Just what I'm going to do, Patsy. I'll, I'll get you more light. Oh, he doesn't need light. He can see in the dark, practically. No, you don't have to see to pick a lock. There. There. And there. That's it. Now we'll get a look at what your killer didn't want Boyd to see. Here, here's the light switch. Oh, wait, wait, mm -hmm. wait. Don't crowd in like that. Uh-huh. Look. Footprints. Footprints in the dust. Golly, Nick, there goes your theory. 
Boyd was here before he was killed and took out whatever it was he wanted. Well, it was a cute theory while it lasted. Maybe it's still a cute theory, as you call it. Uh, all we have to do now, Nick, is to measure the prints and see if they're Boyd's or not. They're not. How do you know? Yeah, you haven't even see, seen the body. These prints were made by leather sole shoes. Right, Riley? Well, yeah, you're right, but... And Boyd was wearing rubber soles. How do you know he was, Nick? Correct me if I'm wrong, Stone. Don't all technicians on the soundstage wear rubber sole shoes to kill any noise that the sound tracks might pick up? Well, you're right, Carter, they do. Now, those leather sole prints mean that it wasn't Boyd, but our friend the murderer who used the keys he took from Boyd to get in here. And they lead to that crate. Let's see what's in it. No, don't walk on the footprints. We need them as evidence. I'll wager you'll find the crate empty. The murderer didn't just walk over to it, look in, and walk out again. Oh, no. He took away everything he didn't want Boyd or anyone else to find. You're right, Nick. The crate is empty. Uh, shall we search the room, Nick? Well, what's the point in that? If there was anything here, it's gone by now. Murderer seen to that. I wonder what was in this crate. I wonder if... Help! It... Help! Nick, the poor kid. What is it, Carter? Another murder. Another? Good Lord. Can you identify him, Stone? Why, it, it's Bill Daly, our camera punk. Camera punk? What's that? Oh, it's studio slang for assistant to the camera. Uh, oh. you, you people, I'll run too fast for me. Hey, what's up here? See for yourself, Riley. Well, good gosh, another murder. Uh, and it looks from his position as if he was just coming out of that door over there. Well, that's funny. Both he and Boyd... Any idea what he was doing around here, Stone? Uh, yes, I... I sent him over here myself about an hour ago to look in that warehouse, see if there was any of that old photographic equipment we could remodel and use. Priorities, you know. Daly was very clever at that sort of thing. Yeah, that's a mean-looking knife he's got sticking in his throat, Nick. Knife? Good Lord. Well, what is it, Mr. Stone? That, that knife. It's from that same voodoo picture. There seem oh. to be a few too many of those old props hanging around. Are there any more? Yes, there's a complete stock of weapons. Everything we used in that confounded picture. The voodoo curse? Yes. I rather think I'd like to see that film, Stone. Is there a copy of it around here anyplace? Well, as much as we ever shot of it, it was never finished, you know. But you run it off for me. Well, certainly I will. I'll go arrange it now. Thanks. Well, Nick, what do you think? I'm not sure. Any opinions yourself? Yes. My money's on Stone's doing it. Stone. Why in the world would he do it? Well, I don't know. I haven't figured out the reason for it yet. But he acts kind of funny. Nervous, sort of. And he keeps talking about the place maybe being haunted. Oh, good heavens, Riley. Who wouldn't be nervous with all this murder going around? I know I am. Well, take the weapons, Nick. They all belong to him. But other people could have access to them, Riley. After all, Stone hasn't been here for over ten years. Mm -hmm. And there's something more important you've overlooked, Riley. Mm -hmm. What's that, Nick? How did Stone manage to throw that knife at Daly while he was with us? How do I know? We were all so busy looking at that star room on the set, he, he could have sneaked up. By golly, I'll bet that's how he did do oh, it. Oh, that's Stone beckoning to us. You want to go to see the movies, Riley? I got better things to do, Nick. I'm going to search this joint. How about you, Betsy? Sure thing. But why do you want to see it? I'm not sure, Patsy. But I've got sort of a hunch that the answer to all our questions lie hidden in that old picture. Did all movie projectors make this racket ten years ago? Most of them, Patsy. Mm. Now listen. So you don't believe in our voodoo magic, eh? Well, if you've been here long enough to see some of the things I've seen. Really, Ross, there's something uncanny about these natives. Call it coincidence if you like. Who's the woman? Gosh, she's good looking. That's Lula Dore, the star of the picture stone shooting here now. Well, their voices sound funny and teeny. Yeah, they certainly do. It's enough to scoff when you've just come down from the States. But it is magic. No other way to explain some of the things that happened. Magic, mumbo jumbo, you mean? You'll never convince me it's anything else. I suppose this is another of those wild dances. Now, there's a really good voice. Who is he, Nick? Now, don't tell me you don't remember him, Patsy. Uh -uh. The name was Bart Tyson, great leading man, ten years back. Oh, I remember his name, of course. This is rather better than most of the dances I've seen. Patsy, I've heard that voice very recently. The 
picture must be almost over now, Nick. Have you discovered anything? I'm not sure yet. Gosh, they had some pretty fancy photography in those days. I, I thought all that underwater swimming stuff was comparatively new. Oh, no. Stone was the first person to use it. Well, how did they do it? Look at that man swimming. It couldn't be faked. It isn't. It was taken through some sort of a glass tank. That native has been underwater for 20 minutes. No human can hold his breath that long. That's what I've been telling you, Ross. They're magic, these natives. Magic. Maybe you're right. Maybe you're right. That voice. I've heard it somewhere before myself. I never heard Tyson act before. Hey, don't we see the ending? Nope. That's all they made, Patsy. The picture wasn't finished. Well, did you find out what you wanted to? I'm not quite sure. Well, Mr. Carter, did you like the picture? Oh, uh, very interesting, Stone. Oh, that Lula Dory certainly is beautiful, isn't she, Mr. Stone? I've never seen her in pictures before. Has she done anything else? No, nothing. Until now that she's starring in my new show on Broadway. That's funny. I think with her looks and her voice, she'd be a sensation. Mm, that's what I've always claimed, but, well, she got scared off after all these things happened during the filming of this one, and, well, she's stuck to Broadway ever since. And when Tyson, her leading man, was hurt, she rather felt... Oh, about... I was wondering what happened to Tyson. From what I could gather from this show, he should have been a natural for talkies. Oh, he was. But we had a bad explosion, and his whole face was terribly scarred. That's why we could never finish this picture. He never could act in pictures again. Oh, what a shame. Well, Stone, thanks for showing us the film. Mind if we scout around after Riley? Oh, no, not at all. I... If you need me, I'll be on stage three. We're going to start shooting soon. Good. It's funny about Doré. She seems to be cropping up in our lives all over the place. Yes, she does, doesn't she? Patsy, if you find a telephone, get hold of Scubby. Mm -hmm. Find out what you can about Bart Tyson and what's happened to him since the accident. Okay, Nick, where'll you be? If I don't see you before, I'll meet you at Stone's office at noon. Right. Oh, Nick! Nick Carter! Oh, Riley, just looking for you. You found anything yet? Yeah, we found all the weapons from that voodoo movie. All except the ones we'd already found, that is. How'd you know you found them all? Uh, Stone had an inventory. We checked on it. Well, if your theory about Stone's correct, Riley, he could have falsified that inventory. Uh, well, well, why should he? Well, perhaps he had a couple of weapons hidden somewhere and doesn't want us to know anything about them. Nick, the, the, the more I think about it, the less I like that guy. <laughs> find anything else? No, oh, no, not, not a blessed thing. Search the whole lot of you? All but stage nine over there. That's locked up tighter than a drum. I can't pick locks the way the great Carter does. Okay, I'll take care of those. Uh, Riley, why don't you go on down to stage three? They're going to start shooting the picture pretty soon, and I'd feel a lot more comfortable if someone were on guard there. We've had enough murders for one day. I suppose you think this is a gag, having us get all dressed up like merry villagers or something. It's not a gag, Patsy. It's insurance. What do you mean? Just what I said. When we're dressed up in our regular clothes, everybody in the lot knows who we are. But anyone seeing us dressed up like this will think we're actors and never look at us twice. I never thought I'd live to see the day when people wouldn't stare at Nick Carter, master detective, all dressed up in knee pants. Quiet. Did you check with Scubby? Yep. But just as Stone said, Tyson was hurt in that explosion and then just sort of vanished. Hasn't been heard of since. Hmm. That takes care of that. Well, here's stage nine. The only place that hasn't been searched either by Riley or me. What do you expect to find? I don't know. It's funny, this door isn't locked. Everything else in the lot has been. Yes. Riley distinctly said it was locked when he tried it. Well, keep your eyes open. There may be a reason for it being open now. Golly, it's dark inside here. Here. Take this flashlight. Okay. I've got another. Hey, Nick, look. There's an old makeup table. I wonder what kind of makeup they used in those days. Patsy, we haven't time to stop for Nick, you to look at makeup. Look here. Why, this makeup isn't old at all. What's that? No, this is the very latest type of movie makeup, and it's all new stuff. Well, good for you, Patsy. Yes, there's something funny about this. Definitely, Nick. Well, this panchromatic makeup wasn't developed until Technicolor came in. They didn't use this type of makeup back in the days when this studio was in use. Somebody must have been here since. And none of the actors are making up way over here. Right, Patsy. I'll make a detective out of you yet. Now let's see if we can find anything else. Oh, I'm getting the creeps, Nick. I don't like it here. Patsy, I think we're getting warm. This is one of the first real clues with... We... Hey. Hmm? Recognize that? Wait. Well, that must be the glass tank they used to take that swimming sequence in the voodoo movie. Right you are. I wonder why they left it half full of water this way. 
When they finished taking that scene, they probably just walked off and left it here. Maybe. Don't forget, they closed this place in a hurry. What are you doing? Patsy, this water is fresh. What? It'd be stale if it'd been here ten years. Stale and smelly. Hey, I'm beginning to think maybe Stone's right and there is a hex on this place. Too bad that voodoo picture wasn't in Technicolor. Those colored stones at the bottom of the tank would have showed up beautifully. They are beautiful, aren't they? Yes, you bet. Hey, Patsy. What? Look here. Those aren't just colored stones. They're... Douse your lights, Patsy, quick. We've got callers. Duck back here behind this crate. The corner saw on the clink this morning with this snooping. Why the boss always swipe such important rocks? Why didn't he settle for just a small frog? Now, the man we're after. Big time, that's why. We've got enough dough to pay all the bills until that stuff cools off. And when it's safe to handle it, he'll smuggle it out of the country and sell it for plenty. What's he leave it lying around here for? Hidden in the old equipment. Now, now we know why boy have was killed. anybody ever come back here? Gosh, when that punk went into that storehouse, I bet he saw the works. Uh, he did. The boss spotted him going in and just had time enough to get that knife and come back and nail him. And the kid was dashing back the stone to spill the beans. Gee, the boss is sure lucky. He ain't lucky, he's smart. He had Lippy planted up on that catwalk just in case somebody got an idea to go into that electrician's storeroom. And somebody did. Dusty that hair. takes brains to know that. Well, we better get going, huh, Jake? Yeah, you start draining the tank so we can get the rocks. I'll get the makeup stuff. Why is he moving everything out now? He figures it'll cool off by now, and with the stuff he's going to lift from that Doré thing this afternoon. I think I'm going to stay. Hold oh, it, Patsy. Keep <laughs> from having it oh, oh. Who's that? Hey, look. Over there, Jake. Two guys. Only come here. Run for it, Patsy. Run, run where? Let go of me, you... Let her go, you lousy rat. Get away. Let her go, you Let her go. Hey, I'll handle it, baby. You want to get the fuck you handle that guy? Hey, hold it. Get my hands off of me. I got to get rough. Get her off. Hey, what's the matter now? Guess that'll hold him. Gosh, it took three of us to knock him cold. He a fighter or something? Hey, hey, I know him. It's Nick Carter, the dick. Well. Nick Carter? Hey. And a good-looking doll. Well, it's a good thing you called me in time. Now, what are we going to do with them now that we got them, huh? We can't just leave them lying around. Somebody's bound to notice them. Hey, the fish tank. Yeah, that's right. We'll throw them in there. Then when they're good and drowned, we'll drain the tank and get them and the other stuff out at the same time. Good idea, Lippy. Okay. Here, Pete, you lift the lid. You shove the girl in, Lippy. All right. Jake and I will dump that Carter guy in. It'll be a real pleasure to do something like this to a copper. Yeah. Come on. Uh, uh, Ready? Go ahead. Put Carter in first. Okay. Here he goes. Happy swimming, Carter. Yeah. Uh, now dump the dame in, Jake. In you go, lady. Uh, ah, that's okay. Uh, hey, listen, guys. Suppose they get out. We'll see that they don't get out. Stokey, huh? Put the lid down on the tank. Okay, Jim. And I'll put this padlock on, and they're safe as if they was in jail. <laughs> That's good work. Hey, hey, look, boys, they're coming too. So what? Who cares now? Yeah, who cares? Lippy, huh? turn on the water. Okay. Here she comes, Jake. Get those two baby spots set up there, will you? Is this what you want? Ah, that's better. Now, uh, open number two a little more. Okay. All right, this is the take. Ready? Ready. Okay. Lights. Camera. All right, action, Miss Dory. It was when I first opened your letter that I knew at last. As I opened the... No, 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 Lula, darling. Mean what you say. Remember, your lover has returned. Now, this is your big moment. Now, relax. Take it easy. Now, now, come on. Once more. All right, action. Come on. It was when I first opened your letter that I knew at last. As I opened the envelope, even before I read the words that you'd written there, I realized that what I'd hoped for so long had at last... Oh! 
Hey, what's the matter with those lights? Why aren't they... Turn on those lights. I'm in charge here. There'll be no confusion. Quiet, everybody. Quiet. The masked man. Who are you to tell me under Shut the... Shut up, on the Stone. Street? This is a holdup. A holdup? Oh, this is oh, a... Look here, you. You can't pull a holdup. Quiet, I said. Quiet if you don't want a bullet hit you. Quiet, quiet. Quiet, the man's mad. That's better. Now, nobody will get hurt if you just keep quiet and do as you're told. Turn on that spotlight. Okay, boss. That's it. Now, all of you, line up against the wall there. Come on, get moving. I don't want to shoot, but I will if you make me. And shut up. Uh, you can't tell me to shut that up. That order includes you, know. you too, Riley. Now, don't forget that although you can't see me with this spotlight shining in your eyes, I can see you very clearly. Now, each one of you in turn will step forward and put your valuables on that table and center stage. And don't try to hold out on me or it'll be bad for you. All right. We'll start with a star performer, Miss Lulu Doré. Please, Miss Doré, if you think I can't see her trying to hide behind the drapes over there, you're wrong. You're in this too. Your jewels, please. No. No, not my emeralds. Surely you won't... Surely I will. It's those emeralds I'm particularly interested in. You don't think I care for the little wristwatches and pocketbooks I'm going to get from the rest of these people, do you? But you can't mean to take my emeralds. One more word out of you and I'll come after them myself. And if I do it... Stand where you are, Tyson. I've got you covered. Nick Carter! Oh, Nick! Oh, please, oh, P, is that you? Come and get me, Carter. Watch him, Riley, if you can. Turn the lights on, Patsy. Right, Nick. Here they are. Well, there he goes, Nick! <laughs> ah, I missed him, darn it. Did you see where he went, Nick? There he goes, Mr. Carter, climbing up the, climbing up the catwalk. Tyson, come down from there or I'll shoot. You haven't got a gun, Nick Carter. Yours is too wet to shoot after your little swim. But I've got my gun. Here! <laughs> You missed me, Tyson, but I won't miss you. You may not know it, but my guns are absolutely waterproof. Nice work, Carter. You shot the gun right out of his hand. And now your gun's gone, Tyson. Come on down. Yeah? Come up here and get me. You haven't caught me yet. So long. Look at him run. He should make a misstep or lose his balance up there. He'd fall off and get a... Tyson! Tyson, stop! Stop! Look out! You don't slip there! Nick! He lost his balance! Watch out, Tyson! You say you want us to drop you at headquarters, Riley? If you will, Nick. Okay. Your men got the rest of Tyson's gang all right? He did. They're coming right behind us. Was Tyson badly hurt from his fall? Oh, no, not much. Just a broken ankle. He'll be all right. <laughs> all right, that is, until he gets to the electric chair. Oh, Nick, when I think of how close we came to drowning, I'm scared all over again. Hey, how did you say you got out of that tank, Nick? Believe it or not, Lieutenant. He cut a piece of that heavy glass with a diamond in his ring. Well, what do you know? But, but look, if it was as easy as all that, well, what took you so long doing it, Nick? I had to wait until the thugs got out of the room. Then I just cut a nice little circle out of the glass right beside where the padlock was, reached out, and picked the lock. All very simple. Uh, Simple for you, maybe. Not for me. And you say you found the jewels Tyson had stolen in the bottom of the tank, eh? Yes, Riley. What Patsy and I thought were pretty colored stones. Turned out to be all the jewels Tyson had stolen during the last ten years, all unmounted and dumped in with the pebbles in the tank. But what made you first suspect Tyson, Nick? Well, Patsy, it was his voice first. Remember I told you after we saw him in the movie that I knew I had heard his voice somewhere very recently? Oh, so that's why that voice sounded so familiar. Can you imagine that? A movie star turned crook. Then there was the fact that Tyson had faded so completely out of sight after his accident. That looked fishy to me. No great star would have let his career be ruined without bringing a suit of some kind. Unless he had some plans of his own. And from what I learned from Scubby, we realized he never had brought suit. Yes, and a suit like that would have made all the tabloids. But how did you know Tyson and the Watchman were the same? I didn't, Patsy. Until you found that makeup kit. That panchromatic makeup is often used to cover scars. And then I remembered the scarred Gateman. It fitted So did his voice, and the fact that he had the only remaining set of keys to the lot. And, of course, he had all the opportunity in the world. But I bet you didn't realize that the murders were tied up with the robberies. Not until we heard those crooks talking, I mean. The makeup kit told me that, too. 
Remember, Patsy, how you always claimed that all those robberies were done by individuals, not a gang? Yes, but I still don't see Well, that... Tyson was a consummate actor, and he had complete knowledge of makeup. He disguised himself as a different character, I imagine, for each robbery. Evidently, he played his role expertly, since he succeeded in giving the impression that different people were committing the various thefts. But say, if that makeup was so good, well, why couldn't he have gone back to the movies instead of turning thief? Well, Riley, it was good enough for dim lights, but not for the sharp eyes of the camera. Oh, I see. Poor fellow. What an end for a great star. Yes. The explosion probably injured his mind, too. Oh, one more thing, Nick. How did he get to be caretaker? Oh, I asked Stone that. He said he felt sorry for the man and had given him the job out of kindness. Oh. Well, that's all over now. Except that from now on, I'm allergic to water anywhere, except in drinking glasses. <laughs> This was another strange experience of Nick Carter, Master Detective, called The Glass Coffin or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Voodoo Curse. Another of the curious adventures of Nick Carter, which are brought to you regularly at the same time by WOR Mutual. And now, Nick, will you tell us something about your story for next week? Well, next week we leave this part of the country and are going out west to the mining districts of Montana. Did you go too, Patsy? Yes, I went along. But Nick and Scubby did most of the work and had most of the excitement. I just stayed in the hotel and waited. Yes, that was the first case that Scubby and I really worked out together. And before they were through with it, Scubby very nearly went crazy, literally. And Nick just missed being buried alive. You see, it started out to be a case of robbery. But it ended up with at least two murders and more excitement than I've had in a long time. Well, I hope it's as good as it sounds. It's better. But more of that next week. So long. So long, folks. We'll be seeing you. And so long to you, Nick and Patsy. In The Strange Adventure You've Just Heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark, Patsy by Helen Choate. The story was written for Nick Carter by Nancy and Jean Webb. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was under the direction of Jock McGregor. Next week at this same time, another curious experience of Nick Carter entitled The Flying Duck Murders, or Nick Carter and the Mysterious Gold Thieves. This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. My name is Humphrey Davis. I've been playing the part of Lieutenant Riley in tonight's show. Just now, though, I'm speaking as myself. Actors, you know, appear at many war bond rallies. We like to know that what we can do may help in selling more bonds. But after all, selling more war bonds is everyone's business. You can talk to your friends about the third war loan campaign just as any speaker might. You know the reasons why we must buy extra bonds. You know how purchases of extra war bonds back the attack. You know that they're a great investment... And you know that giving up something you were planning to buy for yourself and buying war bonds instead isn't really any sacrifice. And as you think of these things, how about doing more in this third war loan yourself? Because you can't do too much for the men who are fighting for us every minute somewhere in the world. The Return of Nick Carter is produced in the studios of WOR and is broadcast over most of these stations every Monday evening at 9.30 Eastern Wartime. This is Mutual. It's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. 
Tonight's curious adventure... The Flying Duck Murders. For Nick Carter and the Gold Thieves. Carter, unless you think more of a large fat fee than you do of your life, I advise you to throw up the case at once. Apparently, we don't look at this in the same light, Mr. Dalrymple. I expect danger, and I'm prepared to meet it. I suppose you know that two other detectives have come out to this wild Montana country where the flying duck mine is located trying to find the trouble. So do you know that neither of them lived to tell what they found? How were they killed, Mr. Dalrymple? They went crazy, Miss Bowen. Kessler, the San Francisco man, fell over a cliff, while Riley, the man from Chicago, dropped 600 feet down the main shaft of the mine. Very interesting. I feel quite sure that Nick won't share their fate. May I inquire for whom you're acting, Mr. Carter? You may. For Mr. Cecil Trenwick, an old friend of my father's and a large shareholder in the flying duck mine. He said that you'd cooperate with me in every possible way. I shall do what I can, certainly. Good. I should like you to give me a letter to the superintendent of the mine, telling him that I'm a good workman and that you promised me a job. I shall disguise myself as a miner, using the name Dave Jarvis. Very well. Uh, you said your name will be Dave Jarvis? Right. Uh, well, that'll do what you want. Give it to Mr. Nate Crosby, the mine super. He happens to be here in town this morning. Unless you change your mind and decide to return to New York. Thank you, Mr. Dalrymple. But I'm staying here until my work is finished. Good morning. Goodbye. Good morning. Wait a minute, Patsy. I wonder if Mr. Dalrymple is... 431 operator. Yeah. Yes. Hello? I want to speak to Nate Crosby. Okay, I'll wait. Crosby? He's the mine super, Nate. Yes, things are beginning to move already. Yes. If I open this door a crack, we'll hear better. Nate, this is Dalrymple. Frenick has done what he's been threatening to do for so long. He sent Nick Carter out here to investigate. Yes, Nick Carter. The one man in the world I'm afraid of. They've got to market the stuff right away. We can't wait any longer now. I'll give him the the job he wants and then take care of him. Yes, if you don't, it may mean curtains for all of us. Right. So long. And that will settle your future, Mr. Nick Carter. I very much doubt that, Mr. Dalrymple. <laughs> Thanks for the attention, Mr. Dalrymple. But I intend to take care of my own future. <laughs> So, oh, Mr. Dalrymple is in on the deal. He certainly is, Gubby, up to his neck. Well, at least we start off with one good hot prospect. What do we do now? Get into your miner's office. Then take this note down to this address and give it to Nate Crosby, the mine super. Now remember, your name's Dave Jarvis and Crosby to give you a job in the mill. Okay, Nick. Then what? Well, first and foremost, keep your eyes open. Crosby will believe you're Nick Carter. So watch out for him. He'll try to put you out of the way. And don't forget, Scobby, the detectives from Chicago and Frisco both came to grief. Well, it's going to be different with the guy from New York. Now, Patsy, you wait here at the hotel where we can get in touch with you if we need you. Sure, Nick. All right, get going, Scubby. I'm going out to the mine right away. You wait, though, and ride out with Crosby. And watch out for him. Right, Nick. I'll keep one eye on him and one on the mine. <laughs> Thanks for the lift, bud. That's okay, pal. That's the super's office right there. Thanks. I'll be seeing you. Hey, you looking for someone? You're the super of the Flying Duck Mine? No, I'm the assistant super. Clem Hendricks is his name. Well, my name's King. I'm writing up an article about the mines of Montana for the Miners' Times of Kansas City. Any objection to me sticking around a while, looking things over? None at all, Mr. King. Just so long as you say something good about us in your article. You want me to show you around? No, thanks. I'll just drift around and see what I can pick up. Well, if anyone stops here, tell them I said it was okay. Thanks, I will. You see, you. Now, find the boss of the day shift and get some information on how this place operates. Well, these are the most stamping machines, Mr. King. They crush the ore very fine, and it is then sluiced through the battery boxes and carried over the plates. I see. The plates are coated with quicksilver or mercury, 
And the Quicksilver picks up most of the gold and from the crushed ore. And this combination of Quicksilver and gold we call amalgam. And you scrape this amalgam off the plates and take it to the refinery? Yes, Mr. King. The refinery separates the gold from the Quicksilver and casts it into bars. Very interesting. Well, thanks very much. I'll roam along and look the rest of the place over. See you later. That's where you belong, you old hag. Down there with your fat your face in the dirt. You try, kill you. I'm mad, you old Indian witch, and I'm going to finish the job right now. that knife. I'll drop it between your ribs. You Never mind, drop fool. that knife, I said. You're the fool. Knock me down, will you? I'll show hey, you. Ledyard, put up that gun. Uh, but, Nate, this fella. Put up the gun, I said. What are you trying to do? Well, I was trying to make Zalander behave. This fellow interfered. It made me mad. Solander, where is she? Ah, she's right. Well, I'll be gone. She must have run away while me and him was arguing. Ah. So you interfered, did you, mister? Uh, certainly I did. You're King, the newspaper man, aren't you? That's right. I'm here to I've been looking for you. I'm Crosby, mine superintendent. I'll give you just 15 minutes to get out of this camp. So you're Nate Crosby. I am, and I'm the boss here. And I say, get out. All right, Crosby. I'll get out. But I'll be back. I never leave a job unfinished. All right, pick them up. You can carry them. I know they're heavy, but they have to have a solid lead lining so we can ship bodies in them. Put them in the old powder house and shut the door when you're through. Okay, boss. Come on, fellas. Okay. All right, get it up there. That does it. Now we're going to have to move some of these empty powder kegs to make room for all three caskets. Jarvis, you stay here and pile them up out of the way. The rest of you get the other caskets. Okay, boss. All right, hop to it. Tubby, is that you, Nick? Where are you? Behind these cakes. Start piling them up. You can talk while you work. Oh, sure, Nick. But what happened, Nick? Why are you hiding in here? Crosby ordered me to get out of camp immediately. But the assistant super suggested I hide here until he get me a ride back to town. Seems he doesn't like Crosby any better than I do. What with you? Well, I got a job as crusher man on the night shift at the mill. And what are these boxes you're bringing in here? Caskets. Crosby told the teamster the bodies of the two detectives who got killed were to be taken up and shipped to their friend. Right. Here come the men with another box. Let's get it in here. All right. Well, let's get it in here. Okay. Nick, there were only two detectives who were killed. Who do you suppose the third box is for? For you, I imagine, Scabby. What? Remember, they think you and Nick Carter. I'm only Mr. King, newspaper reporter. Uh, well, I'll certainly see that that casket stays empty. Stubby, you know where the detectives are buried? Well, the teamster told me that Crosby knows because he and a couple of the mill hands took the bodies away. I see. Scubby, yeah. I've got an idea. When the men bring in the other casket, you go out with them. Then make some excuse to come back in here again. Okay, Nick, I'll fix it. Quiet. All right, fellas, right here. Yeah. That's it. Come on. <laughs> All right, that'll do it, I think. Yeah. Oh, hey, boss. What? I must have dropped my knife inside the powder house. You mind if I get it? Do what you want, so long as you're not late for your shift at the mill. Okay, boss, I'll be there. Oh, Kernick, they've gone. No, what's your idea? First, shut the door, Scott. Oh, sure, Nick. <laughs> now, Scubby, I want to see what's in these caskets. Yeah, I've got a screwdriver in my knife. Oh, so have I. Look, I'll help you. Good. Well, I'm glad they only use four screws to fasten these covers down. Makes it simpler. But why do you want to see what's inside, Nick? Got a hunch, that's all. Yeah. There, it's got it. You all ready? Yeah. All right, let's stick her up. Give me a hand. Yeah. All right. There. Uh-huh. My hunch is right, Scubby. The caskets are not lead-lined. The extra weight is due to this scrap iron in the bottom there. Like Crosby said, they had to have lead lining so they could be shipped with the bodies in them. These caskets figure in this game more than just as caskets, Scubby. Well, Crosby told the teamster to have a fresh team hitch to the large wagon for him at midnight tonight. I thought so. Scubby, he's going to take these caskets somewhere tonight. 
And I want to know where. Yeah, but how are you going to find out? I'm going with him. Hidden in this casket. I'll get in it and you put the lead, uh, lid back on. Oh, but Nick, you'll smother in there with the lid down. Oh, you can put four small pieces of wood under the coffin lid before you screw it down. Oh, but Nick, I wish you would. I'll hurry up. All right. Pretty good fit. All right. Now hurry up. Okay, Nick. Keep your head down while I put the lid on. Anything yet, Cubby? Well, the only place in the mill where the gold could be stolen is the room where the battery boxes and the plates are. Hey, well, have you found out how they did it? No, not yet. I hope to learn tonight when I'm on duty in the mill. Good, Cubby. You take care of that end. Now, what's this end? Yeah. Well, here's good luck to us both. I suspect we both may need it. How's the great Nick Carter doing tonight, Ledger? You mean Mr. Dave Jarvis? Yeah. He's doing swell. Look at him. He's taking another drink. He's been hitting the water bucket steady for the last half hour. Is the loco working? I'll say. The bees are in his bonnet already. Uh, A famous Nick Carter will go the way the other two did. <laughs> hey, what are you fellas doing dancing around like that? Yeah. <laughs> You can't fool me. There are a lot of billy goats. Oh, I'm thirsty. You gotta get me a drink. Keep your eye on him. If he starts fighting, lay him out with a crowbar. Uh, Don't take any chances. Okay. Did you see that? He's heading for the cliffs, just like the others. The lander's mixture hasn't failed yet. What's next, Crosby? Ledyard, get my team from the stable at midnight tonight and meet me at the old powder house. Now we can put Nick Carter's name on the third casket. For Carter, we can bring this business to a successful finish. Oh, I hope we're not going far at this rate. You mean we're going to quit? We sure are. We'll market the stuff and make a clean getaway. Ah, this is the roughest ride I've ever had. Hey, 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 are you going to market the stuff? Uh, leave that to me. I'll see that each of you gets Stop him, what? Stop him! Hold him in! in. They're running away. One of the rings is broken. Running away? I didn't count on this. We're going to smash! Jump for your lives! We got off just in time, boy. Yeah. Hey, look at that casket, Crosby. The one with the lid torn off. Huh? Oh, that's the infernal reporter I ordered to get out of camp this afternoon. What was he doing in that casket? Never mind that now. Get him while he's only half conscious. Come on, Sam. Now you get... Oh. 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 Good work, boys. That fixes Mr. Reporter. Ties hands and feet with that rope. Okay, boy. You won't fight no more for a while now. Hey, look, Super. Here's a pair of handcuffs in his pocket and a couple of guns. Hey, what kind of reporter are you? Going around with handcuffs and guns in your pocket. You'll have to draw your own conclusions, Crosby. I've drawn them already. You're here to help Nick Carter. 
But by this time, Carter's where neither you nor anyone else is going to help him. He's loco. Plum loco. <laughs> well, you never can be sure about Carter, Crosby. I can this time. And I can be sure of you, too. All right, put him back in the casket, boys. Put the cover on. Nail it down if you can't find the screws. Here, here's some nails. Uh, come on, you. In you go. I got out the last time I was in here, Crosby. But you won't get out this time. Get the lid on, boys. That does it. That's, well, that's enough. He can't do anything with his hands tied. Lydiard, you and Sam get the shovels that were in the wagon and dig a nice deep hole. We'll bury our reporter friend with our blessings. <laughs> I get here. Just before sun come up, they chase crazy man through wood. Then me here can shoot. See you run. You come fall down by the lander. Hurt in head. So the lander hurt. Well, certainly glad you were around when I passed out. Husby, you enemy? <laughs> certainly is now. You say you were chasing a crazy man? Mm. Him drink loco. But two other men come before. I wonder if that could have been Scubby. Crosby said he was loco. So, Lander, what did you want to find him for? Me want to save him not. Give medicine. Make him well. But, but, but why did you want to save him? Crosby give him loco, this man. So, Lander, eat Crosby. Want to save man. Crosby want to kill. So, Lander, listen. I think this crazy... <laughs> no, Scubby! No, put down that knife, Scubby! No, no, Scubby, no! Put that knife! Get it to me! There. No! No, I hate to do this to you, but it's the wind way, so... No. Oh, there. Quick, the ladder. Get me some rope. I'll tie his hands and feet while he's unconscious. Ah, oh, poor Scubby. Looks as if he'd been through the war. Here, oh. rope. You're tired. Thanks. Oh. Now. Make it medicine. Make them all better from local. That's right, Scubby. That should hold you now. Here, medicine. Make them well. Make them drink. Thanks. All right, Scabby, old boy. Come on, oh, drink God. it. Come on, drink it. Oh. Come on, drink oh, it. Come on, now. Come on, now. There you are. There. Come on, that. Now, him sleep a little while. Be all right when him wake up. Oh, poor guy. I'm not on tie your arms anyway. Take this coat off you, and you'll be more comfortable. Hey, what's this? A coil of wire with a lot of metal discs attached to it. That's the answer. Of course. The mystery of the Flying Duck Mine is a mystery no longer. Well, oh, oh, oh. Scubby, oh. you feeling better now that you've had some sleep? Yeah, I feel pretty good. Why? You don't remember what happened to you yesterday morning? Well, the last thing I recall is going to the water bucket and taking a long drink. It seemed as if the more I drank, the more I wanted. Well, that water bucket was loaded with local weed juice. What? I'm surprised you didn't notice it. Oh, I'm surprised at myself now. But both the amalgamators, even Crosby himself, kept drinking. While pretending to from that same bucket. Well, they certainly had me fooled. Hey, look, Scubby. You remember seeing these discs strung on this coil of wire? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I recall seeing one of the amalgamators have it last night. Why, did I bring it here? You did. And it breaks the case wide open. Well, good for me, even if I don't, didn't know it. Hey, tell me, Nick, what are those discs used for? Here, I'll show you. Yeah. 
What? Now, you see? This stuff I'm scraping off is amalgam. A mixture of quicksilver and gold. The men who worked in the battery boxes in the mill, the amalgamators, hung these discs and a lot more like them in the battery boxes right where they'd catch the best of the gold before it flowed over the other plates. They took out over half the gold that flowed into the boxes this way. So that's where all those thousands of dollars worth of gold disappeared to. Yes, Scubby. A very clever method of stealing the gold. Now, if we could only find out what Crosby and his gang do with the amalgam after they scrape it off their disc. Hmm. You want to catch Crosby? Well, I'll say we do if we can... Hey, Nick. Who is she? Oh, that's Zolanda. She saved my life. Oh, and yours too, incidentally. Saved my life? How? Well, that local weed juice you drank is fatal. Well, Zolanda gave you a nice antidote for it. Oh, gosh, thanks, Zolanda. Gee, I'm sure much obliged. Crosby tried to kill me. Me, it's him. Zolanda knew all about Crosby. You come with me. Well, where are you taking us? Mm. Crosby got cave inside mountain where he hide stuff. Come, me show you. This is where Crosby hides out, huh? Yeah. Too bad there's no one here now. But well, they've been here today. Look there, Scubby. Well, that looks like the scrap iron we took out of the casket in the old powder house before you hid in it. Right, Scubby. And this scrap iron was in the other two caskets. So they brought them up here. I wonder why. There's the answer. Over there in that corner. And the fair's furnished. And it's still warm, Scubby. Then we must have scared them off before we came up. Wait. Let me take the cover off this retort. There. Nick. Is that gold in there? That's just what it is. Out of the gold stolen from the mine. This is where the gang refined the amalgam they scraped off their discs. Much easier to handle gold this way because it weighs so much less. Now, since we know from what Dalrymple said that they never disposed of any of the stolen gold, they must have eight or nine hundred pounds of it by now. Hey, maybe they've got it hidden around here somewhere. They did have, Scubby, but not now. Well, what makes you think so, Nick? Here. Take a look outside there. They've been digging there very recently. Oh, but of course, Nick, they had to dig up the bodies of the two detectives to ship them back home. No, 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 Scubby. The way it looks to me is this. After I got away from them last night, Crosby and his men took up the casket they tried to bury me in and tried brought to over... bury you in? Hey, you didn't tell me about well, that. i about it later, Scubby. Right now, I'm interested in what happened here. They brought the three caskets up here early this morning. Loaded them up. How could they load three of them? They only had two bodies. No, Scubby. Three caskets were loaded up. Don't you understand yet? No, Nick, I'm afraid I don't. How could they be Scubby. loading up? How good are you at riding a horse? Riding a horse? Yeah. Well, I used to ride years ago. Why? Good. Zelanda, can you get us a couple of good, fast horses right away? For you, me, get two good horses quick. Good. Come on, Scubby. Let's get the horses and ride to the railroad station before the eastbound train gets in. all the hurry. Well, unless I'm wrong, Scubby, these three caskets are going east on the next train. We've got to get there in time to stop them. Oh, even Crosby himself would recognize us these Indian costumes the land will let us. Well, we may need to be disguised before we get through. Hey, you didn't finish telling me how you got away from Crosby and his gang when they started to bury you alive. What did happen, Nick? Well, they dug the hole and they put the casket down in it. I tried to pry the lid loose, but my hands were tied behind me. I worked on them, and just as they started throwing the dirt back on top of the casket, I finally got my hands free and untied my feet. Just then, I heard shooting and some female screaming. A female? Out there in the wild? Yeah. It was Zoland, I found out later. Well, I managed to loosen the cover and push it up enough to see that Crosby and the men were watching something across the clearing. So I seized my chance and climbed carefully out of the hole on the opposite side. I started to run, but they saw me and started shooting. Fortunately, though, they were bad shots, and I was almost free when a bullet grazed my head. It must have stunned me, because I remember nothing more till I woke up in Zolanda's hut this morning. Well, do you know what it was that distracted the men's attention? Well, Zolanda told me that you were chasing her, trying to shoot her. She was screaming. You chased her around the other side of the clearing, and then went off after something else. It was just about then that you saw me running toward her. When Crosby saw me drop, he gave up the chase. 
Rolanda waited until they went back and then dragged me to her hut. Gosh, Nick. We owe a lot to Rolanda. Right, Scubby. And the best way we can pay that debt is to see that Crosby and his murdering pals end up where they belong. Behind bars. Or in the electric chair. Stand, Patsy? Of course, Nick. You want the police chief to meet you at the station in ten minutes. And you want Mr. Dalrymple and the president and treasurer of the mine to meet you in the chief's office in an hour. That's right. Now, be sure you get them all. Don't worry. I'll take care of it. These are the ones, Nick. These three here on the baggage truck. Did you notice the names on them, Scubby? Yeah. Joe Briley, Phil Kessler, or look, Nick Carter. Hmm. I'd rather be out here dressed as an Indian than in there dressed as a corpse. One side, there, <laughs> rain in the face. We got to get these caskets into the baggage car. Oh, just the... a minute. You see this badge? Special agent. So what? What do you want me to do? Just leave these caskets in the baggage truck for now. But they're supposed to go on this... staying to... here, quiet. Hey, look here, baggage master. Get these boxes on the train and be quick about it. No be in hurry, mister. Why, you Indian meddler, what the deuce huh? do you... You look behind you. What do you mean? Take your hat off, Scubby. Sure, Nick. There you are, Mr. Crosby. Dave Jarvis. Why, you... Don't try to start anything, Crosby. I've got my gun on you. Hey, where are you getting these boxes off? Hey, your man, officer. These three right here. Get your hands up, all of you, and pass. Hey, what the you devil, you... Hey, what is it? Quiet, Quiet all of you. You three men are under arrest. Charge of robbing the Flying Duck's mine and with the murder of Detectives Riley and Kessler. Now, Mr. Dalrymple, I asked you and the officials of the Flying Duck mine to meet me here in the office of the chief of police because I want to show you what's in the casket that Crosby was taking back east with him. Now, the first casket is supposed to contain the body of Phil Kessler. All right, Scubby, open it. Sure, Nick. Cold. Gold money. Yes, Chief. In these three caskets, you'll find the entire amount of gold stolen from the mine. Stolen by Dalrymple, the mine manager, Crosby, the mine super, and four of the workmen who worked in the amalgam room of the mill. They stole the amalgam, refined it in their own furnace, and buried it in two holes in the ground, which was supposed to be the graves of the two dead detectives. But Mr. Carter, that much gold would make the caskets pretty heavy. Wouldn't that extra weight be noticed? No, Chief. Because when you ship a body by train, the casket has to be lead-lined and hermetically sealed. That means it weighs much more than the usual casket. Crosby, Ledger, and Perkins were each going to take one of the caskets east with them as a personal baggage, which would prevent anybody from examining them too closely. One of the cleverest schemes I've seen in a long time. But it wasn't clever enough, not with Nick on the job. You'd have to get up early in the morning to beat Nick. another strange experience of Nick Carter, master detective, called The Flying Duck Murders, or Nick Carter and the Gold Thieves. What's the matter? What is it? Another case for Nick Carter, master detective. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure... State's prison evidence on Nick Carter and the mystery of the midnight robbery. Pardon me, uh... Could you let me have a line? Certainly. There you are. Swell night, isn't it? Yes, indeed. It's a pleasure to walk on a night like this. Yeah. Well, thanks. Not at all. Good night. Good night. Yes, even in a big city like this, the stars are just... Help! What? Help! 
I wonder what's wrong with her. I beg your pardon, but is there anything I can do? Can I help you? Is, is something wrong? Murder! Murder? Who is it? My uncle. When did it happen? I don't know. Well, where is he? In the library. In this big house right here? Yes. Oh, it's awful. Well, you shouldn't be out here in your night clothes. It's too chilly. Come, let me take you back to the house. Come on. Yes. Back to the house. Did you call the police? No, I, I just saw him lying there in a pool of blood. Then I, I came out here to get help. Well, I'm Nick Carter, the detective. I'll be glad to help you if I can. Now, careful going up the steps. There we are. Now, if you'll show me the library. He's, he's in there. Oh, yes, I see. dead, all right. Who found him? The housekeeper. She came in late and saw a light still on in here. And she looked in to see if he needed anything and saw... Then she called you? Yes. And you are... I'm Ella Jabot, his niece. I, I've lived here with him for the last five years since my mother died. I see. Has anything been touched since the body was found? No. Nobody's been in here at all. Good. Uh -huh. Shot through the head at close range. Well, it looks as if he did it himself. No. No. Well, here's the pistol that was used right beside him. Did you hear the shot? No. I sleep at the opposite end of the house. Oh, Mr. Carter, please find whoever killed my uncle. What makes you think he didn't kill himself? He wouldn't do a thing like that. I know it. Well, that's hardly evidence, Miss Ella. Did you see this note? Note? I know. Your uncle apparently left it propped up here in his desk. It's addressed to Mrs. Sarah Jarbeau, 7 Dunner Street, City. You know her? I never heard of her. What does it say? Let's see. My dear madam, you've been a widow, in fact, ever since the hour following our marriage. But before day breaks, you will be a widow in name also, for I shall be dead. I have at last learned the truth. The one who told me right after our wedding ceremony that you were everything evil has at last confessed that you were really as good as I believed you to be. It's too late for me to ask you to forgive me for the great wrong I've done you. So I'm taking this way of making what amends I can. The upper drawer of my desk is my will, which leaves everything to you, the repentant husband, Enos Jarbo. Well, that's a remarkable document. Did you know anything about your uncle ever having been married? I no, I, I never heard that before. Well, that note would seem to prove it was suicide. I know better. May I see that note? Of course. Here. I knew it, Mr. Carter. My uncle didn't kill himself, and he didn't write this note either. Isn't that your uncle's handwriting? It looks very much like it, but he didn't write it. Uncle didn't use this kind of pen. What do you mean? Uncle Enos was very proud of his handwriting, and he never used anything but a special type of old-fashioned steel pen point. It has a very fine point. I see. Yes. This note was undoubtedly written with a stub point. Another thing, Mr. Carter. Uncle never wrote anywhere except at his desk here. And this desk has been locked since yesterday morning, and I have the key. How long have you had it? I borrowed it yesterday morning because I had some letters to write. And I've had it ever since. Is there another key to this desk? No. And Uncle would never write anywhere else. You're quite a convincing detective, Miss Ella. And if you're right, this can't be suicide in spite of the other evidence. I know I'm right. Uncle would never have taken his own life. I believe you. And I'm just curious enough about this to do a little investigating myself. If I'm as good a detective as you are, I'll find your uncle's murderer in short order. You think this Mrs. Sarah Blake is the woman you want, Nick? I'm not sure, Patsy. But when the maid told me that she never heard of Mrs. Sarah Jarbeau, but that Mrs. Sarah Blake lives here, I thought I'd better talk to her. She might be Mrs. Jarbo using her maiden name. Here she comes now. You uh, wish to speak to me? I'm looking for Mrs. Sarah Jarbo. Do you know her? I do. I am Sarah Jarbo. You were right, Nick. My name is Bill Peters. I'm a reporter. I'm writing a story on the sudden death of your husband, Enos Jarbo. Oh, the poor man. He died to make up to me for my years of heartbreak. Yes, I, I saw the note he left. Would you please tell me what happened? Well, I met him one summer on the coast of Maine. We were married in the fall. We took a train for Boston. 
And on the way, he went into the smoking car to smoke a cigar. I never saw him again. Why, well, that's terrible. Why didn't he come back? I only know that when the train reached the station, a messenger gave me $500 and a note. Oh. It said that he had learned I was not a good woman and that I should never see him again. But didn't you try to clear it up? No. If he believed it, I would never seek to persuade him otherwise. I've worked as a governess ever since. I see. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mrs. Jarbo. Come along, Patsy. Goodbye, Mrs. Jarbo. I hope you'll be happy now. Thank you. And goodbye. Hmm. She certainly got a tough break. You know, Patsy, I was prepared to doubt everything she told me, but somehow I'm inclined to believe her story, even if it does spoil my theory that she's part of an elaborate put-up job. Which way are you going from here? Well, I think I'll... Pardon me. Uh, would you let me have a light? Oh, yes, of course. Here you are. Thanks. Nice day, isn't it? Yes, very pleasant. Thanks. So long. So long. Well, come along, Patsy. Uh, wait a minute. Hmm? I've met that man somewhere before. He asked me for a light just that same way. Where was it? Well, of course. It was outside Jarbo's house last night, right after the murder. You mean you think he... Wait a minute, watch a minute. I want to see if he... Yes. He's going into the house we just left. Right. If he and Mrs. Jarbo know each other, the chances are her story is a phony. Oh, but Nick, she seems... Yes, I know so what I know, it, Patsy, but this changes things. Patsy, I want you to find out what you can about old Eno Jarbo's past. Find out about that marriage, if there ever was one. But first, call Scubby and tell him to get here right away. Okay. If that man leaves before Scubby gets here, I'll follow myself. Otherwise, Scubby can tail him. But I've got to know where he goes and what he does. Right now, he's our one positive clue. Is it all right to talk in here, Nick? The lobby of a big hotel is probably the safest place in the world to talk in, Scubby. Well, what'd you find out? Well, I followed him over to a saloon over on 3rd Avenue. Yeah? There was a fellow waiting there for him. I tried to hear what they talked about, but all I could get was the name Jarbo. Yeah, I heard that several times. I thought so. But just as I was really getting in close, a couple of plain clothes cops came along and pinched him. Pinched him? What for? Well, it seems he broke out of state's prison three days ago. I heard the cops call him Barney McCoy. Barney McCoy. Yeah. Jailbird from state's prison. Pardon me, Scubby. Want to speak to the desk clerk? Oh, sure, Nick, but what do you have to... Oh, clerk, I'd like to yes. speak to the governor's suite, please. Yes, Mr. Carter. Uh, use booth number two right over there, please. Thank you. Oh, Nick, what in the world do you want to talk to the governor for? Just have him remember, Scubby. He's stopping at this very hotel for a few days. I want him to do me... Uh... Hello, Mr. Secretary. Well, this is Nick Carter. I'd like to speak to the governor a moment, if I may. Thank you. Hello, governor. This is Nick Carter. Fine, thanks. Governor, I want to go to state's prison. Oh, no, not as a visitor. I want to go as a convict. Nick, are you nuts? No, I mean it. If you can spare me five minutes, I think I can convince you. Thanks. I'll be right up. Ella, I asked you to meet me here at my office because I'm going to be out of town for a few days, and I want to have everything straight before I leave. Uh, has anything further happened? Nothing, Mr. Carter, except that Mrs. Jarbo has installed herself in the house as its mistress. She's very unpleasant to me, and I know she'd like me to leave. Well, you stay right there. Did the will leave anything to you? No, Mr. Carter. Everything went to her. I can't understand it. I can. That will is forged. But the will is in uncle's handwriting, and both the witnesses to the will have identified their signatures as genuine. And the will was found where the note said it would be. Well, nevertheless, I'm convinced the will's a fake. Betsy, what did you find out? Nina Charbot and Sarah Blake were married right enough. I found the record in a little church on the south side. Hmm. Sarah really is his wife. Forged will doesn't make sense. And neither does a suicide note, which Jarbeau didn't write. Maybe he did kill himself after all, Mr. Carter. Maybe he just forgot about me. No, I don't believe it, Ella. I don't either. And Ella, I'm going to prove I'm right, even if I even if I have to go to jail to do it. You're the new man. Yeah, Warden. What's your name? Max Herbert. Where were you born? Buffalo, New York. How old are you? 33. Nationality? American. Married? Nope. Crime? Housebreaking. Very well. The guard will take you to the photographers and then to the laboratory.
Well, fella, you've been here three days. How do you like working in this shoe shop? I don't like it. I'm not cut out for it. What are you in for? Second story job. What'd I get you for? Cracking a safe. There's four of us. Two of them got away. Me and McCoy was nailed cold. McCoy? Hey, you wouldn't mean Barney McCoy, would you? Yeah. Yeah, you know him? Sure, know him well. Great guy. Yeah, he sure is. And you know his wife? Yeah, some. He's a darn smart woman, Eddie is. Eddie? Yeah. Thought her name was Sarah. No, oh, no, his wife's Eddie. Sarah was his sister. Yeah, they look so much alike, you couldn't tell one from the other. Yeah. Well, what became of Sarah? I don't know. She married some rich guy for his money, but he left it flat. I don't know what happened after that. Eddie's still in town waiting for Mac to get out. Yeah, he did break out a few days ago. He just caught him and brought him back here. Yeah. Yeah, they got him on the rock pile for trying to escape. Hey, cut out that talking, you guys. Get back to work. Okay, okay. So Barney McCoy is on the rock pile now. I rather think I'd like to be transferred to the rock pile myself. Hey, Barney. Yeah. Look, you've known me now for almost two weeks. Yeah. So what? You know I wouldn't give you a bum steer, don't you? What are you leading up to, Max? I'm working on a way to get out of here. Before I come up here, I heard you on the level. I'd like to let you in on it. Where did you ever hear of me outside this place? Oh, the big town. A girl named Sarah told me about you. What? You married her sister, Eddie. You know Sarah? Sure. About five, six years ago. I haven't seen her since, though. So. Uh, Sarah's, uh, Sarah's in Europe now. Yeah. When are you planning on getting out of here? As soon as I get the necessary people lined up. If I had some dough, we could get out of here tomorrow. How much do you need? About 200 to start with. Okay. I'll have it for you tomorrow. Okay, Max. You get that stuff and we'll be out of here in two days. All right, you get five minutes to talk. Hey, Nick, why don't you... Hold it, hold it. I'm Max Herbert in here. Oh, I'm sorry. I should have remembered. How in the world did you ever get in this place? Well, the governor fixed it so that I was caught red-handed robbing the home of a friend of his. Yeah. When they caught me, I had the family silver in one hand and the family jewels in the other. <laughs> it was easy. And now you arranged to be transferred to the gang where McCoy's working. Well, have you found anything? Yes, but it's all circumstantial. But Barney McCoy and I are breaking out of here day after tomorrow. And I'm hoping to get some proof then. Are you sure you're getting out of here? Yes. One of the keepers is working with us. Oh. I think this same keeper fixed McCoy's getaway last time. And I also think, from what I've heard, that he may have helped in Jarbo's murder. Yeah? I've learned positively that he was absent from the prison on leave that day. But isn't there danger if you're getting hurt if you try to break out of here? Of course there is. I have to take that chance. I've got to stick to McCoy. Don't worry, Scubby. I'll be all right. I hope... <laughs> All set, McCoy? All set. Everything's fixed. Good. You see that delivery truck over there, Max? Yeah. Well, that's going to break down when it tries to start. I get it. We'll have to help it get out of the yard here. Right. Listen. He's trying to start it now. The guard all set? Sure. Mike's with us all the way, same as before. Hey, you over there! That's us, come on. Gavin, give us a hand with this truck. Okay. What's the matter? Motor won't start. Have to give him a push. You two get a hold here and give him a start. Okay, Mike. Rest of you guys get back to work. All right, get your shoulder behind it, Max. Okay. Let's go. All right. Heave. All right, again. Heave. Once more. Oh, come on, get it going. We ain't got Heave. all day. Heave. Heave. So as the motor starts, jump on the truck. Right, I got you. Okay, again. There. Come on, Max. I'm in. Get down so they can't see you. Look, bridge over the railroad tracks is just ahead. When we get over the tracks, be ready to jump. Be right with you. All right, now. Come on. Right behind you, Barney. Jump on the tender of that engine below us. Now. Okay. You 
All right, McCoy? Yeah. Come on, engineer. Give her all the steam you got. Don't stop the talk. You, fireman, feed the coal to her. I don't want to use this gun unless I have to. Watch out, Max. The outside wall of the prison is just ahead. You'd better duck. There's going to be shooting. Right, McCoy. All okay so far? Oh, here it comes. Watch it. Uh, look at him pour it on. <laughs> well, we're out of jail now. And for good. It's good to see you back in your office again, Mr. Carter. Yes, it's good to be back here, Ella. Now, tell me, have you learned anything interesting since I last saw you? I think so, Mr. Carter. Now, let's have it. A few months ago, our housekeeper spent about a month visiting her son in California. Before she went, she put an ad in the paper for a temporary housekeeper. Several women answered the ad, and uh, Mrs. Martin was given the job. She had light brown hair and wore dark glasses. I disliked her on sight, and I'm sure she disliked me. When our housekeeper returned... This Mrs. Martin left, and I never saw her again until the day my uncle was buried. What do you mean, Ella? On that day, she presented herself as my uncle's widow. Your uncle's widow? Yes, Mr. Carter. When she first came to live in the house after the funeral, I thought there was something very familiar about her. But not until a few days ago did I suddenly realize that Mrs. Jarbeau was Mrs. Martin, with black hair instead of brown and without her dark glasses. Ella, could you swear to that? No, but some of her little mannerisms, certain tricks of speech, uh, a funny way of walking, all make me positive. And that explains the mystery of how the fake will was forged. While Mrs. Martin was substituting for the housekeeper, she could have found out about the will, taken it out, had a new one forged, and then returned it. The night your uncle was murdered, the forged will was substituted for the original one in the desk drawer by using a duplicate key that had been prepared in advance. And it might interest you, Nick, to know that when Ella told me this the other day, I checked at the house where we first met Mrs. Jarbeau. The woman there told me that Mrs. Jarbeau was away on a visit during the month that Mrs. Martin took the place of Ella's housekeeper. Good work. That settles it, Patsy. Just a minute, Mr. Carter. There's another thing you better know. Something else? Yes, Mr. Carter. Last evening, a strange man came to the house. He and Mrs. Jabot were apparently old friends because she called him Mac. Barney McCoy. She took him up to her room where I heard them talking for a long time. I tried to hear what they were saying but couldn't get close enough. But I did hear him say it was time to get that girl out of the way for good. Hmm. And then Mrs. Jabot said that now that Mac was back, it was time to wind up the job. Well, Ella, if everything goes as I hope it will, we'll be the ones to wind up the job, not Mrs. Jabot. Anything else you want me to do? Yes. Meet me in the rear of your home tomorrow night at 11 o'clock. <laughs> we'll make our final arrangements then. In the meantime, sit tight and keep your ears and eyes open. Mr. Carter? Mr. Carter? Is that you, Ella? Yes. Come into the living room here. We can talk better. Okay. Sure, there's no one around. Not now. That man, Mac, was here earlier, but he left quite a while ago. Mrs. Jarbeau has gone up to her room. We can talk safely here. All right. Don't turn on the light. Maybe seen. We can talk just as well in the dark. Whatever you say. Now tell me, does Mrs. Jarbeau know you've ever seen this man, Mac? Oh, no. I've kept out of the way whenever he's been around. Good. Do you know what he came here for this evening? There was talk about chloroform and poison. And then she told him the lawyer for the, for the estate was here this afternoon mm -hmm. and said that she would be in full legal possession of the estate in another few days. I see. And then he said that if that was the case, it was the time to act before it was too late. Well, now it's time for us to act, too. I think we'd better... Quiet. <gasps> Somebody's unlocking the door through which we came. Maybe they won't come in here. Who's in this room? I can't see you in the dark, but I know you're there. Who's there? Who are you? None of your business. Speak up or I'll shoot. If you do, you'll never live to see another What's day. What's going on in here? Why isn't the light on? Mrs. Jabot. Ella. What are you Barnaby doing Barnaby Coy, you... Max Herbert, by all that's holy. What are you doing here? Why, I, uh... Oh, you see, Barney, I, uh... Yeah? He's here because he loves me. Don't you know this man is an ex-convict? 
You ought to be serving a sentence in state's prison right now. Yes, I know that. Well, that's why we had to meet like this, Barney. Is this true, Ella? Yes, Mrs. Jarbo, it is. Hmm. Look here, you. You interviewed me a couple of weeks ago, said you were writing a story for your paper. You said then your name was Peters. Now you say it's Herbert. Well, my real name is Herbert Peters, ma'am. You see, I... And you. I, uh... What are you doing here? I'm a night watchman on duty in this neighborhood. I saw this man come in here and followed him. Recognized him as a suspicious character. You're both lying. Get out of here, both of you, immediately. And as for you, Ella, get upstairs at once. I'll deal with you later. Yeah, well, that's all the thanks I get for trying to protect your place against thieves. I will get out. Come on, you. Go ahead, Barney. I'm coming. Good night, Ella, dear. And see that you never come back, either of you. Hey, Max. Yeah? Was that story about you and the girl straight? Why, sure, Barney. Wasn't your story on the level? Well, to tell you the truth, I was going to see if I could find a few things I could swipe. <laughs> I'm flat broke. You haven't got a few bucks on you, have you? Sure, Barney. I can let you have a ten spot. What? Here. Gee, thanks, pal. I won't forget you for this. Forget it. Yeah, we sure were lucky to get out of there so easy. Yeah. I thought the old dame was going to have us pinched. You're under arrest, both of you, so don't try to have a right. There you go. Just let go of me. Stop. Stop or I'll shoot. No, you don't. You let go of my arm. You made me miss it. So what? Yep. Well, I got you anyway. You won't get away. You're going back to state's prison again, Mr. Max Herbert. Oh, you know my name, do you? I sure do. And I know yours, Ben Lyons. But, what? You know me? Hey, let me look at you. Gladly. Come over under the streetlight. All right. You know me now? Uh, well, Nick Carter. <laughs> well, I'll be... Well, gosh, I'm sorry, Mr. Carter, but a, a woman just called the station, said she'd passed two escaped convicts in front of her house, and if we hurried, we could pick them up. Even gave us their names, too, well, so I... Well, now, Ben. Listen to me. I'm on the trail of something big. Have the lieutenant and eight men meet me at 12 o'clock tomorrow night at the back of the Jarbeau place across the street where they won't be seen. Okay. Be sure to tell them not to fail me, because I expect to capture the murderers of Enos Jarbeau. Are all the men posted as we agreed, Scubby? Yes, Nick. Outside and inside the house. Good. They have orders to let anybody come up here, but to let nobody go downstairs again. And we're ready for the finale in this case. What's that you've got there, Nick? It's a new type of microphone, Patsy. Oh. I've attached it to the wall between this room and Mrs. Jarbo's room. Mm -hmm. Through the vibration of the wall, it'll pick up whatever is said in her room. Then whatever is picked up is amplified so that it's loud enough for us to hear it. The amplifier also has a recording device which makes a permanent record of the conversation on a wire tape. Gosh, what will they think of next? Quiet now. Let's listen. I'll turn it on. But I tell you, Barney, we can't lose. In a few more days, the whole Jarbo estate will be mine, legally. I know, Addy, but can you handle that girl for a few days more? That's well, if McCoy. I can't, we'll give her what we gave the old man. Do we have to? If she's dead, we know she ain't gonna bother us. Yeah. So we bet... Hey, what the devil's that? Quiet. How do I know? The housekeeper's answering us. Hey, somebody's coming up here. Did you tell anybody you were coming up here? Anybody here? Mike! Come on. What are you doing here? Well, that's a fine question to ask me. I'm here because you sent for me. Who sent for you? You did, McCoy. Are you crazy? I did nothing of the kind. I got your note this morning. It is. What? Come to Jarbo House tonight, but not before 12. Everything okay? Very important. And it's signed Barney. Listen, I never wrote that note. Well, if you didn't, it means trouble for us. Somebody else knows about this business besides us three. You, you mean we're caught? We ain't caught yet. But we will be if we don't watch our step. Even now, I was baby. afraid of this. I knew I should have kept down a bit. Ah, shut up, you rat. You're not in jail yet. But I'm going to be. I can feel it coming. Don't shut up, Mike. I'll bring you. You did it, McCoy. You fired the shot that killed the old man. I just... Shut up, you stupid liar. Come on, kids. That's enough of that. Let's go. Right with you, Nick. Tom, you gotta get out. I'll take it easy, Sarah. Wait a minute, will you? I can't wait any longer. Get your hands up, both of you. And no funny business. Max! What are you... No, McCoy, not Max. Nick Carter. Nick Carter? You ain't got nothing on us. Oh, I Nick's got enough on you three to send you to the chair. Yes, McCoy, we know the whole plot from beginning to end. Tell him what we found out, Nick. What do you mean? It means I know that Sarah married Jarbo, and that shortly afterwards she died. You, Addie, her sister, married McCoy. When Sarah died, 
You found her marriage certificate and decided to use your resemblance to her to get the old man's money. McCoy was in prison then, but you arranged with a guard, Mike, here to help McCoy escape by the time was ripe. Then to pay Mike for his trouble, you cut him in on the deal. Then you, Eddie, got that temporary job here as a housekeeper, which was an unexpected break. While you were here, you had the fake will made. Then when all was ready, McCoy escaped as planned. Mike came with him, and between the three of you, you chloroformed old Jarbeau, and then shot him in such a way that it looked like suicide. How do you know it wasn't suicide? The suicide note you left for the old man. Whoever Eddie got to forge that will for her did such an expert job that the witnesses recognized their own forged signatures as genuine. But whoever wrote that suicide note was so clumsy that he wrote it with a blunt-pointed fountain pen instead of the sharp-pointed steel pen that was the only pen Jarbeau ever used. That ain't proof. That's guessing. We've got plenty of proof, McCoy. And if that isn't enough, to top it all off, the conversation in this room between you three crooks has been recorded in full for the past 20 minutes. And if that isn't practically a confession and good legal evidence in any court, my name isn't Nick and Carter. <laughs> This was another strange experience of Nick Carter, Master Detective, called State's Prison Evidence, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Midnight Murder. Another of the curious adventures of Nick Carter, which are brought to you regularly at the same time each week by WOR Mutual. And now, Nick, what about our story for next week? Well, next week's story started off as a simple question of who stole the firm's funds. But it ended up by being the very perplexing question of who killed two men and caused the death of a third. And not the least puzzling part of the case was to find out who fired the fatal bullet which started off the murders. Well, isn't that usually the most puzzling part of a murder story? Well, yes, it is. But in this case, the man who was killed was standing by my side in the corridor of a large office building. And there was no one around at the time who could have fired the gun that killed him. I'm afraid I'm getting more mixed up all the time. <laughs> That's exactly how we felt about it. But Nick cleared it all up in spite of everything. And we'll tell you all about it next week. So long. So long, folks. And so long to you, Nick and Patsy. See you next week. In The Strange Adventure You've Just Heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark, Patsy by Helen Choate, and Scubby by John Kane. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was written and directed by Jock McGregor. Next week at the same time, another curious experience of Nick Carter entitled An Angle on Murder. Or Nick Carter and the mystery of the mutilated bullet. This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. The Return of Nick Carter is produced in the studios of WOR and is broadcast over most of these stations every Monday evening at 9.30 Eastern Wartime. This is Mutual. Another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure... An Angle on Murder, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Mutilated Bullet. Then I grabbed her, and I wound my fingers around her throat. <laughs> and I squeezed her windpipe tight. <laughs> tighter and tighter. <laughs> What's the matter, Patsy? Oh, Nick, put the lights on. All right. And I said I wanted to hear the recorded confession you made of that mad murderer who killed his wife. I didn't think I'd have to listen to it in the dark. Well, that's the way we got him to confess in the first place. Oh, I'll take it, Patsy. Okay, Nick. 
Nick Carter's office. Um, I'd like to talk to Mr. Nicholas Carter. This is Nick Carter speaking. Oh, hello, Nick. This is John Hamill, the banker's associates. Oh, hello, John. How have you been? Nick, I'm in trouble. I can't discuss it over the phone. How soon can you meet me? Where? On West Street, around the corner from the Greystone building, where my offices are. Please get there as fast as you can. All right, John. I'll be there in ten minutes. Thank you. Now, Scubby, you understand exactly what you're to do? Yeah, Nick. Okay, I'll see you later. I've got a date on this corner. Okay, Nick. I'll be seeing you. Hey, look at that car coming up the street, would you? Hey, Nick, watch out. That car is headed right at you. Jump, Nick. Oh. Oh. Did he hit you, Nick? Are you all right? Yeah, I'm all right. Oh, gee, that was close. It almost seemed like whoever was driving that car did that on purpose. Wouldn't be at all surprised, Scubby. I think somebody is interested in preventing me from keeping my appointment. Hey, look, baby, I better stay with you, Nick. No, I've got something else for you to do, Scubby. I got the number in that car. Hop down to the license bureau and find out who it belongs to. Then wait for me at the office. Oh, Nick. I, sorry, I'm so late. Oh, hello, John. I've been on this corner waiting for you for 20 minutes. Where have you been? Trying to get here without anyone seeing me. Well, why all the mystery? What's up? Wait a minute, Nick. Here, get back in this doorway, quick. Don't let him see us. Well, who was that? Somebody trailing you? I don't know. I never saw him before. Well, then why'd you want to dodge him? You haven't done anything wrong, have you? No, Nick. Absolutely nothing. Now listen, I don't want the police in on this just yet, if I can help it. A banking firm like mine can't stand any unnecessary notoriety. Well, yes, I know, John, but what's this all about? Well, let me explain. I wanted to tell you out here where I can be sure no one will hear us. You see, Nick, several days ago, I discovered there's a serious shortage on our books. Somebody has been taking money from the accounts, and I'm almost, almost sure I know who it is. I've called a meeting of my four partners. They're upstairs in my office waiting for me right now to have a showdown before the stockholders find out. That's why I ask you to come over here, Nick. You may have to make an arrest tonight. Well, you don't want a detective, John. You want a cop. No, no, no. You're wrong, Nick. I want you. Please come along. Oh, perhaps you better wait down the lobby while I go up and see if everything's all right. That is safe for you to come No, out. no, Nick. There's no need for that. All right. I now. want to be in on the showdown. Come on. Anything you say. And if you really feel that something dangerous is in the wind, I think I should go up there first and look around. And if everything's okay, let you know. No, no. I want to go up now and get it over with. Well, you insist. I do, Nick. Oh, I know it's pretty late, but I waited purposely till the offices were closed to avoid any publicity. This whole business requires the greatest secrecy. Twenty-fourth floor. Oh, this is our floor, Nick. After you, John. Oh, thank you. Kind of dark in this hallway, isn't it? Yes, the lighting isn't any too good here, but I... John. John. John, are you hurt bad? Nick. Nick. What's happened? Why is it John? Quiet, please, quiet. Gentlemen, John Hamill is dead. John Hamill is dead, but that's terrible, terrible. How did it happen? That's what I want to know. You seem to know him. Who are you? Well, I could ask you the same question. Who are you? I'm Nick Carter. Nick Carter, the detective? Yes. Oh, well, my name's Tom Burdick. I'm one of Hamill's partners, and uh, uh, these are the others. Uh, Mr. Carter... I'm Emil Garrick, and this is Arthur Nelson and Alan Cornish. How do you do, Mr. Carter? You're Cornish, huh? Yes, Mr. Carter. What do you know about this? Nothing, nothing. I I was in my office all the time. Oh, no, that's not true, Cornish. I saw you go out in the hall just a few seconds before Hamill was shot. That right, Cornish? Yes, I... I did go out for a moment. But when the shot was fired, I was back in my office. But why question me? Why don't you ask Burdick where he was or Nelson or Garrick? Well, I can easily explain where Mr. Nelson and I were... We were both together in my office preparing some papers for tonight's meeting. That's right, Mr. Carter. I was with Mr. Garrick. Which of you men belong to which office? Well, you can see the layout yourself, Mr. Carter. They all open off this L-shaped corridor. First comes Nelson's office, then Burdick's. There, on the long leg of the L. Then on the corner at the end is Cornish's office, directly in line with the corridor to the elevator. And Garrick's office is around the corner on the short leg of the L. That's right. Hmm. That's out of sight of the elevator completely, isn't it? Sure, you can't even see the corridor from my office. So I see. Then, Cornish, your office is the only one which faces the corridor. I'd like to have a look at it. All right. This way. 
This is my office, Mr. Carter. Hmm. Peculiar order here. Yeah? Let's see. Well, what are we here in this umbrella stand? A gun. A oh, what? Oh, and it's safe. been fired very recently. I should say, gentlemen, this was the murder weapon. That's Mr. Cornish's umbrella stand. What do you know about this, Cornish? I don't know anything about it. Well, that gun belongs to Mr. Cornish. That's right, Mr. Carter. I've seen it in his desk many times. I recognize that fancy handle. Say, what are you fellows trying to do? Well, sure, it's my gun. But I haven't seen it for three days. Someone stole it on my desk, Mr. Carter. Why didn't you report it to the police? Because I... I didn't carry a permit for it. I... I was afraid of getting in trouble. Cornish, I regret that appearances are against you. I'm afraid I'll have to turn you over to the police. You won't turn me over to the police? Well, what happened to the lights? Cornish, turn them out. Turn those lights on, somebody. Oh, there you are, Mr. Carter. There he goes, Carter. It's Cornish. He's escaping down the hall. Stop, Cornish. Stop, or I'll shoot. <laughs> You see, Patsy, I was right with Hamill when he was murdered. What I can't figure out was how he was shot when there was no one else in the hall with us. Don't ask me, Nick. And here's something else. I heard only one shot fired. But Cornish's gun had three empty shells. And to top it all off, here's the bullet that killed Hamill. The coroner gave it to me. Notice how it's all banged up? Yes, how did that happen? I wish I knew. Patsy, if I knew the answer to that, I think I'd know the answer to this whole case. Until we find Cornish... Oh, I'll get it. Hello, Carter? Yes, this is Nick Carter. Oh, this is Alan Cornish. I... I suppose I'm a fool for calling Wub Carter, but I need help. I'm desperate and I can't go to the police. You've got to help me prove I didn't kill Hamill. Why'd you run away, Cornish? Because I was scared. Lucky for me you didn't hit me. Don't worry, Cornish. If I'd really wanted to hit you, I would have. Where are you now? I'll tell you, but you've got to promise to come alone. If you don't... The only thing I'll promise you is that I won't do anything till after I've talked to you. Now, what's the address? 1813 Oak Street. Come right over. I'll be waiting for you. Okay, sit tight. I'll be there. You mean we'll be there. I'm sick of sitting around here. I'm going with you. Eighteen thirteen Oak Street. This is it, Betsy. Gosh, what a creepy looking place. Ah, certainly not very attractive. Well, come on, let's go in. Maybe he's not here. He said he'd be here. Wonder if the... Well, the door's open. Should we go in? We can't keep our date with Cornish if we don't. Gosh, it's dark in here. Nick, do you suppose it could be a trap? You never can be quite sure, Patsy. Here's the door. Stand behind me. Can you see anything in there, Nick? Wait till I get my flashlight. No. Nope. Looks deserted. Oh, come on. Let's try another room. Gee, this place gives me the jitters. It's practically deserted. Maybe he's in here. Stand back, Betsy. No, nothing in there. Maybe he got scared after he called you and slipped away. We'll soon find out. There's another door over there. Yes. He's hanged himself. Well, Nick, I don't know why he came back to the office again tonight. Cornish is dead. I guess that closes the case. That's see, I'm not satisfied. When I talked to him on the phone, he certainly didn't sound like a man who was going to kill himself. When a man wants to prove himself innocent, he doesn't commit suicide. No, Patsy, there's something about that hanging that's bothering me, and I can't lay my finger on it. You probably figured that was the best way out, to kick over the chair and end it all. Patsy, remind me to give you a raise. And what did I do? I've got it. Look, Patsy, Cornish was a short man. Well, so what? Patsy, Cornish couldn't have hanged himself. Well, why not? Don't you remember, Patsy? The only furniture in that room was a bed. And Cornish was so short, he never could reach that noose from the bed where it was. Of course, Nick. The bed was on the other side of the room. Patsy, Cornish was murdered. She eliminates him as a suspect. Probably he was killed by the same man who killed Hamill. Oh, but who, Nick? Who? I wish I knew. I wish I knew. Hi, Nick. 
Hiya, Patsy. Well, if it isn't the missing link. Scubby, did you find out anything about that car that nearly ran me down this afternoon? Oh, you bet, Nick. Good. But what a time I've been having. Wait till you hear what I have to tell you. Well? I had to get the license commissioner out of bed to get it, but, oh, boy, it was worth it. Hey, do you know who that car belongs to? Tom Burdick, Hamill's partner. Good boy, Scubby. Did you get his address, too? Yeah, some deserted neck of the woods out in Long Island. I've got the address here somewhere. Fine. Come on, Scubby. You and I are going to pay him a visit. You know, Scubby, the more I think of it, the more it looks as if Tom Burdick might be mixed up in this some way. Well, I hope so, Nick. Otherwise, we're using up a lot of gas in this jalopy of mine for nothing. Hey, have you noticed anything funny, Nick? You mean that car that's been trailing us for the last few minutes? That's it. What do you make of it, Nick? I don't know, Scubby. And I think we'll be finding out quickly enough. They're overtaking us. Better step on it. Okay, Nick. Here we go. How are we doing? Not so good, Scubby. They're still gaining on us. Can you give her any more gas? I'll try. There. They still coming up? Yes, Scubby. And fast. Duck, hey. Scubby. They're shooting at us. You're telling me. Watch it. Here they come. Well, I've done all I can, Nick. This old bus won't go any faster. Well, let's try an old trick, Scubby. When they get close to us, slam on your brakes and pull over to the side of the road. Yeah? They won't be expecting that. It may throw them completely off balance and spoil their aim. Okay, Nick. You say when. Now, pull over. Okay. Oh, boy. That was a close one. Are you all right, Nick? Yeah. Well, we won't see them anymore for a while. Get going, Scubby. We've got to make up for lost time. Well, Nick, I've got to hand it to you. You have the darndest way of getting into a cellar. Well, we had to get into Rudick's house somehow. This cellar with its trick entrance from the garage looked like the safest way. Especially with those two vicious-looking dogs posted at both the front and back doors to the house. Well, they sure were big ones, too. I'd hate to meet one of them. Hey, where do you think this is going to lead us to, Nick? We should find a stairway going upstairs, unless I'm very much mistaken. Yeah? Yeah. Here's one. All right, let's go up. But careful. All right, Nick, you lead the way. I'm with you. Here's the door. I hope it's open. No, darn it, it's locked. I'll soon fix that. There. All right, Scubby, come out. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Someone's coming into the room, Scubby. Get back. We can hear through the crack of the door. I'll leave it open in a little. Well, Mrs. Burdick, I'm certainly glad you called me up. I'm only too happy to be here at a time like this. After all, we're practically neighbors, aren't we? Oh, I just had to talk to someone, Mr. Garrick. I'm so worried about Tom and those horrible things that have been happening at the office. What do you make of all this? Well, I wouldn't worry about it too much, Mrs. Burdick. Tom can take care of himself, if he has to. What do you mean, Mr. Garrick? Oh, nothing, nothing. But he has been acting rather strangely lately. Well, that's just it. I'm so worried. I haven't seen or heard from him all day. He's never been so late coming home from the office. Why, it's after 11. Oh, there's really nothing to worry about, Mrs. Burdick, even in a case like this. Of course, it looks very peculiar for Tom to be missing his way, especially at this particular time. Mr. Garrick, but I'm... you don't think Tom had anything to do with all this sort of... Well, Mrs. Burdick, I like Tom very much. I would hate to think that Tom had anything to do with this murder. Of course, things are... Well, Scubby, we don't seem to be learning much this way. Might as well go in and let him know we're here. Sure, Nick. Good evening, Mr. Garrick. <sighs> Why, Mr. Carter, what are you doing here? I just came along with one of my assistants, Scubby Wilson, to talk to Mr. Burdick. We came in this way because we didn't want to disturb the dogs. Oh, really? I... Who are you? Oh, Mrs. Burdick, uh, this is Mr. Nick Carter. He's in charge of investigating Hamill's death. Mr. Carter, the detective? Nothing's happened to Tom, has it? I don't believe so, Mrs. Burdick. I just want to ask him a few questions when he arrives. Well, maybe that's why Tom hasn't come home. Maybe he's afraid of... Uh, maybe that's he now. Wait, wait, I'll go look out the window to see if that's his car. Carter, I must warn you to be careful. Burdick's a dangerous man. Tom! Tom! Nick Carter's here. Please, Mrs. Burdick, Nick come away Carter's from that window. Here to see you. you won't do him any good that way, Mrs. Tom. Burdick. 
Tom, Stop it, you hear me? Please. Hey, that's his car, Mr. Carter. Look, he's getting away. Come on, Scobie, let's get after him. Okay, Please. I'll go with you, Carter. Hurry up. I want to know why he runs away when he hears my name. I hope this car of yours stays on the road, Carter. Don't worry about it, Mr. Garrick. Carter, I, I didn't want to say too much in front of Mrs. Burdick, but we've all been afraid of Burdick. All right, all right. Scubby, just keep your foot on that throttle and keep after him. Oh, boy, we sure made that one on two wheels. Nick, I'm pushing this crate as fast as she'll go, but we don't seem to be getting any closer. That car of Burdick's can sure step. As long as we hang on and don't lose him, I'll be satisfied. Hey, watch it. We're coming to a railroad crossing. So I see. Well, maybe we can head him off now. If Burdick tries to beat that limit to the crossing, he's crazy. Look, Carter, I think he's going to try to make it. He can't do it. He'll be killed. That's... that just came out of the operating room is signaling you. Oh, yes. She wants me to go into Burdick. You wait for me here, Scubby. Okay, Nick. Burdick? Burdick, can you hear me? Yes, Carter. I can hear you. Carter, I'm a dying man. Yes, I... I know. I swear to you, I... Didn't kill Hamill or Cornish. Then why did you try to run me down with your car this afternoon? Carter, I didn't do that. All I know is that for several hours this afternoon, my car was mysteriously missing. I didn't find it again until I started home this evening. Bertie. Why did you run away from your home tonight when your wife told you we were there? And how about the securities we found on you after the wreck? It wasn't you. It was securities. I took them so that... Yes, Burdick? Why did you take them? I took them so I could keep him from stealing them. Who? Burdick, who? Burdick, who's he? Carter, front office, bottom drawer of desk. Something will lead you to murder. Yes, Burdick? Who's the murderer? He, he is... Oh. Burdick. Burdick. Oh, poor chap. If you'd spoken sooner... You might have lived longer. Nick. Oh, Nick, I got here as quick as I could. Have you found anything yet? I think so. Scubby Burdick wasn't lying to me. I found this in the bottom drawer of the desk in the front office here. A book? Well, is that what Burdick meant? Just look at that title. Studies of various angles of bullets in flight. Well, so what, Nick? Scubby, that's the way Hamill was killed. It all adds up perfectly. Now I know why I heard only one shot when I found three empty shells in the murder weapon. Three shots were fired, but two of them were fired at a different time from the third. Well, do you know where the other two bullets are, Nick? I do. Follow me out in the hall and I'll show you. Yeah? You see, Scubby, as soon as I found that book in the flight of bullets, I did a bit of looking around, and I finally found them. Well, where are they, in the office here? No, Scubby, in the corridor. Right over there in that dark corner, embedded in the wall beside the elevator shaft, about a half a dozen feet from where Hamill was killed. Well, what are they doing over there? Scubby, this was a very ingenious crime. And if you watch carefully, I'll show you just how ingenious it really was. Now, you notice that Cornish's office is the only one facing the corridor leading from the elevator. Yeah. So what? Well, in order to shoot someone coming down the hall, the murderer, if he were in any office but Cornish's, would have to step from his office out into this corridor and be seen. Right? Yeah, all right. But our murderer was very clever. I got the answer when I located the book and when I found these embedded in the wall beside the elevator shaft. The two missing bullets. Right. Well, hey, they're all banged up. Precisely, just like the murder bullet. 
And that's what gave me the answer. You see, Scubby, yeah. the murderer never left his office. He stood inside the front office, the one around the corner, on the lower leg of the L-shaped corridor, and aimed at that steel pillar built into the wall over there. When the bullet hit the steel face of the pillar, it was deflected into Hamill's lungs. Look here. You see these marks in the face of the pillar here? Where? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, those are the bullet marks. Oh, well, gosh, Nick, that's fantastic. Hey, are you sure you're right? Positive. Don't you see, Scubby? That explains the other two shots that were fired. They weren't fired at Hamill, and they weren't fired at the time the murder was committed. They were practice shots used by the murderer to be sure he had the correct angle from which to shoot Hamill. Gosh, Nick, I've certainly got to hand it to you. Yes, but we still have to get the murderer. But how? And who is it, Nick? I rather think that if we step back in the office and wait, we'll find out soon enough, Scubby. Well, what do you mean, Nick? I mean that whoever it is will be in this office within the next few minutes, because after my discoveries, I made a couple of phone calls, and I invited the two remaining partners to meet me here. Shh. Here comes someone now. Oh. Oh, how do you do, gentlemen? Oh, hello, Garrick. I got your phone call, Carter, and I got here as fast as I could. Garrick, have you seen this book before? Mm, Studies of various angles of bullets in flight. Why, yes, now that I think of it, I think I have. Does it belong to you? No, it doesn't. But I remember that one day when I was with Mr. Nelson, he stopped in front of a bookshop and looked at it. Rather closely now that I think of it. Yes, I'm sure it was Nelson. Very interesting. Now tell me, Mr. Garrick, when the murder was committed, are you positive that you and Mr. Nelson were in this office together? That's right, Mr. Carter. And you show me exactly where each of you stood at the time the shot was fired. Well, now let me see. I was uh, here... Facing the window, and Nelson was, well, standing uh, right about here by the door. Mm hmm. I see. Did you notice in which direction he was facing at the time? Yes, I remember. This way, facing the corridor. In other words, the way he was standing, you could see him only in profile. That's right. Well, there's no question, but that's how it was done, Scubby. The murderer planted himself in this office so that he could establish a strong alibi. He then took the gun from his pocket, unseen by the other person in the room, who could see him only in profile, and then fired it at that steel pillar. Then as he ran into the corridor with a rest, after Hamill was dead, he dropped the gun into the umbrella stand in front of Cornish's office. Well, Carter, do you mean that Nelson is the one How who... How do you do, gentlemen? Uh, did I hear my name mentioned? Yes, Nelson, you did. Why did you kill Hamill and Cornish? Please, Garrick, don't be ridiculous. Oh, Nelson, does this book look familiar to you? Uh, this book? Uh, no, I can't say that it does. You sure you've never seen this book before? Hmm. Now that you mention it, I... May have glanced at it in a bookshop at one time or another, but then I look over a lot of books. I like to browse. I see. Nelson, see how you approve of this story of Hamill's murder. Yes? The killer knew of Cornish's criminal record, and he figured he could embezzle some of the firm's money and pin it on an innocent man. Then when he found out that Hamill was becoming suspicious and was having the accounts checked, he became panicky and afraid that it might not work out the way he had planned. So he decided to kill Hamill. Then when he happened to overhear Hamill's conversation with me over the telephone, he hurriedly borrowed Burdick's car without Burdick's knowledge and tried to get rid of me. That's an interesting way out, Mr. Carter. Have you also a theory as to who the killer is? I have. By the process of elimination, it has to be either you or Mr. Garrick or an unknown. And I've already proved that I didn't do it. It must have been an unknown then, Mr. Carter. I certainly didn't kill Hamill. I had nothing to do with the murder. When the shot was fired, I was right here in this room with Mr. Garrick. He can testify to that. He has already, Mr. Nelson. In fact, Mr. Carter, I was standing right here, facing the window when the shot was fired. Oh, no. That's where I was, Mr. Carter. Standing here at the window. Now, now please, Garrick. Please, now, gentlemen, please. please. You don't have to argue about it. I know who was at the window, and I know who fired the fatal shot. Scubby, take a look at the flyleaf of this book. Well, what are they, Nick? They look like the scribbles that some guys draw when they have nothing else to do. Oh, doodles, they call them. Exactly. While I was looking through the various offices, I found some papers with these same doodling marks on them in one of the desks. And these marks were made by the murderer. Garrick, I arrest you. Oh, Sergeant, murder... he's got a gun! Oh. Well, Scubby, pick up the pieces. Oh, boy. There's the murderer, Garrick. He's also the man who tried to murder you and me last night in the road of Burdick's home. Well, I'll be. You see, Scubby, Burdick has his suspicions about Garrick. That's why we found those securities on him. He took them so that they wouldn't fall into Garrick's hands. He'd suddenly found out that Garrick was an unscrupulous crook. And that was the reason he ran when Mrs. Burdick called him. He saw Garrick at the window and was afraid of him. 
Well, Nick, I must say he had me fooled when he said that Nelson was standing at the door of the office here when he was really there himself. Yes, and telling us who was in this office, our clever murderer just reversed the positions in which he and Mr. Nelson were standing when the murder was committed. But once I saw the marks on that flyleaf, I knew who stood where. And that's why I had Nelson come up here, to force Garrick's hand. Well, Nick, one way's as good as another as long as you get results. And you always seem to do that. finally decided to come back, did you? Yes, Patsy, it's all over. Well, I think you can go home now. Why, Mr. Carter, are you sure you can spare me? Why not? You've been so busy on this case all night, Mr. Carter, you may not have noticed that it is now a new day. And a good secretary is always on the job the first thing in the morning. Shall I take a letter, Mr. Carter? This was another strange experience of Nick Carter, master detective, called An Angle on Murder, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Mutilated Bullet. Another of the curious adventures of Nick Carter, which are brought to you by WOR Mutual. And now, Nick, what's next week's story all about? Well, when this case was first brought to me, it seemed so routine and uninteresting that I practically turned it down. But it was far from routine once you got into it, wasn't it, Nick? Yes, indeed. So far from it that... I almost got myself bumped off investigating it. It's really the story of a man who thought he was so much cleverer than Nick that he could outwit him every time. I don't suppose he got away with it. No. He found he wasn't really so clever after all. Like practically every criminal I ever met, he gave himself away by being too clever. Well, sounds like an interesting tale, Nick. Not only interesting, but downright exciting. But more of that next week. So long, folks. So long. And so long to you, Nick and Patsy. In the strange adventure you've just heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark, Patsy by Helen Choate, and Scubby by John Kane. The story was written for Nick Carter by George Gordon. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was under the direction of Jock McGregor. Next week, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter entitled... The Body on the Slab, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Missing Husband. This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Beginning Wednesday, November 3rd, The Return of Nick Carter, which is produced in the studios of WOR, will be broadcast over most of these stations on Wednesday evenings at 8.30 Eastern Wartime. Remember the new time... Wednesdays at 8.30 Eastern Wartime, beginning Wednesday, November 3rd. This is Mutual. famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure, The Body on the Slab, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Missing Husband. But Mr. Wallace, people disappear every day in a big city like this. Such things are really no concern of mine. They're a matter for the police. But, Mr. Carter, it isn't just anybody who's disappeared. It's my husband. I'll pay you anything to find him. Well, I suppose it can do no harm to listen to the story. All right, Mr. Burnett. Where was the last place you saw him? In a sort of saloon gambling house on West Street, down by the waterfront. A two-story house. A very run-down. Wait a minute, Burnett. That wouldn't be the place that's run by a one-legged soldier they call Bill. Oh, so you know it, do you? Certainly do. By reputation, at least. Yeah. 
I want you to look at this picture. You recognize it? Yes, that's the place I'm talking about. I thought so. Mrs. Wallace, I'll take the case. Oh, Mr. Carter, I knew you would. Yes, I have a score to settle with that old rat with a wooden leg. And this may be my chance to do it. All right, Mr. Bennett. Let me have all the details. Well, Vernon, that's Vernon Wallace, my friend. Vernon and I had been making a night of it. And we ended up at this Bill's place. How did you happen to go there? Well, Vernon had heard that it was a great place for a fast poker game. And he was determined to try it. I'd heard it was a pretty tough place. And I attempted to talk him out of it. But I couldn't do it. So about... 1.30 or 2 o'clock this morning, we went down there. We were the only ones there. To make a long story short, Vernon and that old guy who owns the place got into a game, and no matter what the old guy did, Vernon won. I was afraid for him in a dive like that, and I tried to get him to quit and go home with me. But he refused. He told me to get out and leave him alone. And Vernon hasn't been home since then. And he hasn't been seen anywhere since then. I'm afraid that he... that he never left that place alive. Well... I see. The place to start looking for clues is certainly the old soldier's tavern. I'm going down there tonight. I know enough tricks with cards so that I can be sure of winning. And maybe old Pegleg will try to treat me as he treated Vernon Wallace. Well, stranger, I gotta admit I'm lit. You broke the bank. Yes, luck's been with me ever since I sat down here. Well, it's getting late. I've got to be getting home. Uh, how about a drink before you go, stranger? You'll not refuse me that. Why, no. I'll have a drink with you. But only one. Sure, sure. One will be okay. Hey, Mike, two beers make it snappy. Yeah, coming up. You won all my money tonight, stranger, but I don't harbor no ill feelings. Nice of you. You won fair and square, and that's all there is to it. Here's your beers. Here you are. Drink party. Excuse me, stranger. I'll be back before you can shake a stick. Well, that's all right. I'll enjoy my drink while you're gone. Uh, stranger, Mike and I have taken a fancy to you. We don't want no harm to come to you. Look, why don't you stay here all night? Mike's got an extra bed upstairs. He'll be glad to let you have. Then tomorrow you can go home and nobody will bother you. Well, if you let me pay for the use of the room and bed, I believe I will. Stay. Good. You're a smart man. But we couldn't take no money for doing you a favor. Uh, Here, Mike, show the gentleman his room. Yeah, sure. Will you follow me, mister? Uh, uh, sure. Go ahead. Uh, I want to get to bed. I'm, I'm tired all of a sudden. Uh, give me yeah. your arm, mister. No, 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 no. I'm all right. I, I don't need any help. Well, I'll come along just to be sociable. I don't want to be sociable. I just want to go to sleep. Well, here's your room, mister. I'll leave a candle on the table for you. Okay, okay. Thanks very much. Good night, sir. There you are, stranger. Sleep tight. Yeah. We'll see you later. Yeah, we'll see you later. Yeah, I'll see you later. Good night, good night. I gotta go to sleep. I'm awful tired. I'm awful tired. <sighs> well, got myself into this easy enough. Hope I'll find it as easy to get out again when the time comes. Uh, no light, but a candle. What it'll do to give me a look around instead of this bed. Uh, it doesn't look too comfortable. But, oh, blood. Let's see. The man were lying on this bed. That blood is just about where a dagger would go through his heart. The man were drunk enough or had been drugged, he'd never know what hit him. Well, let's look around here. I wonder what's in this closet. Uh-huh. Locked. Well, that won't keep me out long. Not as long as I still have my keys with me. Try this one. Nope. Ah, this one does it. Well, this is interesting. Old clothes. Here's a vest with blood on it. And here's a shirt and a jacket, both of them bloody. Unquestionably, these came from some of the victims. Well, nothing to do now but wait for that one-legged scoundrel and his pal to make the next move. <sighs> well, I guess I'll be safe if I merely sit on the edge of the bed now. Oh, yes, I won't need this candle anymore, either. 
now to wait for them. Ah, oh, there they come. Ah, uh, He's asleep, all right. I can hear him snoring. Well, with the slug I put in his beard, he'd have to be either sleeping or dead. All right. Easy does it. Asleep. Yeah. You hold this light while I... Get your hands up, both of you. Well, well I'll be... And drop that knife you got in your hand, Bill. How... How can you be awake when we... Really very simple, Bill. Keep those hands up. I just poured that drink you gave me on the floor instead of down my throat. What are you going to do with us? I'm going to turn you over to the police. With the evidence of the bloody clothes in the closet and what other evidence they'll undoubtedly find when they search this place, you both should have an interesting time of it. Why don't you kill us now and be done with it? Because I want some information first. Why should we tell you anything? Because if you do, I shall probably be able to get your sentence reduced somewhat. If you don't... I got you. What do you want to know? Last night, a young man won all your money. He hasn't been seen since. You mean that fellow with the little mustache? I do. You murder him the way you try to murder me? I didn't do nothing with him. Maybe I want to do it, I didn't. Isn't it a fact that this chap's friend tried to get him to leave you and go home? Yeah. And when he wouldn't go, the friend finally went off without him? Oh, that's a lie. They left here together. What? You trying to tell me one of them didn't leave before the other? No, they went out together. You know where they went? How should I know? There was a taxi waiting right outside the door here. Seemed to be waiting for them to come out. Then the guy with the money gets inside and his friend sits in front with the driver. Oh, friend sat in front with the driver, huh? But you know that cab, if you saw it again. Sure, it had a big dent in the back of the body. Painted with red lead. I've seen him around this part of the city before. I see. Well, Bill, as soon as I can turn you and your pal over to the law, I'll have Penny find that taxi with a dent in the back. The trail seems to lead direct to him. Nick Carter's office. Oh, hello, Patsy. Is Penny there yet? Penny? Who's Penny? Oh, I forgot, Patsy. You were away yesterday when all this happened. Scubby got a rush assignment to cover the Balkan campaign for his paper, and they had to leave on a boat to let sail last night. Scubby gone without saying goodbye to me? Well, he couldn't, Patsy. You weren't here. He asked me to do it for him. Oh, Nick, I'm going to miss Scubby. Well, of course, Patsy. We'll both miss him. But while he's away, I'm having Penny Eagles work on my cases with me in Scubby's place. Who's this Penny Eagles? I never heard of him. Oh, he's an old friend of mine. Very clever fellow. When he was younger, he was an expert forger. How did you happen to get mixed up with him? Well, he was accused of a murder he had nothing to do with, and he had me come clear. Then he got interested in law enforcement, turned over a new leaf, and has gone straight ever since. You like him, Patsy? I hope so. Well, he should be any minute now. As soon as he shows up, have him call me at Shermore 31222. Shermore 31222. Right. I'll wait here for his call. <laughs> Right, Penny. That's the taxi we're looking for. And I know that driver. You do? Yes. John Hagen, ex-convict and confidence man. Friend of yours? Hardly. Seen him in court several times, but he's never seen me. What's he been doing since you've been watching him? Well, all afternoon and the early part of this evening, he's acted like any other cabbie. Taking whatever fares he could get. But the latter part of the evening, he's been fussy about who rides in his cab. How do you mean? Well, I've seen several parties try to take his cab. But all he's picked up in the last two hours were two drunks, and oh, were they pie-eyed. I see. I think I know what he's looking for, Penny. And I'm going to give him just the kind of a passenger I think he wants. Wish me luck. But, Nick, what are you going to do? Well, so long, old fellow. I got to be getting home now. I'll see you tomorrow, maybe, huh? Okay. So long, but don't take any wooden nickels. <laughs> okay, pal, that's fine. Don't take a wooden nickel. <laughs> I had too much. Hey, taxi, time mister? Huh? Taxi? Taxi, hey, mister? Hey, what do I want a taxi for? I got a well, car a my own. A friend of yours I... told me to come for you and take you home. Oh, a friend of mine. Yeah. Huh? Oh, when I saw it, it's okay. Where's the, where's the door? I can't find Hey, what's that. the address, mister? Uh, the address? It's, um, the, the, it's the corner of 2nd and 5th. And don't bother me anymore, bud. I got to get me some sleep. Okay. Yes, Drive on, Mick. The... Now, I'll wager it won't be toward second and fifth. Wait a minute. What's that smell? Perfume? I know. That's ether. 
So that's the stunt. Picks up drunks who are too far gone to know what's happening, then doses them with just enough ether to put them soundly asleep. Well, it won't happen to me. If I open one of these windows a little bit, that'll keep the air clear. There. Now, Mr. Hagen, the next move is up to you. Certainly plenty deserted, way out here. Wonder how much further we're going. I better get this window shut again so he won't suspect anything. Ah, so we're near the end of our journey, huh? Very well, Mr. Hagen. I'm ready for you. <laughs> Sleeping like a babe, ain't you? Well, let's see what you got in your pockets, then I'll dump Make you Make a move, Hagen, and hey, I'll blow your brains out. What the... Who the deuce are you? I'm a detective. See this? Oh. Well, what you want with me? I wanted to find out what your scheme was, and I found out. Now I want you to tell me about the man you picked up at Peg Lake Bill's Tavern down on West Street last night about 3 o'clock. Uh, I don't know nothing about it. Oh, no? Look, you waited for him outside of Bill's place. He rode in back. His companion rode up front with you. During the ride, you gave him ether through that devilish device you've rigged up in this taxi of yours and made him unconscious. Yeah, if you, if you know all that, why do you ask me? Huh? Because there are two things I don't know. And if you want to avoid further trouble, my friend, you'll tell me. Now, first, who was the man who rode up front with you? I don't know. No? No. Ah, well, I, I've done a few odd jobs for him in the past, but... Yeah, well, I don't know his name. They call him the captain. He made a deal with me early last night to be outside of Bill's place uh, about 2.30 this morning. Can you describe him? He's sort of an ordinary guy. About my size, maybe. Well, he's kind of good looking. If he, if he didn't have a hunk out of one ear. Burnett. Now, what did you do with the man who was in the back? Well, after I quieted him, we took him to a friend of the captain's, other side of town. What was the address to which you took the body? Hey, there wasn't no body. He was just as alive as you or me. You now he took him to 14 Wanton Place. Left him. All right. Get back in your cab and drive me to second and fifth. Then I'm through with you, unless you've lied to me. If you have, keep out of my way, or you'll go to jail for life. This is where Mrs. Wallace lives, Patsy. Well, I hope she's home. But, Nick, what do you expect to find out here? I don't know, Patsy. The thing that puzzled me about this case is why Burnett wanted to do away with Wallace. The bell, will you? Mm -hmm. It wasn't the money that Wallace won that tempted Burnett. As he could have taken that while Wallace was unconscious. Now there's a stronger reason. You hope Mrs. Wallace can throw some light on it? I hope so, Patsy. If she can only help in that way. Oh, hello, Mr. Carter. Won't you come in? Thank you, Mrs. Wallace. May I present my assistant, Patsy Bowen? How do you do, Miss Hello, Bowen. Mrs. Wallace. Uh, please sit down. Thank you. Thank you. Tell me, Mr. Carter, have you found out anything about my husband? Well, nothing definite, I'm sorry to say. We have learned, though, that he fell into bad hands. But we don't know what happened to him after that. Oh, Arthur assured me you'd find out the truth if anyone could. Arthur? Oh, you mean Mr. Burnett. Yes. Yes, he's been so kind to me. He's done so much to cheer me up. Oh, except for his kindness, I'd have gone crazy. You've known him long, Mrs. Wallace? All my life. We were brought up together. And then, too, he and my husband have been business partners for, oh, the best of friends for years. You think a great deal of him, then? Yes, indeed. Mr. Carter, at one time before I met Vernon, I would have married him if he'd asked me. Then I met Vernon and really fell in love with him. But even after I married Vernon, Arthur continued to be my best friend. I think very highly of him. And you're lucky to have such a friend, Mrs. Wallace. But he could never take my husband's place. You must find Vernon, Mr. Carter. If it's possible to find him, Nick will do it. Yes, Mrs. Wallace. You may rely on me for that. Well, shall we be running along now, Patsy? Where did you say you're calling from, Penny? I'm at a pay station near the house where Hagen left Wallace that night. It's owned by a queer old character they call the Weasel. He works in a crematory about a mile down the road. I see. Well, Hagen's story seems to be straight enough. A couple of guys in a saloon near here says they saw the weasel and another guy carrying a man-sized bundle into the weasel's place about daybreak a couple of mornings ago. And it hasn't come out again, as far as I can find out. Well, did you learn anything about the firm of Wallace and Burnett? 
You know, yeah, I picked up a lot of rumors, Nick, but not many facts. Here's how it goes. Burnett ruins the firm and throws the blame on Wallace. And those who know don't think that Burnett lost much money when the firm failed, but Wallace did. So I was right. What else? Well, Burnett was the one who started Wallace gambling and drinking. Wallace is a nice guy, but he seems to be the weak sister. But nobody seems to know what Burnett's got against him. Well, by putting together what Mrs. Wallace told us and what you've learned, Penny, I think I begin to see the answer. I think that... Hold it, Nick. A guy who looks like Burnett is going into the weasel's place. Good. Don't let him get away from you, Penny. I'll meet you there as soon as I can. They did bring that casket here to the crematory. I thought they would. But I wish I could get closer and see what they did with it after they carried it inside. Look, Nick. That window over there is open a little. Huh? Maybe we could hear something from there. Good idea, Penny. Come on. But quiet. Yeah. But, Weasel, are you sure they won't be suspicious? Not a chance, Captain. That's why we're doing this tonight. The owners of the crematory are going to make a test of a new heating fixture tomorrow morning. And they told me to have the ovens hot by 10 o'clock. I'm just getting them hot a little ahead of time. Uh, what do you use when you make a test like that? Well, they sent me the body of a dead calf. It's over there in the closet. Yeah, but the test we're going to make tonight will be even better, eh, Captain? Yes. How does this thing work? Oh, simple. The body's laid here on its slab and strapped down the way you saw me fix this fellow. In the next room, there's a lever attached to the slab. When the lever's pulled, the slab slides into the oven. The door closes behind it, and the destruction of the body begins. Do we have to, to watch it burn? You can't see the slab nor the ovens from the room where the lever is. How long does it take to reduce the body to ashes? Six or eight hours. It'll be all over by daylight. Even if the body isn't... You mean, uh, even if... The body ain't dead yet? Yes, that's what I mean. Then Wallace is still alive. Well, it's a little unusual to cremate a live body, but it works just the same. You'll never know what happened. It'll be all over in an instant. Well, we got nothing more to do here. Might as well go in the next room and wait for the ovens to get hot enough. Uh, then you can pull the lever and slide the body. You mean I have to pull the lever that sends him into... Sure! He's your friend, Eddie. Come on, Penny. There's no time to waste. We have to work fast. Mr. Burnett, to see you, Nick. Oh, yes. Come in, Mr. Burnett. I just want to take enough of your time to tell you that Vernon Wallace's body was found last night. Really? Where was it? Floating in the river. Mrs. Wallace has identified it by a ring and certain other articles found on the body. Oh, must have been a terrible blow to her. She's badly broken up, naturally. But I hope to be able to console her, in part at least, for her great loss. I'm sure you will. Uh, will this repay you for your trouble? Oh, amply, Mr. Burnett. And thank you. Good. Good day, Mr. Carter. Good day, Mr. Burnett. But if you think I'm going to drop this case now, Mr. Burnett, you're crazy. <laughs> Nick, here I am, over here. I got here as soon as I could after I got your call, Penny. About my new helper, too, as you see. Yeah, so I see. Hi there, helper. Hello, Penny. I hope I'm going to be able to help you and Nick. You'll do all right on this case. Now, what's the dope, Penny? Well, a couple of hours ago, a taxi pulls up in front of Mrs. Wallace's house. Mm -hmm. The driver goes into the house. About 15 minutes later, he comes out again with Mrs. Wallace and her maid. They get in the cab, drive away. With you after him, of course. That's right. Well, they drive around and finally end up way out here. There must have been a couple of guys in the cab when the women got in. Because when they got out there, they were both gagged and their hands were tied behind them. Well, they took him in the old house. I found a phone to call you. Did they hurt them? Well, not so far as I could tell. Gee, I wish I could see what they're doing now. I hope they're all right. Oh, Millie, this is terrible. Oh, my mouth is still sore from that dirty old cloth they used for a gag. Where do you suppose we are? Oh, I don't know, Mrs. Wallace. I, 
I've never been this far from town before. Could you see anything out of the window? Oh, nothing I recognized. Oh, I should have known better than to be fooled by such a simple trick. I might have known that old Mrs. Parker couldn't be so sick she had to see us at once. Why, well, I saw only the day before yesterday. Don't fool me, all right. I thought... I hope uh, you're comfortable, ladies. We are not. We certainly are not. What's the idea of bringing us here? Well, I'll tell you. The chap says as how he's going to collect some big dough from you two. You mean we're being held for ransom? Yep. Well, how much money do you want? Well, the chap says he won't take less than fifty. $50,000. Oh, Mrs. Wallace, we'll never get out of here. Nonsense. <laughs> he must be insane to expect me to pay him that amount of money. Well, he says he won't take a cent less. But he won't get it. Never. And he's a dangerous man. You better not get him mad at you. I'll be back at 8 o'clock tonight for your answer. Oh, he'll kill us. I know he will. Be quiet, <laughs> Millie. He won't kill us as long as he thinks there's any chance of getting the money out of us. But what if we get... A man at the window. It's Mr. Burnett. Oh, Arthur. Arthur, I hoped you'd come. Uh, are you... Are you safe, Louise? Have they hurt you? No, Arthur. We're both safe. But how did you ever find us? I just climbed up the porch to the roof, then over to your window. Oh. Have they told you why they brought you here? Yes, they want ransom. Fifty thousand dollars. And they'll kill us if you don't save us. Not while I'm here. I'll see that no harm comes to you. But what can you do? You're only one against the two of them. and They're both vicious criminals, I know. Do be careful, Arthur. Louise, if I save you from these rats, do you think that you... Ask me later, Arthur. Not now, please. Very well, if you say so. Now tell me, what time are the men coming back again? Do you know? The man we talked to said they'd be here at eight o'clock. That gives us just over an hour. Now, here's my plan. When they come, I'll be here. Now, you each know what you're supposed to do, don't you? Sure, Nicky, sure. You know, this ought to be fun. I haven't played cops and robbers since I was a kid. Same here. This should be good. Well, I hope you two aren't disappointed. But you can't tell about these things. So watch your step, both of you. Here they are. Leave everything to me. Well, you made up your mind to pay the ransom the cab wants? We'll pay you nothing. Not a cent. You know what that means, don't you? It means that you better get your hands up, all three of you, if you want to live. Who are you? I'm here to save these two ladies from you and your gang. Oh, yeah? Let them have it, fellas. Oh, I warned you. Kill them all. It's their own fault. I warned them. Oh, you were wonderful, Arthur. Oh, Arthur, are you hurt? No, Louise, dear. Fortune was with me. I'm not even scratched. Oh, Mr. Burnett, I, well, I never in my whole life saw anyone so brave as you. Any man would be brave when defending the woman he loves. Please, Arthur, you promised. I'm sorry. I'll take you home now. Just let me drag these bodies out of the way and I'll... Not yet, you won't. Wait, you can't... <laughs> What's the matter with you men? What's the idea? Shut up, you. Arthur, are you hurt? Mrs. Wallace, the time has come to explain a great many things. First, let me remove this beard. There. You recognize me now, don't you? Mr. Carter. Nick Carter. Oh, Mr. Carter, what are you doing to Arthur? Mr. Burnett. I'll answer that later. First, I want you to meet my assistant, Penny Eagles. Your assistant? Sure. How are you? The other man is an old friend of yours, Mrs. Wallace. An old friend of mine? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure I don't well, perhaps know. Perhaps if he took off his makeup, you might recognize him. There. Do you know me now? Vernon. Oh, Vernon. Oh, Louise, my darling. But Vernon, Arthur told me that you... That I was dead? Oh, yes. Arthur Burnett told you a great many things that were not true. But Vernon, he showed me your ring, your lodge pin. He, he said he took them off of your dead body that the police found in the river. Burnett took those articles from your husband's body. Right enough, Mrs. Wallace. But it was while your husband was still alive. And it's no fault of his that I'm not dead now. You don't mean that Arthur... That's Arthur... exactly what I do mean. He's been lying to you for years, Mrs. Wallace. It was he who ruined your husband's business and caused him to lose so much of his money. It was he who first induced your husband to drink and gamble. And it was he who was responsible for your husband's disappearance a few days ago. But that's a lie. Oh, no, it isn't. 
As a matter of fact, Louise, dear, if Mr. Carter hadn't fooled him by putting a dead calf in my place on that crematory slab, Arthur Burnett would have been my murderer. Oh, no. No, that can't be true. Uh, furthermore, it was Burnett who arranged for your kidnapping this afternoon. Oh, but... He did it so that he could suddenly appear and rescue you from the members of the kidnap gang, who were in reality men in his employ. But why should he do all these horrible things? Because he's been in love with you ever since he first met you. And ever since your marriage to Wallace, he's been insanely jealous of him. Everything Burnett's done has been to make you despise your husband and turn instead to him. That's a lie, Carter. Oh, no, it isn't, Burnett. I can easily prove it. Penny, let me have the gun with this Burnett shot us during the battle a few minutes ago. Sure, Nick. Here you are. Thanks. Now look here, Mrs. Wallace. This pistol has eight shells in it. Burnett fired five shots at us, but there are still three shells left. And here they are. Why, those are blanks. They couldn't hurt anybody. Exactly, Mrs. Wallace. And the shells and the pistols that his men were to use in the fights were blanks also. And if I were a beautiful woman in distress and a man came to my rescue with his pistol loaded with blanks, I think I should find it extremely difficult to believe that he was being on the level with me. was another strange experience of Nick Carter, Master Detective, called The Body on the Slab, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Missing Husband, another of the curious adventures of Nick Carter, which are brought to you regularly at the same time by WOR Mutual. And now, Nick, how about a few hints on next week's story? It's a story of a body which was washed up on the beach, tied up in a sack. And the only identifying mark on the body was one of Nick's cards. I had to solve that murder to prove I didn't do it myself. And I found that the real culprit was the killer who used a clue that pointed directly to him to prove that he couldn't have done it. And the killer tried to drown both Nick and myself when the chase got too warm for comfort. But as you can easily see, he didn't succeed. So, so long until next week. So long, folks. And so long to you and Nick for now, Patsy. In the strange adventure you have just heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark. Patsy by Helen Choate. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was written and directed by Jock McGregor. Next week at the same time, listen to another curious expenditure of Nick Carter entitled... The Drug Ring Murder. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Left-Handed Killer. This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. The return of Nick Carter is produced in the studios of WOR and is broadcast over most of these stations every Wednesday evening at 8.30 Eastern War Time. This is Mutual. Another case for Nick Carter, Master Detective. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure, The Drug Ring Murder, or Nick Carter and the mystery of the left-handed killer. Well, Mr. Nicholas Carter, are you going to answer your telephone, or are you going to take me out to lunch, as you promised? There's no reason why I can't do both, Patsy. Nick Carter speaking. Nick, this is Riley at headquarters. Oh, how are you, Lieutenant? There goes my It's on your mind. Right. Murder. And you're right in the middle of it, Nick. Meet me at the city morgue as quick as you can. I'm waiting here. What's the matter, Riley? Can't headquarters solve this case without me? Who said anything about your solving the case? You get yourself down to the morgue right away, and that's an order. An order, Riley? What are you talking about? The body of a man was washed up on the beach this morning, only he didn't die from drowning. It was murder. Yes? There was no identification on the body. None at all. Except one of your business cards. Nick Carter, private detective. What? 
I hid the card in my pocket as soon as I laid eyes on it. But there's a chance one of the reporters saw it before I did. Now, do I have to draw you a diagram? You've already done it. I'll be there in the double rally. Bye. What's up, Nick? Plenty. Look, Patsy, hold on the office until you hear from me. I'll call you within an hour. I knew you shouldn't have answered that phone. Business before pleasure, Patsy. And right now, I've got business at the city morgue. Where have you got him, Riley? On a slab out here? Uh, He's on ice. In the box at the end of the room there. And I'm telling you one thing, Nick Carter. It's lucky for you that I was here when he was brought in. Now, look, Riley. Surely you aren't trying to pull me into this thing just because the fellow was carrying one of my cards. Uh, Well, there's probably hundreds of people I never heard of are carrying my name in their vest pockets. Well, if you'd rather be explaining to the captain how your card got on a corpse... Oh, now, take it easy, Riley. You know what it means for an officer of the law to conceal evidence, Nick. How do I know one of those reporters or photographers isn't telling the captain right now that... Let's worry about one thing at a time. Well... You said the body was washed up on the beach on the north shore of Long Island? Yes, it was. Stuffed in a gunny sack with every bit of identification removed. Hmm. Everything was ripped out except a concealed pocket. Yes, a... I know. With my card in it. Yes. Now, here we are. Last box here. Now, take a good look, Nick. Yeah, did you ever see him before? Oh, yes. That's Stanley Phillips. Huh? Dr. Stanley Phillips. He's a research chemist. Sort of an eccentric. Oh, oh balmy, huh? No, no, just strange. He's assisted me in a few investigations. But for the most part, he was pretty much of a hermit. Didn't like to mix with people. Yeah, that don't make sense. People who mind their own business don't get and go around getting themselves murdered. Where did he live? There's a big house on a Long Island Sound, but his laboratory was on his yacht. It was anchored about half a mile or so up from the house, if I remember correctly. Laboratory on a yacht? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. He was balmy. Hey, Riley, look. Here in his neck. What did you expect? I told you he was strangled. The autopsy showed he was dead before he was put into the gunny sack and thrown into the water. I know, but that isn't what I mean. Here, look at the prints on his neck. Closely, look at him. Yeah, yeah, well... Lest I miss my guess, Riley, he was murdered by a left-handed killer. Say, maybe you've got something there, Nick. I'll phone the fingerprint expert. Now, wait a minute, Riley. Let me hit the phone first. got to be in my way. Now, now, don't be forgetting you can't take long on this, Nick. The captain will be wanting to question you about your card being found on the body. I can't hold off more than a few hours. Give me those few hours, Riley, and I'll wrap the murderer up in wax paper. Nicholas Carter's office. Oh, hello, Patsy. we got work to do. Yes, Nick? I want you to go through the files and dig out all the stuff we have on Dr. Stanley Phillips. That queer duck who did some work for you once? Yeah, that's the one. Research chemist. Uh Uh-huh. Get all the dope on him and meet me down in front of the office in ten minutes. I'll pick you up. All right, Nick. That's all. Yeah, where are you headed for, Nick? The Phillips Estate on Long Island Sound. Meet me there as soon as you get the report on the fingerprints and Stanley Phillips' neck. And apparently neither he nor his sister ever married. After the parents died, they continued to live in the big manor house. What did you say the sister's name was? Rose Phillips. Rose. Go on. Mm, you know all about his laboratory being on his yacht. Mm-hmm. It's supposed to be one of the best private laboratories in the country. Used to do a lot of research work for big companies. That's a laboratory assistant, Tom Marks, young man. And let's see what else. Um... Oh, his hobby was writing. Scientific articles, they were. Usually about the effects of habit-forming drugs. He had an article in Popular Research last month entitled Morphine Exposed. So he wrote about habit-forming drugs, huh? Hmm. You know, Patsy... This case might turn out to be more than just an ordinary murder. I guess nobody's home, Nick. You're wrong about that, Betsy. Saw the curtains at the window move. Hmm. Pounding on the door isn't going to do any good either. Whoever's in there evidently doesn't want callers today. However... What are you going to do? Open the door. This little lock picker of mine. There it is. All right, come on, Patsy. We're going in. I don't see anybody. Stay behind me. Put your hands up. Over your head. She's got a gun, Nick. You're Rose Phillips, I take it, miss? Keep your hands up. I'm asking the questions. Who are you? I'm Nick Carter, and this is... Nick Carter? Yes. And this is my assistant, Patsy Bowen. Nick Carter, the great detective, when my brother often speaks of you, he thinks you're wonderful. Nick, she doesn't know yet. Miss Phillips, I'm sorry to have to tell you like this, 
But your brother is dead. He's... He's dead? Yes. <laughs> I'm afraid he was murdered. <laughs> murdered? Stanley murdered? <laughs> now, if you'll just put that gun away, Miss Phillips, we'll talk things over. Of course, Mr. Carter, I'm sorry. This is all such a shock. It was a fiendish killing. And I'm going to do all I can to bring the criminal to justice. You may be sure of that. Oh, Rose. Rose. I'm in here, Richard. Oh. Well, uh, who are these people? I thought Stanley told you never to let strangers in the house. It's all right, Richard. This is Nick Carter, the detective, and his assistant. Oh. Well, well that's different. How do you do, Mr. Carter? I'm Richard Coles. I take it you've already heard about Dr. Phillips. Yes. Ghastly, isn't it? I can hardly believe it. The police say it was murder. For the life of me, I can't imagine who would want to murder Stanley. He was a strange man, Mr. Carter, very strange. He had a phobia about not letting anyone in the house when he was away. You seem to manage an entrance all right, Mr. Coles. Well, I... Mr. Coles is a very old friend of the family and has always had a key to the house. He's our lawyer. Look out, Nick. There's someone at the window. He's got a gun. <laughs> I can't get over it, Nick. You don't seem to be surprised that you were shot at back there in the house. I'm not, Patsy. That's why I was standing beside that suit of armor. That protected me by deflecting the bullets. Nick, your presence on the Phillips case is most annoying to someone. Too bad that window was frosted glass. Mm. Couldn't get a look at the gunman. That tiny crack the window was open. Well, now, did you find what I told you to look for in the cottage occupied by Tom Marks, the lab assistant? Yes, I found a pair of his gloves. Good. I had to go through all his desk drawers to find them, too. Let me see them. Mm-hmm. All seems to be adding up. Almost too neatly. Adds up to a pair of gloves. That's all. Look, Patsy. Coles told me back there's something about the terms of Philip's will. If he lived to be 50, his estate was to go to a foundation. If he died before that, Rose was to inherit all the estate. But that makes Rose the... Oh, no, 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 no. I don't suspect Rose. Her grief seemed genuine. But there's something else I learned. Tom Marks, Philip's lab assistant, is in love with Rose. They've been wanting to get married, but Philip opposed the marriage. Now the field is clear. We'll oodles of money to boot. But that still doesn't make Tom Marks... Patsy, the... I'm almost certain Phillips was strangled by a left-handed killer. These gloves of Marks you brought me show that he's left-handed. Oh. And that leads us where? Right out to the laboratory and the yacht. I've got to find Tom Marks. <laughs> Nick, why in the world do you suppose Dr. Phillips had his laboratory way out here in the middle of the sound? There's no mystery to that one, Patsy. He told me why once. Well, why? So people couldn't bother him. I'd have used his technical knowledge a lot more often on cases myself if it had been more accessible. Well, here we are. This is the Phillips yacht. I'll tie up here. I've never climbed up a rope ladder before. And you're not going up now either. Not until I look around the boat myself. Oh, Nick, am I helping you on this case or not? You are, but I don't want you taking unnecessary chances. Nick, please. Now, quiet a minute, Patsy. Let's see if we can raise somebody from here. Hello, up there. Hello, aboard the Phillips yacht. It's funny. Tom Marks is aboard. He's keeping quiet about it. Well, we'll find out right now. You better stay here in the motorboat. And let you solve this case alone? Not a chance. Okay, okay. But stay directly behind me, remember? Phew. Climbing this rope ladder's no cinch. I'm glad I'm not a sailor. Can you make it? Uh-huh. I'm coming. What do you think you'll find, Nick? Tom Marks, I hope. Here. Let me give you a hand over the rail. All right. Oops, a daisy. Oh, Thanks. Well, there's nobody to lay out the welcome rug on the deck of this floating laboratory. Well, that doesn't mean we're alone, Patsy. Come on. We're going down this companionway. Okay. If I'm not mistaken, it leads to Phillips' laboratory. Mm-hmm. This is the laboratory. All right, Patsy, stay behind me. I'm going to open the door. Hey, Marks. Tom Marks, you in there? All right, Patsy. We can go in. Well, Tom Mark seems to have vanished, but he certainly left a mess behind him. Yes. Overturned retorts. Bunsen burner knocked over. 
Hmm, look here on the floor. Hmm, broken bottle. Sulfuric acid spilled and eating into the floor. Yes, this is where Dr. Stanley Phillips met his death, all right. And when the killer came at him, he was sitting at this desk writing. Well, how do you figure that? That bottle of ink tipped over. Wonder if he has any papers here that'll tell us what we want to know. No. Desk been rifled. Everything of any value has already been taken. It still all adds up to Tom Marks, doesn't it? Yep, seems to. We'll know for sure as soon as Riley gets the report from the fingerprint expert. Nick! Hmm? Nick, come here. Look what I found in the sink. What? This piece of paper. Let's see. Now, that's in Dr. Phillips' handwriting. Well, somebody tried to burn it out. Then they threw it on the drain board of the sink here. Part of it didn't burn. Let's see if I can figure it out. Like you to know... The man whom I have trusted and worked with these many years is, I have discovered, the head of a giant dope peddling ring. Been using my premises to carry on his business. This man is... Nick, the lights have gone off! (laughs) Patsy. Mm -hmm. Patsy, where are you? Patsy. Nick. Are you all right, Patsy? Uh, My head... Somebody hit me. Stay where you are, I'll find the switch. Do you have your flashlight? Yeah, I'll find the switch in just a second. Oh, the lights won't work. Uh, they must have been turned off with the master switch in the engine room. And that means there's more than one person on this boat besides us. One of them turned off the lights and the other one shot at us in here. Are you were right when you said you felt everything wasn't okay on this yacht. You able to get up, Patsy? Oh, sure. I'm all right now. Just a big hen's egg on my head, that's all. Okay, come on. Nick, did they take the note? That's just what I want to find out. Let's see. Flash a light down in the sink. Yeah, it's gone. Yeah, but wait. What are you going to do? Clean up the sink a little. Ashes don't look well scattered around in a white sink. Carefully now. No look. There. there we are. Now we're ready. Ready for what? To search this yacht from stem to stern. <laughs> What in blazes has been keeping you, Nick? I've been cooling my heels on this dock for the past half hour here. I hope you'd be here, Riley. Hello, Lieutenant. Hello, Patsy. Well, say, you look as if you'd seen a ghost on that yacht. I did. Somebody took a shot at us in the dark. What? Patsy got knocked down the fracas and got a nasty bump in her head. Say, who did it, Nick? Whoever it was made a neat getaway. Patsy and I searched the ship afterwards from end to end, but didn't find a soul. Did you see anybody coming in from the yacht, Lieutenant? Oh, nary a soul's come in off that boat since I've been here. In fact, the only two people who've been near here was two fishermen. Are you sure they were fishermen? Am I sure? Now, now look, Nick, don't be giving me that. It was bona fide fishermen, all right. They pulled their little rowboat to shore a ways down the beach, and I saw them bring in their catch. And a nice string of fish it was. Okay, okay, Riley. So they were really fishermen. Well, what about your report, Lieutenant? Oh, oh, that. Well, Nick was right. Our fingerprint expert examined the marks on Dr. Phillips' neck and said he was undoubtedly strangled by a left-handed killer. And now all we've got to do is find a left-handed man who had a reason to murder the doctor. We found him. Uh, What's that? Dr. Phillips' laboratory assistant, Tom March, is left-handed. You see, you sure worked fast, Nick. And it's a good thing, too. The captain found out about your card being found on the body. Hey, what kind of a scoundrel is this Tom Marks? I don't know. Haven't seen him yet. Wasn't at his cottage, and he wasn't in the lab in the yacht. Now let's make tracks, Mr. Private Detective, and search the grounds here. Wait a minute, Maybe Riley, we... wait a minute. There's one thing more you ought to know. Huh? Whoever killed Dr. Stanley Phillips is the head of a giant dope ring. Do- Phillips was killed because he was about to expose the man. Hey, that would be the laboratory assistant. He'd have access to drugs. Mr. Carter! Mr. Carter! Uh, who in tarnation is that? Richard Coles, close friend of the Phillips and also the lawyer. Oh. O'Reilly, yeah? put this envelope in your pocket. Careful of it. It's a piece of evidence I picked up in the boat. Okay, Nick. Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter, I've been hunting everywhere for you. Oh, Mr. Coles, this is Lieutenant Riley from headquarters. Oh, I'm glad you're here, Lieutenant. We're up against a dangerous criminal. Uh, don't worry, Mr. Coles. The law always gets its man. What do you want to see me about, Mr. Coles? Rose Phillips. She's gone. G- gone? How do you know? Come up to the house with me. I'll show you. Something has happened to her, I'm sure. Hurry! Here. This is Rose's bedroom, Lieutenant. Well... Somebody was making a fast getaway, all right. Yes. Just look at the room. Clothes strewn all over. One of her suitcases is gone, and this suitcase, half-packed, was left behind. 
She and the laboratory assistant must have been in on this together. If she wasn't guilty, she wouldn't have run away. Oh, she must have been out of her mind. Of course, Rose was in love with Tom and... Nick. What's the matter, Patsy? What are you frowning at? Rose Phillips didn't run away. What's uh, that? What's, what, didn't run away? What are you saying, Patsy? No girl would run away voluntarily and leave all her makeup behind. But look at that dressing table. Nothing's been touched. You're right, Patsy. Say, do you suppose... Oh, no, no. What is it, Mr. Coles? Do you suppose that Tom could have forced her to leave? You mean... You mean kidnap her? Yes. Well, he won't get away with it. I'll call headquarters and have a cordon thrown around this entire district. We'll catch Tom Marks before he gets to the next town. Good idea, Riley. Do that. Well, Mr. Coles? Yes, Mr. Carter? I guess Lieutenant Riley has his case all sewed up. His men will have Tom Marks and Rose Phillips within the hour. Well, Mr. Carter, it was nice of you to take such an interest in my friend's death. Um, would you care for a cigarette? Oh, no, thanks. Uh, you, Lieutenant? Why, why, sure, sure, I don't mind if I do. Of course. Uh, light? Yeah, thanks, thanks. Well, good night, Mr. Coles. Goodbye. Carter. Come along, Patsy. Hey, uh, where's the telephone, Mr. Coles? There's uh, one right over here on the table. Hurry up, Patsy, we got work to do. I thought you said the case was finished. Not by a long shot. I said that for their benefit. You and I are going over this estate with a fine-tooth comb. I'm not satisfied yet. You see anything, Nick? Come on in. Shut the door. Do you think anyone saw us headed for this boathouse? I hope not. Oh, be careful here. Don't step off in the water. Nick, there's a small speedboat in the water. Wouldn't you think they'd put it in dry dock so late in the season? Depends, Patsy. Look up there, mounted in the bow. A machine gun? Mm-hmm. This boat was used for business. Gee, who'd ever think a quiet little chemist like Dr. Phillips kept a mounted machine gun on a speedboat? I believe this setup down here was news to Dr. Phillips, too. Hold on to my arm. We'll look around. Oh, Nick, don't step on the fish. String of fish? Well, the... Nick, those fishermen Riley saw must have come in here. Patsy, this catch isn't fresh. What? Those men used this string of dead fish just to fool Riley. And those were the men who made trouble for us on the yacht. Yeah, they must have been. Well, plenty of life preservers stacked up in here. Yeah, that's strange. Here, Patsy, hmm? take the flashlight and play it on this one. Okay. Well, what are you doing, taking it to pieces? No, just examining it. Aha! There we have it. What? A small waterproof pocket's been sewn in here. Yes, and it extends all the way around inside this life preserver. Pretty clever. Look, Patsy. What is it? These secret compartments are filled with dope. I bet every one of these life preservers is filled with drugs. Nobody would ever think of looking in a life preserver for evidence. I think Dr. Phillips did. And that's why he was murdered. <laughs> Nick. Nick. Are you okay, Patsy? Yes, but I can't stop crying. Well, that's not surprising. Somebody threw a tear gas bomb through the window. Oh. That's right, friends. It was tear gas. Who's there? <laughs> Pretty clever of me using the tools of my trade that way, isn't it, Mr. Carter? But Tom Marks is always clever. So you're Tom Marks, huh? I've been waiting to set my eyes on you. It's too bad your eyes are filled with tear gas. Because now you'll never have that pleasure. Okay, Pete. Come in and get the lady. Right. I'll take care of Mr. Carter okay. myself. Sister, come on. <laughs> come on, sister. Let her go alone. Here, let her go alone. <laughs> <laughs> Got those iron weights in the bag, Pete? Sure, both of them. This guy'll never be washed up on a beach like the doc was. <laughs> Good. 
See you tied a bag good and tight. You know, I think he's passed out. He ain't moving none. I did a job on him before we put him in the bag. <laughs> Listen to that dame, will you? <laughs> Sounds like a hoot owl with a cold in the head. <laughs> Shut up. Oh, no. Oh, tighten the gag, Pete. Okay. Hey. Hey. That'll do it. Hey. Say, Carter ain't dead. What does it take to kill that guy? I choked him like a rat and he's still talking. All right. All right, speak your piece, Mr. Carter, because you don't have much longer. You're not going to get away with this. <laughs> you hear what he said? <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> I doubt it, Mr. Carter. You're going straight down to Davy Jones' locker. You'll pay for this. I'll land you behind bars within 24 hours. Oh, listen to him. What do you fellas think you're going to do with Patsy Bone? He's worrying about a dame when he's <laughs> going to lose his own neck. Go <laughs> easy with her, I'm warning you. Uh, well. Come on, let's get rid of him. Okay. It's dark enough now. All right. You got him? Yeah. All right, lift him up. That's it. I'll get you one, fellas for this. Two, three. Uh, let her go. I came as soon as I got your flashlight signal from the shore, Nick. You think the criminals are aboard the yacht here now? You'll see in a minute. The laboratory's right down this companionway. Hey, you're dripping wet from head to foot, Nick. What happened? Well, they tried to pull the same trick on Nick that they pulled on Dr. Phillips. Ah. Only it didn't work, because Nick can expand his neck and wrist muscles. Yes, I had my hands free before I hit the water. There was no trick at all to cut my way out of the sack. And then I clung to the back of their motorboat until it reached the yacht here. I waited for the would-be killers to get aboard... Untied, Patsy, and here we are. Ah, you're lucky, Nick. He's smart, that's all. Quiet. This is the door. Keep your gun ready. Right. Good evening, Mr. Coles. What? Oh, Nick Carter. Well, come in, Mr. Carter. These two friends of mine and myself were just discussing whether you had found the criminals. I think we have, Mr. Coles. Good, good. There's just one thing more I need to make sure I have the criminals. Riley. Yeah? Give me that envelope I asked you to keep for me. Oh, sure, sure, Nick. Uh, Here you are. Thanks. Now, I'll just take the piece of burned paper out of this envelope. Are those the pieces you gathered from the drain board? Yes, Patsy. Uh They were from the note Stanley Phillips wrote just before he was murdered. Now, I'll just use some of these chemicals in the burned paper. You see, gentlemen, even though this piece of paper's been burned, it is possible by using the correct chemical solution to bring out the writing that was on the paper before it was burned. In this case, I expect the writing will give the name of the man Phillips designated as head of the giant drug ring and his killer. Ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Yes, here it comes. The chemicals are beginning to act. The writing is beginning to show up. Good. The name is... Nick, look out! Oh, you got the boy! Get out of here! And I got these two thugs, Nick. Knocked him out cold. So I had to plug in the shoulder, Coles, but I had to put you out of action. Now, Riley, there's your murderer. Uh, so it was Coles who did it. You're right, Carter. I killed him. Uh, the powers be praised, Nick. I thought Tom Marks was the killer. Coles had me fooled too, Riley, until this afternoon when he came running down from the house. And then I noticed his feet were wet, as if he'd been in waiting. Then he was one of the men on the yacht, one of the fishermen Riley saw. Right, Patsy. And another thing. The man who strangled me in the boathouse claimed to be Tom Marks. But Tom Marks is left-handed. The man who tried to strangle me used his right hand. And you knew Phillips was murdered by a left-handed man. That's right. I knew I was after a left-handed murderer. O'Reilly, huh? did you notice that when Coles landed your cigarette for you this afternoon in Rose's room, he used his left hand? Gee, by golly, he did. Th- th- then he's left-handed, too. Right. When I saw him do that, I knew he was the killer. But I had to make him prove it. Oh, you did that all right. That business about making the writing stand out on a piece of paper after it's burned is a new one to me, Nick. Nick, can you actually do that? Well, it can be done under ideal conditions. But this time, I was just putting on an act for Mr. Coles' benefit. You mean you didn't actually make any writing appear on the burned paper? Not a word, Mr. Coles. And I fell for it like a sap. Nick. Hmm? What's that? Well, I'm not sure, Patsy, but I have a hunch. It's locked, Nick. Oh, Patsy, since when did a locked door ever stop Nick Carter? Quite right, Riley. When did it? This is no time for it to start. So, this one ought to do the trick. There we are. Nick Carter. Oh, thank heaven, Rose. This man with you is Tom Marks, Miss Phillips? Yes, I am. 
They were going to kill us, Mr. Carter. They tied us up and threw us in here. We heard them planning to throw us overboard. Have you been imprisoned in here all this time, Mr. Marks? Uh, no, not quite. I got a telephone call last night summoning me into the city to pick up some chemicals Dr. Phillips and I needed in an experiment. I was slugged as I stepped out of the car. And when I came too late this afternoon, I, I was in here. And so was Rose. Uh, that cause was a smart one. Throwing suspicion on you and then trying to get rid of you in order to make it look as if you'd run away. Smart, but not smart enough for Nick. Well, Riley, you've got your murderer. I have that. And Rose, you and Tom are safe. Yes, thanks to you. And I guess that's that. Oh, no, Nick. You still have to solve my case. Oh, well, what's that, Patsy? That luncheon date you promised me. Oh. Where are you and I going to have lunch at this hour? Why, uh... Well, say, that's easy, Patsy. I know a swell place in town, right across from the morgue. Come on. <laughs> This was another strange experience of Nick Carter, master detective, called the drug ring murder, or Nick Carter and the mystery of the left-handed killer. Another of the curious adventures of Nick Carter, which are brought to you regularly at the same time by WOR Mutual. And now, Nick, what can you tell us about next week's story? When a young man who was a very good friend of mine arrived in town to claim his bride, he suddenly became aware that she was not the girl to whom he'd become engaged. You mean she wasn't his fiancée? That was the question that started off the whole case. Yes, indeed. Because we couldn't be sure whether the girl he loved was really the girl he loved, we prevented two murders and saved a gigantic fortune from disappearing. But you didn't save me from disappearing, Nick. Oh, quite true, Patsy. But after all, you weren't gone very long before we found you. But I'm sure glad you found me when you did, or I might not be here now. So long, folks. Get the rest of the story next week. Right. So long. And so long to you, Nick and Patsy. In the strange adventure you have just heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark, Patsy by Helen Choate. The story was written for Nick Carter by Barth Connery. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was under the direction of Jock McGregor. <laughs> Next week, at the same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter entitled... The Substitute Bride, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Night Ferry. This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. The return of Nick Carter is produced in the studios of WOR and is broadcast over most of these stations every Wednesday evening at 8.30 Eastern War Time. This is Mutual. Another case for Nick Carter, Master Detective. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure... The Substitute Bride. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Night Ferry. Here, here, take your hands off me. Now, what are you doing? Now, let me go. Don't put me down. No, no, stop it. Ah! Nick, there's a young man here to see you. Says he's an old friend of yours. Well, hello, Nick. Alan Marvin. Well, Alan, it's good to see you again. And what brings you to this part of the country? I came east to get married, Nick. Well, congratulations. Now, wait a minute. I'm afraid your congratulations are a little premature. What's the matter? I don't know. I can't find her. Can't find her? Well, what on earth do you mean by that? Well, look, it's like this, Nick. Alice Evans and I have been engaged for about four years. But for the past three years, she's been living in South America with friends of her family. She was due back in this country yesterday on the Gallia, so I came on from Chicago to meet her. Her boat got in ahead of schedule, and my train was late, so we missed connections. 
I'd already told her I was coming, but in spite of that, she was gone by the time I got to the dock last night. Didn't she leave any message for you? No, not a word. That's odd. And she has no friends in this part of the country that she could stay with. Well, didn't anyone at the boat know where she went? Well, apparently not, Nick. The stewardess says a boy brought her a note, and as soon as she read it, she got dressed and went ashore. There was a taxi waiting for her, and she went off in it. An hour later, an expressman called for her trunks. Perhaps she went to a hotel. Hotel? But oh, why should she do that when I told her that I'd meet her at the boat? No, Nick. Something has happened to her. I'm sure of it. Nick, the hmm? morning paper says that there's a Miss Alice Evans registered at the Hamilton Park Hotel. What's that? Would that be the same girl? Here, let me see that, will you? Quick. Hmm, right here. Uh, <laughs> well, then she did go to a hotel. Oh, gee, what a fool I was for worrying you, Nick. I'll take nothing of it, Alan. Glad you found her. Well, if you, uh, if you don't mind, Nick, I think I'll... Uh... Sure, go right ahead. I know how anxious you are to see her. Hey, look, Nick, why don't you come with me? I'd like very much to have you meet her. Well, Alan, this seems hardly the time to... Oh, drag. come on. No, Nick, come on. I want you to meet her. You'll like her. Well, all right, if you insist. But I've heard it said that three is usually a crowd, especially after two of them been separated for three years. <laughs> Taxi! Taxi! Second and fifth driver. Well, Ellen, I gather that you feel that our visit to the young lady was not a complete success. Nick, something's wrong. I, I don't know what. So I noticed. That's why I stayed until you left. I tell you, she's changed. I can't put my finger on it, but she's different somehow. Well, three years is a long time, Ellen. Some change would be quite natural. Oh, but it isn't that kind of change, Nick. And doesn't she look the same? Yes, she does, and she doesn't. You mean you don't think she is, Alice Evans? Well, she must be, and yet... Then you're not sure. Uh, I wish her father were here. He'd know immediately whether she's his daughter or not. Where is he? Chicago? I don't know. He told me he was meeting the boat, but as far as I know, he hasn't shown up. She said she hadn't seen him. Well, he probably was delayed in getting away. Look, you... You don't suppose anything could have happened to him, do you? You know, like so many rich men, he always carried several hundred dollars with him. Well, it's possible, of course, Ellen. Was there anything distinctive about his appearance? Well, he was a shortish man, stout, white hair. Oh, yeah, he wore old-fashioned side whiskers. Well, those should make him easy to identify. I'll have Lieutenant Riley get in touch with the Chicago police and see if they know anything about him. Oh, good. Then I'll have Patsy make the round of the hospitals here in town... I'll send Penny to the terminal and the ferries to see if he can pick up any information about him there. Mm-hmm. Well, we ought to find out something that way. And I think my next step will be to visit the Galliard or Dock. See what I can learn there. The main reason I'm taking you to see Miss Evans, Purser, is that I want you to tell me whether or not she's the girl who made the trip up in South America with you. I understand, sir. Now, you, the purser of the Gallia, probably had as good a chance to see her as anyone. Oh, why, yes, sir, but none of us saw her very much. Uh, she took ill right after we sailed and stayed in her room almost the entire trip. But you say you'd be able to identify her positively. Oh, yes, sir. I have an excellent memory for faces, and uh, she was a real looker, she was. Here's her hotel. Come on. Right, sir. Here, we can take this elevator. Three, please. This is her floor. Her room's right across the corridor here. Oh, oh, come in, Mr. Carter. Thank you, Miss Evans. You, of course, know this gentleman, Miss Evans? Why, I... Well, let me see. Oh, it, it's hardly fair to expect her to remember me, Mr. Carter. She was so ill every time I saw her that I doubt if she'd ever really got a good look at me the old voyage. Oh, why, of course. Now I know who you are. You're one of the officers off the Gallia. We came up from South America together. That's right, Mum. See, sir, she knows me right enough. Oh, I knew I'd seen you somewhere. If, if I hadn't been so sick, I'd have remembered you at once. I see. Well, Miss Evans, our call is really in the nature of business. The purser found a valuable lot of jewelry left behind in the ship, and I was called in to help find the owner. 
As it was near your cabin, we come to you first. I haven't missed any of my jewels, but I'll let you know if I do. Thank you. Have you had any word from your father yet? No, not a word. Do you suppose anything's happened to him? What did he look like, Miss Evans? Why, he was... I'll show you his picture. You can tell better by that. Here you are, Mr. Carter. That's my father. Are you a detective? Yes, Miss Evans. I am. Then you must find him for me. I don't care what it costs. Very well. I'll see what I can do. Shall we go, Purser? Uh, oh, yes, sir. Good day, miss, and good luck to you. Goodbye, and, and thank you. I'll let you know as soon as I learn anything, Miss Evans. Good day. Well, Purser, was that the Miss Evans who made the trip with you in the galleon? Oh, positively, sir. I'd know her anywhere. You're sure? Ah, oh, there's no question whatever, sir. I'd swear to it on a stack of Bibles a foot high, I would. I couldn't find a thing, Nick. There's nobody in the hospital who answers to the description of Mr. Evans. I hardly expected you'd find anything, Patsy. But we had to be sure. Well, did the Chicago police know anything about him? Riley said they had no report of anything having happened to him there. Mm -hmm. What did Penny find? Well, Penny hasn't come in yet. Oh, hey, Nick. I couldn't find any traces of the old boy at the tunnel, but I did find something at the ferry. What'd you find? Oh, that'll keep, Nick. Right now, I got a taxi waiting outside, and the driver of the taxi's the fellow who took Alice Evans from the boat to the hotel last night. And he knows something. How'd you find him? Oh, the stewardess on the galley pointed him out to me. I'm afraid if I try to bring him in here, I'll scare him. I already asked him a lot of questions. I'll go outside and talk to him myself. Oh, driver, I'm Nick Carter. So what? I ain't interested. But I am. I'm interested in what you can tell me about a young lady you picked up at the galley last night. You took her to the Hamilton Park Hotel, didn't you? All right, so what if I did? Look, you'll save yourself time and trouble if you'll answer my questions. You picked her up about 8 o'clock, didn't you? Yeah, about that. How long a drive is it to the hotel? Yeah, about a half hour. Maybe if the lights was against you, 45 minutes. And how does it happen that you didn't register in at the hotel till nearly 10 o'clock? Well, I did... Where'd you go between the time you left the galley and the time you reached the hotel? I stopped over the house on 22nd Street for a while. Did Miss Evans leave the cab? Yeah, she said she wanted to see Winslow's daughter. Said they went to school together. You mean it was David Winslow's house you stopped at? Yeah, I said so, didn't I? Yes, you did. Thanks. Here. This will pay you for what's on the meter and for the information. Okay. So long. Find out anything, Nick? That depends, Patsy. Now, Penny, what does the dope you got at the ferry? Well, it's like this, Nick. I found one of the ferry guards who remembered seeing an old guy with big white side whiskers get on the ferry about the time Evans' train must have got in from Chicago, see? Well, this guard got such a kick out of the whiskers that he watched for the old guy to get off the boat at the other side so he could get another gander at him. And did he? Nah, the old guy didn't get off. What? What? Was he sure? Sure. And the old guy wasn't on the boat anywhere. Well, that would sound as if something might have happened to him during that ferry well, ride. Nick. Oh, Alan. Nick, I've got some news. Mr. Evans was alive this morning. Is that so? How do you know? I'll tell you. I went to see Mr. Evans' banker this afternoon to see if he had any word from him. He showed me a check that Mr. Evans had made out this morning. A check for $50,000. Dated this morning? Mm Mm-hmm. Yes. It was made out to John Smith and endorsed by David Winslow. David Winslow? You're sure of that, Ellen? Yes, I'm sure. Why, Nick? Here's Why? Last night, a girl who claims to be Alice Evans, but apparently isn't, stops off at Winslow's house on the way to the hotel. Yeah. Mr. Evans disappears last night, and yet a check made out by him this morning turns up endorsed by Winslow himself. Hey, wait a minute. That does look suspicious. Certainly does. Patsy, tomorrow morning, you and I are going to call on Mr. Winslow. Very good of you to see me, Mr. Winslow. I'm Nick Carter, the detective. Yes, I've heard of you, Mr. And Carter. This is Miss Bowen, my assistant. How do you do, good Mr. Good morning, Bowen. Mr. Winslow. What can I do for you, Mr. Carter? Mr. Winslow, do you know James Evans? Only very slightly. Are you acquainted with his daughter, Alice? No, Mr. Carter, I'm not. I see. Did a check of Mr. Evans recently pass through your hands? Why, yes, it did. I cashed one of his checks yesterday. 
Did you know that Mr. Evans disappeared the day before the date on no, that I check? Didn't. Well, he did. You don't say. Would you be in a position to know if the signature on the check were a forgery? Well, the signature was genuine, all right. When Mr. Smith presented for payment a check in the amount of $50,000, I naturally sent the check to Mr. Evans' bank for verification. They said it was good, so I paid Smith the money. I see. You said a few moments ago that you didn't know Alice Evans. Yes, I did. But didn't she call here night before last? Why, well, yes, she did. She called to see my daughter. They were classmates at school. My daughter was not at home, so she talked to my wife for a while and left. Uh, thank you for your trouble, Mr. Winslow. Not at all. Come on, Patsy. Time we're running along. Okay, Nick. Good morning, Mr. Winslow. Good morning. Good day, Mr. Winslow. Good day to you, sir. Patsy, I'd be tempted to believe what he said, even if I didn't know that he has an excellent reputation in banking circles here in town. Well, what he told us certainly sounded straightforward enough to oh, allay... Hold it, Patsy. Hmm? See that man going in the house next door? Oh, yes. What about him, Nick? I saw that man at court a few weeks ago, charged with murderous assault. What? And now we found him going into the house next door to Winslow's. Patsy, mm -hmm. I want you to get back to the office immediately. Tell Penny to see what he can find out about that house. The address is 832 West 22nd Street. Yes, Nick. I want to know more about that place. Uh, talk plainer, Nick. What did you say that address was? 832 West 22nd Street, Riley. Uh, well, no, Nick. That's a curious thing. Hmm? One of the boys picked up a bum this morning, and when we searched him, we found a slip of paper in his pocket with that same address on it. Swell, Riley. Hold him. I'll be right down. I don't know, I tell you. How many times have I got to keep on saying that? You don't know who pushed the man off the ferry, who kidnapped his daughter, where she is now, or anything about it? No, I tell you, no. Who's the girl who's staying at the Hamilton Park Hotel under the name of Evans? Where's the Hamilton Park Hotel? All right, Baker, all right. Guess I must have you all wrong. I'll say you have. You live at 832 West 22nd Street? Well, I don't exactly... No. Who does live there? Oh, how should I know? Where does David Winslow live? Ah, uh, right next... Who's David Winslow? Riley. Yeah, Nick? I'm through with Baker. Not the fellow I thought he was. All right, Baker. The guard's waiting for you just outside the door. He'll take you back to your cell. Okay. I hope you're getting what you're looking for, Carter. Well, Nick, what did you find? Riley, Baker thought he told me nothing. But his answers weren't as clever as he thought they were. Yeah? Actually, he told me that Evans was thrown off the ferry into the river and that he was picked up in a rowboat which was waiting for him. Well... And I also discovered that he knows David Winslow and that he knows what goes on at 832 West 22nd Street. Gee. All of which, while not conclusive evidence, tells me I'm on the right track. Nice going, Nick. Well, what's next? Riley, I want you to release this man Baker at once. What? Uh, release him, Nick? But, but why? I want to be sure the rest of the gang knows I'm on their trail. The first thing Baker will do when he gets out of here will be to tell them. They'll undoubtedly make some move to try and stop me. And that may bring him out in the open. <laughs> Penny, what'd you find out? Well, I'll tell you, Nick. Whoever's running that gang's keeping it pretty secret. None of my old pals know anything about it. All I could find out is that the address is the hideout of what they call the Secret Six. Yeah? An ex-convict that they call the butler takes care of the place during the day and keeps it cleaned up. That would be the man Patsy and I saw. What about David Winslow? Ah, nobody connects his name with it nowhere. <clears throat> he must be extremely clever. Or I'm extremely much of a dope. Ah, you're no dope, Nick. Uh, no. Hey, where's Patsy? She asked me to bring her back some peanuts. Oh, she went to see that girl who's posing as Alice Evans at her hotel. Hey, wait. I didn't realize it was so late. She should have been back by now. Found this note at her desk when I came in about lunchtime. Yeah. yeah. And dear Nick, girl who calls herself Alice Evans just called to say she had information on her father's disappearance. When I told her you weren't here, she asked me to go over and she'd give it to me and I could get it to you. We'll take a run over to the hotel and see what she wants. See you at the office when I get back, Patsy. And that was almost five hours ago. Say, look, should we go over there and have a look, see? Well, first I'll phone Miss Evans. Hamilton Park Hotel. That's, um, Shermore 32423. 
Gee, if that bunch of crooks has tried anything on Patsy... Hamilton Park Hotel. Good afternoon. Miss Alice Evans, please. Miss Evans, I'll connect you. Thank you. You know, I ain't known Patsy long, but she's a pretty swell kind of dame for... I'm sorry, Miss Evans does not answer. Thanks. Nobody home? No, Penny. And I don't like it. I think we better get going and... Wait a minute. Nicholas Carter's office. Nick Carter? Yeah? Who's this? If you want to see your girlfriend Patsy again, Carter, keep out of the Evans case. What do you mean? If you make another move to try and find out what happened to old man Evans or his daughter, you can kiss your girlfriend goodbye. It'll be curtains for her. But look, Nick, just because the Secret Six meets here doesn't mean that they'll be keeping Patsy a prisoner here. I know that, Penny. But we saw a couple of members of the gang go in here a few minutes ago, didn't we? Yeah, sure we did. Well, if I can't make them tell me what they've done with Patsy, my name isn't Nick Carter. Oh, whatever you say, Nick. You say that man they call the butler is upstairs on the first floor now? Yeah, he's writing in the back parlor. Then let's get into the basement, quick. Oh, but the door's locked, Nick. It's got a special Townsend lock on it. Well, that won't be the first door with a Townsend lock on it. That my little pick lock is opened. There. Quiet now. Wonder where this door goes. Oh, that leads into the basement of the house next door, Nick. Then I'm right. That's the basement of the house where that banker Winslow lives. He is in on this. Hey, Nick, sounds like somebody's coming down here. You're right, Penny. Here, quick. There's a storage closet. Get in here. I'll leave the door open a crack so we can watch him. It's that butler, Penny. You're not going to gag me again, are you? That must be old man Evans. Uh, What's that stuff you have there? Oh, if you call that food, you can take it away. Penny, Penny, if one of us stands on each side of that door, we can grab the butler when he comes out. But don't let him call out. Those other guys might hear him. Well, whatever you say, Nick. Like this? Go on. Get out of here. Go on, get out. Here he comes. Now. Hey! Good. All right. Let's drag him into Evan's room here. Quick. Now. Shut the door. Okay. What's this? What are you doing? You're Mr. Evans, aren't you? Oh, yes, yes, well, I I'm am. I'm the detective, Nick Carter. Well, oh, thank heavens. You know where the other two men are that we saw come in here a little while ago? They're probably in the room where the gang meets at the end of this hallway, Butler. sir. Butler! That's Winslow. Quick, Mr. Evans. Yes? What did this butler's voice sound like? Well, very much like yours, except that he had a kind of dialect, no particular country, just foreign. Butler, confound How does the butler address Winslow? Uh, it's just Senor Winslow, I, I think, see. sir. Yes, Senor Winslow. You call me? I've called you several times. Where have you been? I've been trying to find something in the back of the storage closet. You wish something, Senor? Yes. When the boys come in for the meeting tonight, tell them not to leave until I get here, no matter what time it is. You understand? But of course. They must not leave until you come. I will tell them. All right, and don't forget... Wait, that was amazing, Mr. Carter. It was almost a perfect imitation. All right, Penny. You better get this butler chap tied up and gagged before he comes to. Well, whatever you say, Nick. Mr. Evans. Yes? You know why you were kidnapped and brought here? Why, yes, Mr. Carter. They want my fortune. I know they've kidnapped my daughter and substituted in her place a girl who looks enough like her to be her double. They plan to have her get possession of everything she can, sir. Then they forced you to write that check for $50,000, didn't they? Yes. But, Mr. Carter, do you know where my daughter is? I'm sorry, Mr. Evans, I don't. But I expect to know very soon. Oh. Come on, Penny. Let's get down the hall and let those thugs tell us where Patsy is. Whatever you say, Nick. What do I do then, boy? Yeah, all right. Hold it, Benny. I'll turn the knob on the door very gently. Then when I give the word, we'll rush them, just in case there may be more than two in there. Whatever you say, Nick. Easy now. Right. Get your hands up, all of you. What is it? Oh, oh, nice shooting, Nick. He should have known better than to pull a gun on you. All right, you get up. Get some to your wrists, that's hurt. Come on, get up. Now drop your guns on the floor. Come on, let's have them. Now then. What have you crooks done with my assistant, Patsy? 
You heard what I said. What have you done with her? We don't know nothing about her. No? Well, maybe you don't know it, mister, but when I get mad, I can be dirty and mean, and somebody gets hurt. Now, where is she? I tell you, we don't know anything. Butler! Butler! It's Winslow again. Penny, keep your gun on these two. If they open their mouths, let them have it and shoot to kill. Butler, why don't you answer me? Pardon, senor. We are having a conference. We did not expect you until later. You are coming in here? I just wanted to tell you that I don't expect to be... Put him up, Mr. Winslow. I'll do the telling from now on. Why, what's the meaning of this, Mr. Carter? You can't... Shut up. Where's Patsy? Where's who? You heard me. What have you done with my assistant, Patsy Bone? I don't know anything about... Where is she? No, don't. Where is she? Don't. You'll break my arm. Stop. For the last time, where is she? Oh, stop it. Stop it. I'll tell you. Oh, my arm. Well? She's upstairs. Second floor back bedroom. Door locked, I suppose. Oh, I'll get her, Nick. I took the butler's keys away from him. Good boy, Penny. Make it snappy. I'll watch these two for a nickel thugs. Yeah, whatever you say, Nick. All right, Winslow. Get over against the wall with the rest of your cheap bums. And if you've hurt one single hair on Patsy's head, you'll be lucky if you live long enough for me to turn you over to the police. She's all right. We did nothing to her at all. Lucky for you. Tell me, Winslow, why'd you throw Evans off the ferry boat? Wouldn't it have been easier to have kidnapped him someplace else? I had the ferries watched for several days. And found at the time of night, in the bitter cold weather we've been having, the rear deck of the ferry is almost always deserted. So we planned it that way. We had other plans ready in case that didn't work out. Oh, Nick, am I glad to see you. Oh, Patsy, are you all right? Uh, Anybody hurt you? No, Nick. They were a little rough, but they got as good as they gave me. Look at that black eye on the guy on the left. Good for you, Patsy. Ah, hey, Nick, after I got Patsy loose, I looked in some of the other rooms and I found this dame in the front room up there. Say she's Marion Blake. My name is Marion Blake. You're not Marion Blake. You're Alice Evans. No. No, I'm not Alice Evans. I'm Marion Blake. Aren't you saying that you're Marion Blake because you're afraid the gang will hurt your father if you admit you are really Alice Evans? What? Well, you're quite safe now, Miss Evans. Oh, Mr. Evans. Yes? Will you come in here, please? Why, yes, Mr. Carter. My father here? And free? Yes, Miss Evans. Here he is. Oh, oh Alice, Alice, my dear. Oh, I'd be oh, Penny, so worried about you. Penny, you better go get Riley. Oh, you You'll find him waiting just around the corner. He can uh, take over now. Uh, tell me where you were, uh, Mr. Carter. I can never thank you enough for what you've done. We owe you our lives, Alice and I. You don't owe me anything, Mr. Evans. Getting rats like these out of circulation gives me more satisfaction than anything else ever could. This is her room. You two wait here till I call you. Come in. Good morning, Miss Evans. Oh, good morning, Mr. Carter. Have you discovered anything about my father? I was about to ask you the same question. Have you heard from him? No, Mr. Carter. Nothing. Well, let me be the first to bring you the good news. Good news? Yes. Your father has been found. He... He's been found? Yes. He was kidnapped and imprisoned by some crooks who were trying to steal his fortune. Oh, my poor father. Where was he found? In a basement room where the gang was keeping him prisoner. Has he... Has he told you what happened to him? Oh, yes. He told us everything. Everything? Oh, by the way, Miss Evans, I brought a friend with me this morning. I thought you might like to meet her. May I ask her in? Yes. Yes, of course. Ellen! Will you bring the young lady in? Okay, Nick. <gasps> Do you recognize this young lady, Miss Evans? All right, Mr. Carter. You can drop that Miss Evans stuff now. I see you know the whole story. Practically the whole story, yes. Oh, Alice, have you met the real Marion Blake? No, I haven't. My goodness, she does look like me, doesn't she? Yes, but she didn't fool me, dear. No, I suppose I was crazy to believe that I could fool a man who was as much in love with you as he is, Miss Evans. Resemblance is certainly close enough to fool almost anyone else, though. Why, she even sounds like me. Miss Blake, whose idea was it to substitute you for Alice Evans? My husband's. He was the head of a Chicago gang. Saw a picture in the paper, and the idea came to him. Her coming back from South America seemed to be the ideal setup for carrying out the scheme, so we came east to do it. We knew Winslow from a couple of jobs we did from Chicago. Didn't it occur to your husband that when you threw my father off the ferry, he might get pneumonia in the icy water and die? We didn't worry about that. 
We knew he'd live long enough for what we wanted. Why, you cold blooded Alice, Alice, take it easy. But did you hear what she... That's all over with, dear. The police will take care of her now. I'm not usually bloodthirsty, but I hope she gets the electric chair. Well, the chair is hardly the sentence for attempted extortion, Alice. But by the time she gets out of jail, she'll no longer be young and pretty. And with the marks that prison will leave on her, she'll never again be able to double for you. This was another strange experience of Nick Carter, Master Detective, called The Substitute Bride or Nick Carter in the Mystery of the Night Ferry. Another of the curious adventures of Nick Carter, which are brought to you regularly at this time by WOR Mutual. And now, Nick, what strange adventure are you and Patsy going to tell us about next week? Next week, I want to tell you about a case that never seemed to be twice the same. What do you mean by that, Nick? Well, what Nick means is this. The case started out as a suicide... Turned into a murder and then disappeared entirely. And I disappeared with it. Well, all this sounds very screwy to me. Are you sure you're talking about next week's story? Nothing else but. But I'm afraid that if you want any more details, you'll have to listen to the story itself. And if you're wise, you won't miss it. It's one of our best. That it is. But for now, so long, folks. So long. And so long to you both until next week. In the strange adventure you have just heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark... Patsy by Helen Choate. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was written and directed by Jock McGregor. Next week, at the same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter entitled... The Disappearing Corpse. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Apartment House Murder. This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. The Return of Nick Carter is produced in the studios of WOR and is broadcast over most of these stations every Wednesday evening at 8.30 Eastern War Time. This is Mutual. It's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure, a special Christmas story. Nick Carter's Christmas Adventure. Or the mystery of the reluctant contributor. We've been pretty lucky so far, haven't we? Yes, Guppy, we have. Which is another way of saying that folks are usually willing to contribute to your settlement house Christmas party every year, Nick. You know, Scuffy, I was just thinking about this last name on our list. Yeah? Rasper. I don't know him personally. Do you? No, I don't, but somebody must have thought he was rich enough or interested enough in the work to make a substantial contribution. Oh, here's the... Hey, is this... Hey, Nick, what's that address again? 576 Milton Avenue. Yeah. Yes, that's right. And there's his name on the door plate. Well, let's take a look, Scubby. Well, gosh, this doesn't make sense, Nick. A guy with dough doesn't hide away in a place like this. Well, knock on the door anyhow. Doesn't seem to be anybody here, Nick. No, hold it, Scubby. I hear someone coming. Oh. Who is it? I'm Nicholas Carter. May I speak to Mr. Rasper, please? Nick Carter, eh? Yes, yes. And this is my assistant, Scubby Wilson. How do you do? Uh, you, Mr. Rasper? Yes. Well, come in, come in. It's cold out there. You're letting all the heat out. Oh, beg your pardon. Come on, Scubby. Yeah. I'm in, Nick. I'm in. Well, what was it you wanted? 
Well, Mr. Rasper, I've come to see if you would care to make a contribution to my Christmas party fund. I never make contributions. Oh, but you didn't let Nick finish, sir. The fund provides food and extra clothing for the needy and deserving the children. The charity department's still working, isn't it? Well, of course, Mr. Rasper, but my object is to provide an inspiration for the young people who are underprivileged. People who haven't got any money are always trying to get it from those who have. Then you aren't interested in seeing that the children of the Lincoln Hall District are helped to a little happiness on Christmas Day? No, I'm not. Christmas is old-fashioned. I don't believe in it. It's a waste of money and time. Good day. Oh, well, Mr. Rasper, it's always been a lot of fun for me personally. And I must say that I've always felt better for celebrating it. And I'm inclined to agree with Scubby, Mr. Rasper. Christmas has always been a bright spot in my life. And I feel sure that if you knew the good it has done throughout the world, it'd make you change your mind. Rubbish. Well... In any case, a Merry Christmas to you. Good day to you. Merry Christmas, indeed. It's a lot of nonsense. Come on, Nick. Let's get back to civilization. You know, Scuppy, that man's wealthy. No doubt about that. And yet he's soured on Christmas. And everything that it stands for. <laughs> you said our mouthful, Nick. You know, Scuppy, there must be reason why he thinks that way. And I'd like to find out what it is. Yeah, but you haven't anything to work on, Nick. Oh, no, Scuppy, I haven't. Not yet. But look here. I can finish up whatever has to be done this afternoon. Suppose you hop down to the newspaper office and go yeah. through the files there. There might just be something we could learn about Rasper that way. Okay, Nick, I'll be glad to. Then I'll have Riley check through the files at headquarters. It's a long shot, but something might turn up. Sure, and maybe Patsy has run into something while she's been working down at the settlement house. She might know somebody who knows something about Rasper. Yeah, she might have that. I'll ask her about it. Okay. And maybe with all of us working together on it, we may learn why Rasper's so dead set against Christmas. I'd certainly like to find out. Is that you, Nick? Uh, Riley talking. And I've been through my files here, and I can't find anything charged against a man named Ben Rasper. Oh, he, he was licensed to do business with a man named Howard Lowe, but Lowe died some years ago. Otherwise, Rasper is just a successful businessman. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I'll tell you what, though, Nick. There's an old fellow named Fred Anderson who used to be on the force who knows Rasper. For sure. Uh, you can find him at uh, Lincoln Hall, where you're giving the party. Uh, he, he's the watchman there now. Okay, Nick, that's all right. Uh, see you tomorrow. Uh, hello, hello. Oh, yes, Scubby? Oh, you did, huh? Sports promoter, huh? Well, well. What was that name again? Chris Baum. Why, yes, yes, I recall. Oh, no, I'll be there in about an hour, so I want to call Patsy first. Right. And thanks, Scubby. Bye. Ah, jingle bell, jingle bell, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a horse open sleigh. Jingle bell, jingle bell, jingle all the way. Oh, what... Hey, Patsy? How's everything, huh? Oh, fine. I'm coming down to the hall. Is there anything you want me to bring along? Uh-huh. Why, sure, I can do that. But will that be enough, though? Okay. Yeah, yeah, Scubby just called. Oh, he found out something about Rasper. What? You did, too. How old is he? Named Jimmy, huh? And he's coming to our party? Oh, fine, fine, Patsy. Okay, I'll see you in a little while. Bye. Oh, that's fine. We've collected enough to do this year's party upright. Now let's get organized. Riley, yeah? your job will be to get the kids and the needy persons rounded up. Oh, sure, Nick. I'll take care of it. I got your list and the list from the social worker and from the church down there. And there are plenty of others who'll need a lift this year, believe me. I know it, Riley, and I'll depend on you. Scubby, it's your job to see that the tree and decorations and gifts are taken care of. Don't worry, Nick. Decorating is my middle name. I'll make Lincoln Hall look like a million dollars in cash. <laughs> <laughs> good boy, good boy. And Patsy, mm -hmm. you'll see to it that there's plenty to eat and drink for the party, so I won't have to worry about that. I'll take care of the bills, and you have the letters of credit the stores gave us. You know how to do that. Sure thing, Nick. Good. I've been through it with you often enough before. I ought to know what you want by this time. Uh, hey, well, what are you going to be doing, Nick? Me? Well, Riley, I'm going to do a little detecting. I'm going to look into those tips you, Patsy, and Scubby gave me about those people who know Ben Rasper. And by the time I'm through, I hope to find out why it is that he hates Christmas the way he does. And then, well, then, maybe I'll be able to do something about it. This is 
Brass for talking. Yes? I sent you the bell, didn't I? Well, what if it is due on the 27th? No, just because it's a holiday, there's no tell reason for bills to be unpaid. Ah, goodbye. Darn fool nonsense, that's what it is. It's a lot of foolish... Still talking big, ain't you, Rasper? Well, who's that? What do you want? Don't you remember me, Rasper? No, I don't remember you. Who are you? They used to call me the kid. Chris the Kid. Chris? Sometimes known as the human flesh. Chris, you? Well, well it's been a long time, Rasper, hasn't it? How'd you find me? Who sent you here? A fellow named Nick Carter told me I'd find you here in your office, even if it is Christmas Eve. Nick Carter? Oh, yes. Wanted me to give him some money for some fool party. Oh, for the party at Lincoln Hall, I guess. Ace never asked me for anything. Just gave me what I needed, when I needed it. Yeah. so he hired you to come here and take up my no, time to no, get... No, he didn't send me here. Just said I'd find you here, that's all. I, I came here on my own accord to... Just to wish you a Merry Christmas. Ha! Thought you'd say that. Well, I don't mind. Because it's on account of Nick Carter that I can stand on my own feet again. Not on account of you. What's that? You mind if I uh, sit down? Yeah, it was on Christmas Eve that we won our first fight, wasn't it? Fight? Oh, yeah. A long time ago. Yeah, it was a long time ago. I can remember the noise of the crowd, the glare of the lights, and the smoke curling around, and the brightness over the ring... And you leaning over me with that wet towel. You got him going, Chris. Another one like that last round, and you'll have him in the ropes for the count. How do you feel now, kid? I'm okay, Rasper. Just let me at him. I don't have to wait anymore. It's my meat right now. now you take your orders from me, kid. Yeah. I'm the brains here. When you get the signal from me, you give it to him. Okay, Rasper. You're the boss. Go ahead, kid. Keep that left up. Keep your shoulder high. little affairs after that, Rasper. And I always did what I was told, huh? Yes. You're a good fighter, Chris. Good fighter. I made a lot of money for us in those fights, Rasper. Well, a lot of money. the old days, Chris. Lots of water's gone under lots of bridges since then. I know. And the percentage you paid me didn't last long, either. It went just like that water. But I didn't care much about things like that. Till the day a friend of mine came and gave me a warning tip. That started me thinking. Hello, kid. How do you feel? Oh, hello, Rasper. Where you been? I wanted to talk to you. Oh, I've been around. What's up? I got a tip today. That you're signing up Timmy O'Day. You're going to manage him. Who Instead told you that? Never mind. Is it true? That depends. Depends on what? Look, kid, you're getting slow. O'Day's fresh. He'll be the next champ. If he wins this fight with you tonight, I'm taking him over. And if I win tonight? I'm taking O'Day over anyhow. We've been together a long time, kid, and it don't pay to get in too much of a rut. So that's all it means to you, is it? Money. The payoff, huh? What about all the years we've known each other? What about the things we've been through? Why, you No, know... don't get yourself all in a sweat, kid. It isn't good for you. You'll get your cut anyway. Don't worry. You'll get your cut. I'll see you later. Rasper, what do I do? Tell me what to do. I can't see him. My eyes all puffed up. He's cutting me to ribbons. Tell me what to do, Rasper. <laughs> Don't bother me, kid. Use your own judgment. You're on your own, as of now. But, Rasper, you always... You're on your own, kid. I can still see you sitting there in the ring corner, laughing at me. But that was the last thing I saw for a long time. Old day saw to that. You must have coached him pretty thorough about my style. And then you really cashed in. Well, I haven't got much myself, but I'm still able to wish you a Merry Christmas, Rasper. Although I don't think you'll ever have one. Chris, I... Well, I've got some things to do, Rasper. Carter asked me to pick up some things for the party at Lincoln Hall tomorrow. We always have a swell time at Carter's Christmas parties. Too bad you can't enjoy anything like that anymore. Well, as I said before, Rasper, Merry Christmas. <laughs> How can a man work with his mind whirling like a merry-go-round Christmas Eve? God, 
God, it's a fine excuse for people to go around yelling at each other in the streets. Disturbing a man when he wants to get some work done. Oh, I might as well close the office and get some rest. Would have been home by now if the kid, if Chris, hadn't taken up so much time. What Chris does for a living now? Wonder if... Ah, it's none of my concern. Get home and get some sleep. That's what I need. Uh, who's that? I'm closing up. Come back tomorrow morning. Oh, I'm glad I got here before you left, Ben. Uh, who is it? It's Nina, Ben. Oh, Nina. I only stopped by to speak to you for a moment. It's getting quite late and uh, I... Uh... Well, sit down for a moment, Nina. Oh, thank here, you. Let me get your chair. I, uh... I suppose it's rather bold of me to come after all this time, but I... Why, no, Nina, no. I, I'm glad you did. Is there something you want? Oh, no. No, there's nothing you can do for me, Ben. Jimmy and I are doing very nicely. I just wanted to wish you a Merry Christmas. I was in the neighborhood doing some shopping for the party that Mr. Carter's giving at Lincoln Hall tomorrow, and How I... is he, Nina? Uh, Jimmy, I mean. Oh, he's fine, Ben. He's full of life and interested in everything. He has a good head on his shoulders, and he's very handsome, too. Oh, that's fine. Just fine. Uh, you're looking a little tired, Ben. Are you feeling well? Oh, uh, yes, yes, of course. I've, I've been working hard, that's all. I don't spend much time at home. Uh, not much reason to. Hmm. That's the way you wanted it, Ben. Don't you remember? Nina, Nina, where are you? Oh, Jimmy, there's Daddy. Now wait here for Mommy like a good boy, won't you? Um, I I'm coming, Ben. I've been keeping your dinner warm for you. I, I hope you'll... What's the matter, Ben? You look as if That's you... nothing, Nina, nothing. I'm in a hurry, that's all. Oh, you're always in a hurry, aren't you? Never have time for... Where's my dinner? Sit down, Ben. I'll... I'll have it for you right away. <sighs> This plate is hot now. Be careful that you don't burn yourself. I won't. Salt, please. Here you are, dear. Ben, when you're finished, won't you take time enough out of your business to help me get the tree decorated? I know Jimmy's too young to know much about it, but I'd love to have his Christmas all ready for him in the morning. Look, I'll, I'll put him to sleep right away, and then we can start. See, I have some holly and mistletoe for the fireplace, and, and, and some... I won't have time for that, that Nina. But, Ben, it's Christmas Eve. Surely you have I have to get back to the office. I'm putting on a championship match for O'Day in January, and the things have gone haywire. Something that can't wait till tomorrow. I oh, have to get it organized right away, that's all. Ben, this is Christmas Eve. Tomorrow will be Jimmy's first Christmas. Doesn't that mean anything to you? You and Jimmy celebrate Christmas any way you want to, Nina. I have something more important to do. Business is more important than sentiment. You certainly can see that. Yes, Ben. I can see that. I've been seeing it more and more during the last few years. I thought that when Jimmy came, maybe you were... No, I was wrong, wasn't I, Ben? You'd even let your love for business break up our home. Break up our... Oh, don't be melodramatic, Nina. I'm not being melodramatic, Ben. I'm... I'm trying to be very calm and quiet about it. I've had a lot of time to think when I've sat alone here night after night. And those days on end when you've been away, attending to your business... And what has come out of all this thinking you've done? Just this, Ben. I'm not going on any longer. Either you belong to your family, or your family will get along without you. I have to rush, Nina. Uh, good night. Good night, good night, Ben. It's good... Goodbye. Jimmy and I are leaving tonight. Look, I haven't time to talk about it with you now, Lena. Uh, oh, uh, by the way, this will probably take most of the night. Good night. Goodbye, Ben, and... Merry Christmas. <laughs> I never had much of a chance to make it up to you, Lena. You've had all the chance you wanted, Ben. But, Nina, I... I just dropped by to say hello and to give you a wish for happiness during the holidays. It's hard not to share with you the joy I have with Jimmy. I, I wish you could see his eyes dance at Mr. Carter's Christmas parties. 
Unfortunately, on what little I make, we can't very well afford to have our Christmas at home, but somehow we don't miss it. Everybody has such a grand time at Mr. Carter's party, and Jimmy does enjoy every minute that he's there. Goodness, I'll have to be on my way. Jimmy's waiting for me, and I have to make one more stop for Mr. Carter. Good night, Ben, and Merry Christmas. Carter, this stuff doesn't taste like anything. Nothing at all. I can't understand what's got into me. It's good food, fixed the same as it always is. It just doesn't taste right, that's all. What's that? Someone at the door this time of the night? I'm coming, I'm coming. Hello, Ben. It's Fred Anderson. Uh, glad I found you at home. I'm always at home this time of night. Yes, yes, I suppose you are, Ben. Uh, can I come in? Of course. I uh, brought your package, Ben. Nick Carter sent me around with it. Said you'd probably be here alone tomorrow and he'd like you to have it. Carter? What's Carter sending me? You might open it and see, Ben. I'm no mind reader. <laughs> mm. Can't see any reason why Carter had one of... Hmm. What of port wine? Let me see the card. Merry Christmas from Nick Carter. What's the idea? You know anything about this, Fred? No, but uh, Nick Carter's a funny duck. Does lots of things people don't expect him to. Why, I don't even know the man. Only saw him once and then... Um, you want a glass of this wine, Fred? <laughs> don't mind if I do, Ben. Seems it's Christmas Eve. I don't mind at all. There's some glasses here somewhere. Say, how do you open this thing? Here, I'll do it for you, Ben. Yeah, that does it. Well, go ahead, you open it. Eh? Oh, yes, all right. Well, I think you're drinking with me, Ben. Huh? Oh. Yes, I will. That's a ticket. <laughs> well, here's Merry Christmas for you, Ben. Mm. Yes, sir. Merry Christmas. Well, how well, have you been keeping yourself, Fred? Oh, I've been sort of working around Lincoln Hall since I was retired from the force. I see. You know, while I was coming here tonight, I was thinking about those old days when I walked a beat. Funny, most folks call them the good old days, but I don't. You did all right in those times, didn't you? Oh, sure, I got along. I was just thinking about the different attitudes folks have nowadays toward being given a hand. They appreciate it more, it seems to me. Charity's still charity, Fred. That hasn't changed. I uh, guess it's all in the point of view, Ben. I guess you haven't changed with the times. That night I met you near the bridge. I was sure you were going to see that you were headed in the wrong direction and wake up in time. Huh? Remember that night, Ben? It was Christmas Eve. You'd just come from the arena. They'd handed you your walking papers because you'd let them down cold. Merry Christmas, officer. Oh, well, Merry Christmas to you, sir. Well, uh, uh, what are you doing out on a night like this, Ben? I thought you'd be up at the arena getting the New Year's fights lined up. What? Oh, it's you, Anderson. No, I'm not at the arena anymore. That's so. What happened? Uh, they decided tonight they'd rather have Davis take over my job. Fine Christmas present, that is. Well, uh, that's tough news, Ben. What are you going to do now? I don't know. I can't seem to think straight. Oh, that's a crazy way for a man like you to talk. On a Christmas Eve, too? <laughs> Christmas Eve. That's never been anything but a jinx to me. First I get stuck with that no-good fighter all day. Then Nina leaves me and takes my son with her. And now Irina throws me out. Well, uh, maybe you better stop and find out what it is you're doing wrong, Ben. Maybe you're the one that's to blame, not Christmas Eve. Uh, they all take advantage of me. I made all the money I could for them, but I'm not going to do it anymore. Oh, take it easy, Ben. Take it easy. You better go home and think it over. I have thought it over, Fred, and I know what the answer is. I'm going to make money for myself and nobody else. I'll show these people. I'll make so much money they'll come crawling to me on their knees. I won't have to ask for anybody's sympathy. You don't pay to think like that, Ben. You'll regret it. Now, look. I know that Bill Boynton, who runs the shoe store down on Elm Street, is looking for a man to buy in with him. Why don't Me? You... Work in a shoe store? Not in your life, Fred. I'm going after the big money. Big money! That's the only thing people understand, and I'm going to get it. Well, now you've got it, Ben. You're one of the richest men in town. And what's it got you? Why, I don't know. 
Ben, it's too bad you don't get around and see what nice people there are in the world. People like this Carter fellow, for instance. Uh, does a man good to know people like him? Makes you feel there really is a Santa Claus to see him bring the smiles to the kids' faces at those parties he gives down at Lincoln Hall. Oh, well, I'll be getting back there now, Ben. I've got a big day tomorrow. I'm not as young as I used to be. <laughs> well, Merry Christmas to you, Ben. I'll tell Nina I saw you. She'll be at the party tomorrow with young Jimmy. Good night, Ben. <laughs> Patsy, how's it going? Oh, Nick, it's wonderful. Oh. They're having a grand time. Oh, that's fine, Patsy. Hey, Patsy, look. Hmm? Over there by the door. What do you see? Where, Nick? Uh, well, who's that? That, Patsy, is Ben Rasper. Oh, I hope he's come to join the party. For heaven's sake, because that's the man I've heard so much about. Well, he looks scared to death, Nick. Look, Patsy, will you go over and make him welcome? Oh, of course, Nick. Good. Hello there. Merry Christmas. I'm Patsy Bowen. Oh. Won't you join us? How do you do? I hope I'm not... Do you mind if I just watch? Well, of course not. Come right in. I wanted to thank Mr. Carter for the gift he sent, and I... Nick's right over there near the tree. Come along. Uh, children seem to be enjoying themselves, don't they? <laughs> they certainly do. There's Lieutenant Riley handing out the gifts there. And Scotty Wilson with him, standing next to Mr. Carter. Uh, yes, I met Mr. Wilson. Just look at Lieutenant Riley. He's having as much fun as the children. <laughs> so I see. Oh, there's a nice-looking boy there, Miss... Uh, who... I mean, what's his name? Where? Oh, that one over there. Oh, that's Jimmy. He's a nice boy. His mother was a big help to me in getting the refreshments ready. There she is over there on the far side of the hall with the table, see? Oh, yes. Her son. Yes. Yes, Nick. I see. Oh, Nick, we have a new guest. Oh, hello there, Mr. Rasper. Merry Christmas. I'm glad you could join us. Uh, thank you, Mr. Carter. I, I came to express my appreciation for the gift you sent me. I, I hardly know I'll how to... Make nothing of it, Mr. Rasper. Your being here is thanks enough for me. Mr. Carter, uh, that little boy coming along the line there, Jimmy, I think his name is, do you think I, I might give him... I mean, could I hand him his gift, do you think? Why, certainly. Riley! Oh, yeah. Mr. Rasper here wants to lend a hand. Can you use him? Why, sure thing, Nick. Come along, Mr. Rasper. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Go Carter. Ahead. Well, you just hand them these packages as they come along, Mr. Rasper, <laughs> and enjoy yourself, man. <laughs> I will. Uh, there, little girl. Uh, Merry Christmas. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Say, she, she liked it, didn't she? Well, they all appreciate a little kindness, Mr. Rasper. Now, now, here's a gift for that little boy there. Oh. Hello. Jimmy? Here you are. And a Merry Christmas. Son. Oh, well, that was the day for you. Gosh, I haven't had so much fun since last year. You played those <laughs> games harder than any two kids in the bunch, Scubby. <laughs> yeah, and lost practically every time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Well, you really have to be in condition to keep up with these kids. Boy, they're wonders. Hey, where do they get all that energy? That will be one of the world's great mysteries forever, Scubby. Nick, what are you thinking so hard about? Hmm? Oh, I was uh, I was just thinking of the way Mr. Rasper took to the party. Oh? Hey, don't you mean the way the party took to Mr. Rasper, Nick? Yeah, I never saw a man open up the way he did. Well, it was wonderful. The children just flocked around him. And that's one of the greatest jobs that Nick Carter ever did. Well, what do you mean, Riley? Well, Patsy, you'll never believe it, but when Nick and I went to see Rasper to get a contribution to the party... He was the hardest case of unadulterated unpleasantness I ever saw. But somehow Nick managed to get under his skin and bring out, well, what she saw tonight. Well, for heaven's sake. How did you do it, Nick? Well, it wasn't difficult, Patsy. You see, I could see when we first spoke to Rasper that he was fighting something. But I didn't know what it was. But from what Riley, Scubby, and you told me, I found that three different times Christmas Eve had brought him bad luck. 
First the fighter O'Day, then Mrs. Rasper had left Rasper on a Christmas Eve, taking his son Jimmy with her, and third, he'd lost his promoter's connection at the arena, also on Christmas Eve. Well, the whole thing added up. Rasper associated Christmas Eve with a list of unfortunate incidents and fought anything that suggested the holidays to him. He made a lot of money, but it never brought him happiness. The big thing for me was to make him realize that people and Christmas meant good and not evil. And from what I saw this afternoon, the Rasper family and the whole neighborhood, for that matter, is going to benefit by his awakening to that realization. Oh, Nick, that's wonderful. You deserve a kiss for that. Oh, thanks, Bessie. I'm glad you feel that way, too. You know, I'm happier this evening because of Mr. Rasper than I would be if I'd solved 20 murders. He's made this a really merry Christmas for all of us. has been another of the strange adventures of Nick Carter, Master Detective, which are brought to you regularly at this time by WOR Mutual. What's your story going to be about next time, Nick? It's a little different from the usual story, because it started out with Nick himself being the victim of a holdup. Yes, and the men who held me up turned out to be innocent after all. Sounds a trifle complicated to me. It was complicated, but interesting. And it gave me plenty of trouble before I found the solution. Including a sore throat that almost finished Nick Carter. A sore throat? Why should that be dangerous? Because it was the kind that you get from a rope around your neck. Hey, wait a minute. You mean... All the rest of the story you get two weeks from tonight, not now. So long, everybody. So long. So long, both of you. In the strange adventure you have just heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark, Patsy by Helen Choate, and Scubby by John Kane. The story was written for Nick Carter by Humphrey Davis. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was under the direction of Jock McGregor. Two weeks from tonight, at the same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter entitled The Double Disguise, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Kidnapped Heiress. This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. The Return of Nick Carter is produced in the studios of WOR and is broadcast over most of these stations Monday evenings at 9.30 Eastern Wartime. This is Mutual. Is Mutual. Is Mutual. another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure, The Double Disguise, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Kidnapped Heiress. Uh, Pardon me. Could you tell me which way to Bond Avenue, please? Bond Avenue? Why, yes. Uh, we'll just walk three blocks okay, straight Mr. ahead. Okay, mister. There's a stick-up. What? Yeah. Hand it over and, uh, and be quick about it. And what over? Your wallet, of course. Come on. Oh, come now. Isn't it quite late in the evening for this sort of thing? There's nothing funny about this. I mean business. You haven't been in the business very long, have you? That's enough talk. Just hand it over. Hand it over, I'll, I'll shoot. You really would shoot me, would you? Yes. This is your last chance. Please, I I don't want to have to kill you. Okay. But you won't find very much. All right, I'll take that toy pistol now. There. Oh. Oh. You knew all the while. Sure. Would have fooled most people, but you just happened to pick on the wrong man. I'm Nick Carter. Nick Carter? Gosh, I guess I did. My name is Brown. 
Chester Brown. Well, Mr. Brown, let's have it. What's the story? You're no gunman. Oh, you're right, Mr. Carter. I, I've never done this sort of thing before. Now, why'd you try to hold me up, then? Oh, I, I, I was desperate. I, I've been out of work for three months now. In times like these? Yes, I know, but I'm a salesman. There's no need for them now. Well, how about manual work? I tried that, but my heart isn't very strong. Oh, I see. Married? Yes, I was married six months ago. Where do you live? I live in a couple of rooms in a boarding house. Only a few blocks from here, Mr. Carter. Why do you ask? I'd like to go home with you and meet your wife. Oh, that means you aren't going to turn me over to the police. No, not yet at least. Oh, thanks. But one never knows, Mr. Brown. Let's go. Right this way, Mr. Carter. Stella! Oh, Stella! Stella! That's strange. She isn't home. Maybe she went out for a while. At this time of night? She'd be back by now. What does it mean? Well, it probably doesn't mean... Oh, well, wait a minute. Here's a note. Perhaps this will explain things. Here, let me have it. Dear Chet, I'll be gone for a few days. Don't worry about me. All our troubles will soon be over. We're coming into a fortune. I can't explain anymore now. You're Stella. Well, congratulations. Ah, look what's enclosed. Hmm, a hundred dollar bill. May I see it, please? Oh, here you are. Gosh, I can't believe it. It's too good to be true. Tell me, Mr. Brown, is your wife any rich relatives? Rich relatives? Never heard her speak of any. Mother and father no longer living. Well, she has uh, an uncle. A man by the name of James Spear. He lives somewhere out in Colorado. M maybe it's he. Yes, maybe. What are you doing, Mr. Carter? Just checking the number on this bill against the list I have here. Why? Ah, what is it? Mr. Brown, I'm afraid my congratulations were a bit premature. What do you mean? Have you read the evening paper? No, uh... I haven't seen a paper all day. Why? Michael Steelfield, the banker, was murdered last night. $10,000 was stolen from his private vault in one of the cleverest safe-cracking jobs seen here in years. Yeah. What's that got to do with this? The stolen money consisted of $100 bills. So what? The bill your wife left for you was one of those stolen by the murderer. Oh, but Mr. Carter, she, she had nothing to do with that. I feel sure of that, Mr. Brown. Well, then why should you want to... Suppose you went out tomorrow morning and tried to spend that bill. What would have happened? Why, I... Oh. Oh, I see. I'd have probably been arrested as a murderer. Exactly. But why did she leave that bill for me? Because she's as much a victim of this frame-up as you are. Brown, if my hunch is correct, someone's trying to make trouble for you and for her. Oh, but Mr. Carter, why, why, look, why Brown, should... Don't ask questions yet. Just listen to me. Pack up a bag and get out of here tonight. Go to 73 Bleecker Avenue. That's a rooming house run by friends of mine on the other side of town. Sit tight until you hear from me. Don't tell anyone where you are and don't use your right name. But... Suppose my wife comes back. I said to leave it all in my hands. Oh, but why Now, don't I... be a fool. If you don't follow my directions, you may be dead before morning. So you don't think either Brown or his wife had anything to do with the murder, Nick? No, Patsy, I don't. It's too obvious a frame-up. A frame-up? Yes, don't you see? The murderer persuades Mrs. Brown to go somewhere with him on some pretext or other and gives her one of the stolen bills to leave for her husband, who's sure to be arrested if he tries to spend it. But why should the murderer want to pin the job on Mr. Brown? That I don't know the answer to, Patsy. Except that for some reason or other, he wants to get Brown out of the way. Hello? Hello, Nick. I'm glad I found you in. Oh, Riley, what is it? You still say you're not interested in this Tillfield killing? Well, as a matter of fact, Riley, something's happened since you spoke to me about it. I've changed my mind. Oh, so you've heard already. Heard? What? About the big Postal Express robbery down on Front Street. That's where I'm calling from. I know. That's news to me. What do they get, Riley? $40,000 in negotiable bonds. Right out of the vault, Nick. Not bad. Yes, and this is the interesting part. Yeah? Do you know who those bonds were being shipped to? Michael uh, Stillfield. Stillfield? Okay, Riley, thanks. I'll be right down. Well, Patsy, this thing gets more interesting by the minute. Let's go. Ah, 
Uh, here you are, Nick. Uh, hello, Patsy. Hello, Lieutenant. Well, Riley, let's have a look. Sure thing, Nick. Come on inside. Now, uh, this is Mr. Johnson, Nick. He's in charge of the express office. How do you do? So glad you came, Mr. Carter. Nothing like this has happened in the 30 years I've been with the company. Well, I suppose there's always a first time, Mr. Johnson. Uh, that's the vault over there, Mr. Carter. No, thanks. Hmm. Certainly don't come any finer. That's true, Mr. Carter. Absolutely burglar-proof. <laughs> or so we thought. Was anything else taken? No, just the bonds. And they're as good as cash, you know. When did you discover that they were missing? This morning. They were put in that vault last night. I watched the bookkeeper do it myself. I see. And you were the one who closed the vaults? That's right. I closed it and adjusted the time mechanism myself. Well, seems to be intact. That's just it, Mr. Carter. I can't understand it. Neither the vault lock nor the time attachment have been tampered with. It looks like the devil's own work. It's absolutely incredible, Mr. Carter. But there you have it. The safe was open and the bonds are gone. Well, what do you make of it, Nick? There aren't many men who could have pulled off this kind of a job. Oh, you're right there, Nick. As a matter of fact, I don't know anybody but Nick Carter who could have done it. He's that handy with locks of all kinds. <laughs> <laughs> you have some idea, Mr. Carter? You say the bonds were put in the vault last night. Yes, that's right. About what time would you say? Well, we received them from the west on the five o'clock hey. train. Did you say from the west? Well, yes, they came from Colorado. And they were addressed to Michael Stillfield? That's right. And they were put in the vault a little after five. And as you already know, that's the last we were seen of them. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. I don't think we need bother you any further. I do hope you'll be able to track down that thief. It's more than a thief you've put me on the track of. The man we're looking for, Mr. Johnson, is a murderer. Is that stuff you were giving Johnson about looking for a murderer, Nick? That's exactly what I meant, Riley. You mean there's a connection between the murder of Michael Stillfield and this robbery, Nick? You catch on fast, Patsy. Well, how do you figure it, Nick? Well, in both cases, it was Stillfield's property that was stolen. And in both cases, there was a remarkable safe-cracking job, right? Yeah, there's no doubt about it. Looks like it could be the same ones, all right. And you recall where Johnson said those bonds came from? Yes, from Colorado, Nick. Well, sure, I remember his saying that, but... Uh, what's that got to do with it? Just a hunch, Riley. But judging by the way these two safes are broken into, I think I know who probably did it. Uh, who? Clint Bartow. Clint Bartow? Oh, 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 you'll have me believe in the, the dead come to life again, Nick. Why, don't you remember? He was reported dead five years ago up in Canada someplace. Yes, but where Clint Bartow's concerned, I don't have much faith in that kind of a report. He's the most dangerous and resourceful criminal on the continent. Riley, I wouldn't be surprised that he had that report circulated purposely. Well, no, I, I hadn't thought of it that way. Furthermore, I suggest you make a thorough check on the background of Michael Stillfield, the murdered banker. An idea that maybe some interesting facts turned up. Okay, Nick, it's as good as done. When you get the information... Wow. Well, what is it, Nick? We're being followed. Huh? Well, not for long we won't be. Now, just let no, me... No, wait a minute, wait a minute. I want to handle this my own way, Riley. You continue on the way you're going. Patsy uh -huh. and I'll turn up this side street. Okay, Nick. Uh, I'll be seeing you. So long. So long, Riley. All right, All right, Patsy, come along this way. He's still following me? Yeah. He's hanging on, all right. Uh -huh. Here. Into this doorway here. Okay. Now what? Well, just wait. He'll be along. Yeah, here he comes now. Stay here, Patsy. Be careful, Nick. Hey, you, what's the idea of following me? What? Who? Me? Yes, you. You've been tailing me ever since. Oh, no, you don't. Hey, hold it. Let go of me. Uh, I ain't done nothing, mister. No, not yet you have it. Now talk, my friend. And let's hear something interesting. Okay. I was tailing you. That's what I thought. What's your game? Oh, not my game. It was some bloke I met near the express office. Yes? What about this bloke? Well, he says there's a ten spot in it for me if I... Keep an eye on you all day. You know, see where you go and what you do. Well, then what? Well, that's all, mister. And I was supposed to report back tonight at 8 with a dope and, and get paid. I see. Where were you supposed to report back? Beach Street, opposite the railway station. What did this man look like? Oh, you can't miss him, mister. He's about six foot six. Dark hair and he has a long curved nose. 
Well, so he's the one. Oh, you know him, huh? Yes, I think I do. You were offered $10, you say? Here's 20 What for? For forgetting all about reporting back, see? Oh, I get it. Sure thing. Thanks. Wait a minute. Yeah? I want to get a good look at you. Huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, I shan't forget what you look like in a hurry. Now beat it, and remember, stay out of my way. Okay, mister. All right, Patsy, come on. What now, Nick? We're going back to the office. I've got a special job to do now that requires a complete change of wardrobe. In fact, Patsy, a complete change of everything. There, that does it. Hand me that mirror, will you, Patsy? Mm Mm-hmm. Here you are, Nick. Hmm, not bad. Well, Patsy, do you think I look like the man who was following us? Simply perfect, Nick. I positively couldn't tell the two of you apart now. Now the voice. Okay, lady, thanks. Well, I guess I better blow it. The mob's waiting for me. (laughs) (laughs) Nick. Yes, what is it, Patsy? I'm afraid of what you may be letting yourself in for. Oh, now, don't worry. I'll be watching my step. You better. Make one false move with Barto. Yes, Betsy. I know the kind of man I'm up against. Oh. Hello? Oh, yes, Riley. Oh, you did, huh? What'd you find? Mm hmm. I see. Yeah, well, that's fine, Riley. Oh, no, no, no. I've got a plan of my own. Yeah, I'll do that. All right, Riley. Thanks. Bye. Well, what is it, Nick? Patsy, my suspicions were right. The report came through on Michael Stillfield. He proves to be none other than James Spear. Spear? You mean Mrs. Brown's uncle? Right. Seems he made his money out west many years ago, then got into some difficulties there. Changed his name and came east. And he never got in touch with his niece? Apparently not. Well, then that fortune Mrs. Brown spoke about in her note is true. Yes. According to his will, she becomes sole heir to the entire estate, being his only surviving relative. Well, not bad. If she lives, Betsy. If she lives? Why shouldn't she live, Nick? Well, the person she left home with last night must be the same person who killed Stalefield. The $100 bill she left her husband proves that. And you think that... I think that if that person is Barto, she's in very real danger. Stalefield owned the fortune and was killed. Now Mrs. Brown owns it, and she may very well be next on the list. Yeah, I see what you mean. What time is it now, Betsy? Uh, 7.30. Okay, I better be off. I'm going to keep my 8 o'clock date. You will be careful, Nick. Yes, of course I will. You know what you're to do. Yes, I'll do just what you told me. Good. Well, so long, Patsy. I'll be seeing you. I hope so, Nick. I hope so. Now, eight o'clock. And this is the corner, all right. But nobody seems to be sure. Wait. Uh Uh-oh. You waiting for someone, bud? Yeah. I was supposed to meet a guy here at 8. Okay, I guess you're the one. Follow me. Where are we going? I'm taking you to the boss. Why's that? You'll find out. Come on. Here we are. Just a minute. It's me, boss. Is this the guy, boys? Yeah. Come in. Close the door, Malone. Yeah. Well, what'd you find out? I followed the guy like you said. Well? How about that ten spot you promised? Don't me? worry, you'll get it. Now, what happened? Nothing. What do you mean? I tailed the guy to a house on Elm Street. They went in, I didn't see him come out all day. Mm, I see. Well, okay, you did a good job. Here's the ten. Anything else, mister? I could use more dough, and I ain't particular how I make it, if you get what I mean. Yeah, I get what you mean. You see, I figure you must have some kind of a racket, mister. Mm-hmm. Very clever reasoning on your part. Yeah, I'd sort of like to get in on it. That is, if you could use a guy like me. Maybe I could. You, uh, you don't happen to know the name of that man you were following, do you? Never seen him before. Well, it was Nick Carter. Nick Carter? Mm-hmm. Who's he? Never heard of him, eh? Well, he's just about the greatest detective this side of the Atlantic. Hey, this Carter must be quite a guy. Quite a guy is right. With quite a bag of tricks. He's the one man that stood between me and a fortune on three different occasions. 
put you in the jug, huh? No, not quite. But on account of him, I've had to lay low the last five years. Now I've got another fortune within my grasp, and he's not going to stand in my way again. No, sir. I'll see to that. Yeah, worked out a scheme, huh? Yeah. Beautiful one. Beautiful and simple. <laughs> he's going to be hoist by his own petard. <laughs> Come again? One of his own great tricks is going to be his undoing. I don't get you. All right, Nick Carter. You can come out from under that trick voice now. Keep him covered, Malone. Yeah, right. Well, congratulations, Bartle. I was sure I had you fooled. It was a neat job, Carter. Your resemblance to Trigger is absolutely uncanny. Trigger? Yeah, one of my own men. Oh. It was all a frame, and you fell for it. Knowing you and your tricks, I figure that's exactly what you do. And now that I'm here... What do you propose to do? Something I should have done a long time ago. This is the end of the road for you, Carter. <laughs> Bartow, I think you're bluffing. Oh, you do. Yes, I do. Why'd you have to go to all this trouble? You could have had one of your men shoot me in the street. No, Carter, I had a special reason for wanting to bring you here alive. Yeah? What's that? I wanted to see the look on your face when I opened the door to this inner room and you saw this. What? Chester Brown. Yeah. And I assure you, he wouldn't be sleeping so peacefully if he knew what I was planning for him. And for you. Hey, you, wake up. Wake up. You've got company. Ah, you gave him too much of that dope, Malone. You might have killed him. So what, boss? Ain't that what you want? Yeah, but I want him to wait until Mr. Carter could keep him company. I want them to go out together. Come on, you. Wake up. What's all a... What's... You may not believe it, Brown, but this tough-looking thug is really our old friend, Nick Carter. Oh. Oh, so it's you, Mr. Carter. I thought I told you to hide away that address I gave you. I did. These guys found out where I was. Did you tell anybody where you were? No. No, nobody. I just gave my address to my old landlady so, so she could forward my mail. Oh. Right boy, isn't he, Carter? Well, now that I've got you both here together, I'm going to hang you both together. Trigger. Yeah, boss? Come in here. Help Malone tie this great detective up while I keep him covered. It'll be a pleasure, boss. Hello there, detective. And thanks again for that 20. Don't mention it. You want this other guy too, boss? Yeah, get him up on his feet. I want to watch him dance together. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, you. Come on up, sonny boy. And you. Okay, boss. All That's set. It. Did you frisk him? Yeah, he's clean. Here's his gun. All right, then. Mr. Carter, what are they going to do? Looks as if they mean to hang us. No! No! No, they can't, they can't do that! You can't. I, I haven't done it. You squeal like a stuck pig. Be like Carter. He isn't saying a word. I still don't believe you're going through with this, Bartow. No. Get Carter's rope over the rafter at this end. Put Brown's rope over the other end. No, right. no, no, no. Come on. Come on. No. There you are, boss. Good. Now a couple of chairs for him to stand on. Right. See here, Bartow. You have nothing to gain by murdering us in cold blood this way. You killed one man already. You've stolen $50,000. What more do you want? 50000 <laughs> That's pin money. Still feels it's worth $5 million. And what about it? That fortune's going to be mine. Every cent of it. And you're the only man that might stop me, so I'm taking no chances. I know you're clever, Bardo, but I can't see how you're going to get your hands on Steelfield's money now that he's dead. On the contrary, Carter. That's what makes it all so simple. Because it makes Mrs. Brown his sole heir. And Mrs. Brown has been led to believe, by something that I said but I'm a lawyer. And she's already turned over to me all the credentials necessary to claim her uncle's fortune. I'm sure my own wife will have no trouble at all convincing the real lawyers that she is Mrs. Brown. The real Mrs. Brown, poor woman, won't be with us very long, I'm afraid. Oh, you fiends, you devil! You have to... you. Oh. So that's your devilish scheme, is it? Yes, and it's a scheme that I'm sure is going to pay off. I don't think so, Bartow. What do you mean? You really don't think I was foolish enough to come up here without taking certain precautions. Such as what? The police know exactly where I am. I'm afraid the laugh's on you, Bartle. Yeah? Look out of the window, Trigger. Okay. I don't see nothing. Hey, wait. Say, there is a cop across the street. What's he doing? We're just stand there. Hey, maybe there's something to it, boss. Let's get this thing over with and beat it. Okay. Maybe what you said was so, Carter. It isn't going to help you much. Get them up in the chairs, boys. All right. Come on, Come up on. you go. Come on, up you go. Yeah, that's it. Are the ropes tied fast, Malone? Yeah, boss, both of them are okay. Well, goodbye, Mr. Brown and Mr. Carter. No, 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 oh, you can't! Oh, okay. Boss in the street. Kick the chairs away, boys. No, no, you can't! 
<laughs> dance, Carter, dance, dance. <laughs> All right, boys, let's get back to the hideaway. So that was his plan, Patsy. Yes, Lieutenant. I see. And if Nick didn't come out in a half an hour, we were to go in after him. And the time's just about... Oh, look, Lieutenant. Huh? What is it, Patsy? Those three men leaving the building. They're getting into that car. Yeah, and in an awful hurry, too. Come on, Patsy, let's go in. Nick! Nick, where are you? Nick! Nick Carter, are you here? Try this door. Uh, he's not here. Try that one over there. He's not here. It's getting so dark, you can't... Here I am. Hey, Patsy, listen. Here I am. Oh, Nick, are you all right? Let me find the light here. Yeah. Oh, Nick, what's happened? What are you telling me? They tried to hang us. Hang you? Oh, who's that with you, Nick? That's Brown. He nearly passed out. Oh. But I think he's going to pull through now. Oh, Nick, are you all right now? Did yeah. They... Yeah, I'm... I'm okay. My throat's pretty sore, but I live long enough to see Bardo and his men behind bars. Oh, take it easy, Nick. There's time enough for that. No, there isn't, Riley. Patsy, you stay here with Brown. Look out for him. Riley, where's your car? It was just on the block. Why? We haven't a second to lose. We've got to follow Bardo. Huh? Every minute counts now. A woman's life's at stake. Uh, there's no sign of him yet, Nick. Oh, that's all right, Riley. Keep straight ahead on this road. Hey, do you have an extra gun in the car? Yeah. yeah you'll, you'll find one under the seat there. Good. Oh, yes. Here it is. Well... How does your head feel, Nick? Uh, much better now. How did you ever get loose, Nick? They, uh, they actually had you strung up, didn't they? They sure did. I can still feel it. Well, how did you do it? Well, after they tied my wrists, I got Bardo to talking. That gave me time to work them loose. Oh, you mean you swelled your wrists when they tied them so that when you relaxed, they'd be so much smaller, huh? Mm-hmm. Except that having my hands free wouldn't have helped me much if Bardo and his men hadn't left right away. Fortunately, they saw you coming across the street, and they ran as soon as they strung us up. Well, what did you do then, Nick? By that time, I'd worked my hands loose. So I grabbed the rope above my head and pulled myself up. Phew, that was close. Yes, it was. And I cut the rope with a little trick knife that's built into my tie clasp. They never thought to look for one there. Then I cut Brown down. Poor fellow, he was almost gone. Well, thank heavens you outsmarted them, Nick. And as for Bartow, that dirty, murdering, no good scoundrel. Oh, look, like Riley. Huh? It's a car ahead of us. Oh, is that the right one, Nick? Let me see. There's so much dust on that. 3J20. R seven, that last oh six. Yes, that's the car. All right, now take it easy, Riley. I don't want him to get suspicious. Right. Yeah, they're turning up that dirt road, then, Nick. Shall I follow them? Say, I know where that hideout is now. Oh, you do? Yes, it must be the old Fairbanks Cave, not far from here. Bardo used it before. You stop the car here. If luck's with us, this is the end of the trail and the end of Bartow. <laughs> like rats, Nick. All we have to do now is sit tight and wait for him to come out. No, that won't do. They've got Mrs. Brown in there. We've got to get in before it's too late. Uh, hey, Nick, there's someone coming out. It's Trigger. Come on, Riley, this is our chance. Quiet now, we'll creep up on him. I'm right with you, Nick. You'll get behind him. <laughs> oh! Ah, that was worth $20. Now for the boss himself. Well, boss, when are we going to get it over with? Right now, Malone. Did you take a look at her? Yeah, she's all tied up the way we left it. All right. Say, Trigger. Trigger. Yeah, boss, coming. What's up? That special little job on the lady inside. We're going to take care of that right now. Then what, boss? What do you mean, then what? Then we bury her, of course. And that's the end of Mrs. Brown. Then my wife takes over, claims the fortune, and we're all set for life. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was forgetting that you're going to palm the wife off as Mrs. Brown. You talk too much, Trigger. I prefer action. And so do I. Get your hands up, Clint Bartow, and you too, Malone. Hey, hey what is this? Boss, that's... that's... Hoist is by... Hoist by his own petard, eh, Bartow? Nick Carter! They caught her. It can't be, boss. But it is. Now back up, both of you. And keep those hands up high. All right, Come on in. Oh, good work, Nick. What are you in time? Yes, Mrs. Brown's okay. She's inside there. Well, I guess we can call it a day, Nick. You saved the lives of the Browns, and we got Bartow and his gang where we can put him away forever. That's right, that's true. Huh. 
Clint Barter and his tricks. Hoist by his own petard. Huh? What in the world does that expression mean, Nick? That? Oh, it's an old Hindu proverb, Riley. It means, man who make noose for other fellow, sometime find it around own neck. This has been another of the strange adventures of Nick Carter, Master Detective, which are brought to you regularly at this same time by WOR Mutual. What's on the menu for next week, Nick? Imagine a murderer sitting in the death cell at State's Prison. It's just eight hours before he's scheduled to die in the electric chair. And then suddenly he sends for Nick Carter to prove he's innocent. Why did he wait so long before he sent for Nick? Well, that's all a part of the story, Joe. But I want to tell you that the next eight hours are about the busiest eight hours that Nick ever spent. And was he innocent? Ah, that's also a part of next week's story. In other words, Mr. Ripley, we're just not telling anymore until next week. So I see. But I think when you've heard it, you'll agree that it's a story well worth hearing. So long. So long, folks. So long to both of you for another week. In the strange adventure you have just heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark, Patsy by Helen Choate. The story was written for Nick Carter by Ralph Berkey. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was under the direction of Jock McGregor. Next week, at the same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter entitled... Nine Hours to Live. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Death House. This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. The Return of Nick Carter is produced in the studios of WOR and is broadcast over most of these stations every Saturday evening at 7 o'clock Eastern Wartime. This is Mutual. <laughs> case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure, Nine Hours to Live, or Nick Carter and the Death House Mystery. And now, a late news bulletin. Nine hours from now, at the stroke of midnight... Johnny Waldron, the blonde-faced killer convicted of the murder of Mrs. Cornelius Fielding, will go to the chair. Just 30 minutes ago, the condemned man made a last request. But Johnny Waldron did not ask for a sumptuous last meal in the tradition of the condemned. Nor did he ask to see his nearest and dearest relative, his wife, Laura. No, Johnny Waldron's request was for something much more dramatic. He asked to see the great detective, Nick Carter. Now, just what this last-minute conference means is anybody's guess. Perhaps a reprieve for Waldron. Perhaps a clue as to what happened to the fielding jewels, which up to now have not even been found. At any rate, the master detective, Nick Carter, has consented to talk with Waldron and is probably at this very moment entering Death House Row. Keep tuned to this station for further dramatic developments. He's at number one. We moved him to number one this morning. It sees a shorter ways to walk to the chair. Number one. Is he all ready to go? Yeah, the barber was in and shaved his head and legs about an hour ago. How's you taking it? Oh, there ain't been a peep out of him. Don't want nothing to eat. Don't want a chaplain. Nothing at all. The only request he's made is to see you. <laughs> Funny time to ask to see a detective, huh? Now, if you don't mind my asking, Mr. Carter... What made a big shot like you decide to see him? Well, maybe I'm curious to know what's in his mind. Go 
Or maybe I'm just a softie about a fellow who's going to die in a few hours. Well, I don't believe that you've got any sympathy for a criminal. Uh, not you. Not when a man's a killer. Well, here we are. Here's your company, Waldron. Oh, hi. Hello, Waldron. Oh, Mr. Carter. You got five minutes. All right, guard. Well, Johnny? Oh, so you did come. Gosh, I was afraid you wouldn't. Well, I must admit, I was surprised when the warden called me and said you wanted to see me. Yeah, I, I imagine you were. Gee, it was sure nice of you to come. Let's skip the formalities, Johnny. Time's too short for chit-chat. Come to the point. What's on your mind? Mr. Carter, you think I'm guilty, don't you? Well, didn't follow your case too closely. But you had a fair trial, and you were found guilty. What would you have me believe? I'd like to have you believe that, that I'm innocent. Pretty late in the game to convince anybody of that, Johnny. Oh, I'm not looking for a last-minute reprieve. That isn't what I asked you to come out here for. I got word a little while ago that the governor refused my last request for a reprieve. I, I just made up my mind that I'd only be kidding myself if I hoped any longer. Why did you want to see me, Johnny? Mr. Carter, I know I haven't got a chance. I'm, I'm going to be gone in, in just a few hours now. But I could go a lot easier if, if I thought that, that maybe someday the world would know the truth. They'd know that, that Johnny Waldron was innocent. Johnny, if I thought you were innocent, I'd start the wheels turning right now to get your reprieve. Oh, wait. Let, let me finish, Mr. Carter. I know you don't believe me. Nobody does. I guess I couldn't expect you to believe me after the way things went at the trial. But sitting here in death row, waiting, the idea came to me that, that maybe Nick Carter would show him someday. <laughs> of course, I'd be gone, but, well... You see, there's there's Laura, my wife. She's going to keep on living, and and it'll be hard for her. I suppose she believes you're innocent. Oh, she she stuck by me swell. She's she's a wonderful woman, and I don't want the world to look on her as as the widow of a murderer, Mister Carter. All I'm asking is that that after I'm gone, in your spare time, will you try to prove that they executed the wrong man, J just for my wife's sake. Johnny, if you're innocent, who do you think did rob the Fielding safe and kill Mrs. Fielding? I don't know, Mr. Carter. What? There's nobody you even suspect? Well, the only one that... that... No. No, I, I, I'm not going to accuse somebody I'm not sure of. I've only got a few more hours to live, and I, I don't want... If you want... don't want me to do anything for you, Johnny, you better tell me everything you can about this. No. No. You'll find it for yourself once you start looking. <laughs> Well, I've got to have some kind of evidence to go on. I don't have any. Cards were stacked so well against me, but go see Laura. She's never stopped working for me. Maybe she knows more by now. Look here. If that's the case, why haven't you had a lawyer working for you right up to the last minute? Uh, lawyers. I never had that kind of dough. Oh, a couple of shysters came around thinking maybe I had the fielding jewels tucked away someplace. When they found out they weren't going to get a cut, they faded pretty fast. Even if you decide to do anything for me, Mr. Carter, I, I wouldn't be able to pay you for your trouble. You, you'd have to do it just, just as a favor to a dying man. You don't know where the jewels are? Why, no, Mr. Carter. How could I know? I didn't do that job. Look, you, you go see Laura. She'll tell you whatever she can. All right. Time's up, Mr. Carter. All right, Garrett. Well, Johnny, I'll look into your case. I I don't suppose you believe me. <laughs> I bet he's been telling you an innocent man is being sent to the chair, huh? He tells that to everybody. Did it ever occur to you, guard, that he might be telling the truth? No. Why? Well, so long, no. Johnny. Good luck. Oh, thanks for coming, Mr. Carter. And, and, and thanks for whatever you can do for me, sir. I'd very much like to know what happened to those fielding jewels. Huh? Oh, 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 yes. Well... Maybe they'll turn up while you're investigating. Think so? I wonder. Say, guard, uh, how, how long is it until I... Eight hours, Johnny. Just eight hours more. Hello? 
Hello, Nick Carter's office. Oh, Patsy, this is Nick. Oh, Nick, thank heaven you called. This place is a madhouse. The office is filled with reporters. The newspaper and broadcasting companies have been telephoning. And the district attorney has been trying to reach you. And what's the trouble? They want to know if you're going to try to get a reprieve for Johnny Waldron. Hmm? The DA said he'd stick around his office all evening. And he's contacted the governor, and he'll be on tap ready. Reprieve? Oh, great heaven, I just talked to the fellow. I don't have any evidence, none whatsoever. What's the matter with the D.A.? Well, when Nick Carter goes to work on a case, even at the zero hour, something usually pops. Well, tell him to hang on to the hats a while. And you, Patsy, go up to the courthouse and get a transcript from the Walden trial. Dig up what you can out of our files about Walden. I'm heading back from state's prison right away. Meet you in front of the office. All right, Nick. But we're going to have to work fast. They throw the switch in exactly seven hours and 40 minutes. Waldron was really hired as a chauffeur. It was brought out of the trial that he ingratiated himself with the old lady every chance he got. Oh? You know, Mrs. Fielding was an invalid. Waldron used to carry her up and down stairs and waited on her and all that sort of thing. He was inside the house a great deal. Then, um, let's see now. Oh, the gun was traced to Mrs. Fielding's stepson, Tom Fielding. But the prints on the gun were Waldron's. Her stepson lived there with her? Yes, just the two of them. Mm -hmm. Walden and all the other servants slept out and reported for work in the mornings at 8. When was the body found? On a Thursday night at 10 o'clock, the library of the house. Tom Fielding came home from his club and found her. The safe was open and the jewels and money gone. Of course, any of the servants, as well as Tom Fielding, might have known the combination of the safe. Mrs. Fielding often opened it in front of all of them. The defense harped on that at the trial, but Waldron's prints on the gun and his alibi being so flimsy cooked his goose. I see. See. How did Walden strike you, Nick? Guilty? It's the evidence that tells the tale in any case, Patsy. If we could find the party who has the missing fielding jewels... It would look pretty grim for that party. I said it wouldn't look good, that's sure. Oh, Nick, look at the time. Ah, 5.50. In six hours and ten minutes, an innocent man may be electrocuted. Oh, no, Patsy. No innocent man will be electrocuted for a crime he didn't do. Well, my name's Nick Carter. And here's our first stop, Patsy. His old tenement house. Laura Waldron lives here. You're very nice to come to see me, especially today. Mrs. Waldron, this is my assistant, Patsy Bourne. How do you do, Miss Bourne? Hello, Mrs. Waldron. Won't you two sit down? Here, let me dust the chair. Oh, no, no, don't. It's perfectly all right. Since Johnny's been away, I haven't been as good a housekeeper as I used to be. I know heart for it anymore. Mrs. Waldron, I came to see you because... I know you went to see my husband. I heard on the radio. Yes, that's right. But it's too late to get Johnny off, isn't it? Besides, we don't have any money to pay a famous detective. Mrs. Waldron, the only thing Nick Carter ever asks is that justice be done. Now, Mrs. Waldron, tell me about Johnny. His habits, what he likes, what he doesn't like. Johnny's good, Mr. Carter. You see, I know he's innocent. But have you proof, Mrs. Walden? Proof? No. Just my heart tells me he wouldn't kill anybody. But more than that, I know because he was with me at the time the police say she was killed. Prosecution tore his alibi to shreds. Yes, a wife's testimony doesn't count for much in court. Oh, yet how thankful I am that he was with me that night. But I know he's innocent. You understand what I mean, don't you, Miss Bourne? You understand when I say the world can stand against your man, but if you know he's right and good and true, you... <laughs> Mrs. Waldron, isn't there any way at all it can be proved that your husband was home with you that night? No. No. You don't think of providing alibis for staying in your own home. It isn't much, I know, but it's ours. Tom Fielding has offered to help me. Now Johnny's going to be... Tom Fielding? You mean the stepson of the woman your husband's convicted of murdering? Yes. In what way is he offered to help you? Money. He knows Johnny isn't a murderer. His testimony in court didn't follow that line, Mrs. Waldron. Of course not. Mr. Fielding had himself to protect. That's right, Nick. Fielding was under suspicion. Just this afternoon, he called me again. And where's the jewels, I said to him. If my Johnny did it, where's the jewels and the money? 
Would I be begging for work if Johnny had done it? You're working now, Mrs. Walden? Day work. Scrubbing up places where they don't ask too many questions. Oh, but I'd mop the streets of this town from one end to the other every day. Johnny didn't have to die. Oh, don't, Mrs. Waldron. Don't cry, please. Please don't cry. You have to excuse me. Just that. I can't stand to think. I'm counting the minutes and seconds now. Only a few more hours, Johnny will be gone. <laughs> Mrs. Waldron, I'd like to ask you another question. No, right. Maybe Nick can save your husband yet, you know. Oh, if he only could. There isn't time left for me to chase down every witness and question them. Tell me, Mrs. Walden, whom do you suspect of robbing and murdering your husband's late employer? Who? Oh, Mr. Carter, I have no proof against anyone. I didn't ask if you knew who murdered Mrs. Fielding. I only said, whom do you suspect? But I have no right to suspect him. Right? What do you mean? He's been so kind and offered to help. Tom Fielding. That's who you think did it. Oh, I never dared think it out loud before. He was her stepson, you know, but she loved him like her own. Oh, they had their quarrels. Oh, they were just money fat. I'm not saying he did it, only... Only what? You talk to him, Mr. Carter. All right, I will. We'll go right over to the feeling house now. Oh, but you won't find him at home at this hour, Mr. Carter. He's always at the club at this time. I know from when Johnny used to drive for him. That's the old hunt club, isn't it? Yes. Tenth and fifth. Mm -hmm. Come on, Patsy, let's hurry. Time's precious. Okay. Goodbye and thank you. I'll be right here waiting and praying you find the guilty man in time to save Johnny. Nick, there's something puzzling you. What is it? Didn't you think Mrs. Walden's story made sense? Well, it did and it didn't. But, Nick, doesn't it seem a bit odd for Tom Feeling to offer her money? Yes, if that's true. Well, then her story does make sense. Patsy, it's not what Mrs. Walden said that's bothering me. Something else. Something else? Well, what is it, Nick? I wish I knew. But there's something that doesn't fit into the picture. It's in the back of my mind somewhere, but I can't quite get the key to it. And if you ask me, Tom Fielding is the one who could straighten out a lot of things. And he's the man we're going to tackle right now. Well... This hunt club's pretty swanky, isn't it? Good evening, sir. Can I park your car for you? Fancy place. Still has doormen and porters. Oh, I beg your pardon, miss. Uh, ladies aren't permitted in the old hunt club. I'm sorry. Well, that lets you out, Patsy. <laughs> I guess it does. You better wait for me here. Yes, I guess I'll have to. Oh, Nick. Hmm? It's 8.15. Only three hours and 45 minutes to go until midnight. again, Nick. Fielding wasn't at his club, so he's got to be home here. Uh-uh. Your womanly intuition isn't working right tonight, Betsy. Not a light in the whole house. I don't think anybody's home. Oh, Mr. Fielding, if you only knew how much time we've wasted looking for you. Well, Patsy, maybe we can uncover enough evidence without seeing Mr. Fielding face to face. What are you going to do? A little high-class lockpicking in the interest of Johnny Waldron and his wife, Laura. There we are. All right, come on in. Stay behind me. Gee, it's dark in here. Shut the door and I'll use my flash. Where are we headed for? The library. Oh. That's the room Mrs. Fielding was killed in, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Well, let's see. These old houses, the library is usually back this way, off the center hall. Come on. All right. You think there's anybody beside us in the house? I hope not. Ah, here we are. The door. This must be it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is the library. What are we looking for? Well, right now, I'm looking for Mrs. Fielding's safe. Safe? Mm hmm. Safe. Oh, oh, it, it's behind that portrait up here. 
That oh. was in the testimony. Yeah, you're right. Thanks, Betsy. Well, turn on that small lamp, will you? Mm -hmm. Take a glance at the papers on the desk while I open this safe. Say, Mrs. Fielding held her son and heir down while she was living. He's certainly making up for it now. Look at that wine cabinet. It's filled to the hilt with pre-war stuff. Oh, and look at this black market stuff. Half a gold tip cigarette, Miss Bowen. Yes, thank you. I will. That's a shame on you. How'd you feel if Tom Fielding walked in here right now and caught you swiping his expensive cigarettes? Only one, Nick. And for that matter, how would you feel if Mr. Fielding saw you about to open his face? <laughs> oh, Nick! That's... You okay? Yes, I, I guess so. And they shot through that window there. And the bullet went right in the side of the desk here. Well, we better get out of here, Nick. Now, one minute, Betsy. Got to see what's in this safe. It's almost open now. Well, who do you think shot at us, Mr. Fielding? Oh, Patsy, will you pick that bullet out of the desk? It'll be a handy piece of evidence. All right. So you're taking this attempt to murder us awful lightly, Nick. I don't think it was murder, Patsy. Not murder? No. You were standing by the wine cabinet not four feet from the window. And I was a perfect target standing here. No, Betsy, I think you'll find somebody was just trying to scare us away. Oh. Well, I got the bullet out. Looks like a thirty-two. Ah, there we are. Patsy. Yes? Look here. The missing jewels. Oh, Nick. Yes, right here in the safe. Oh, Nick, that's wonderful. Hey, Patsy, what are you doing? Oh, I'm getting the DA on the phone for you. You've got the evidence for Johnny Waldron's reprieve. Now, wait a minute, wait oh, a minute. I know he wasn't guilty, Nick. Mrs. Waldron was telling the truth. Patsy, put down that phone. Yes, Nick. Now, get me police headquarters first. I want a general alarm sent out for Tom Fielding. But Johnny Waldron... I still have two hours, Patsy. If Waldron's innocent, I'll prove it in time to save him from the chair. Nick, why should you want to talk to Mrs. Waldron again when you haven't asked for the reprieve? Only make her feel worse. There's something about her that doesn't add up, Patsy. And I've got to know what it is before I go any further. This is her door, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Nick Carter, your thinking on this case is beyond me. Well, Patsy, it's hard to explain. When I don't know myself what the missing link is, how can I explain it to you? But you found the jewels. Tom Fielding had them in his safe. Why, it's obvious, Nick. He didn't get along with his stepmother, and he... Nick, what are you doing? Going to open Mrs. Walden's door? Oh, no, don't do that, Nick. I'm sure she's here. She, she's probably been crying and doesn't want to see anybody. Let me call her first. Mrs. Waldron? Mrs. Waldron? Oh, sorry, Patsy. We haven't any time to waste. Now, let's see. Where's the light switch? It's here by the door. Oh, she isn't here. So it seems. Nick. Hmm? Look here. There's a gold tip cigarette in this ashtray, the same kind we saw at Fielding's house. Let's have it. Hmm, no lipstick on it. Kind of pinched in near at the end. He's been here. I never would have believed it of him. Believe what? What had a man like Fielding would come to a place like this? Why, a man like that wouldn't get his hands dirty putting them on the doorknob of a hovel like this. Say that again, Patsy. What? Well, a man like Fielding wouldn't dirty his hands on the doorknob of a place like... I got it. Patsy, you just gave me the key I've been looking for. Come on. We've got to get back to Fielding's library or there'll be another murder. You know, Patsy, there are times when having a siren on this car comes in handy. And tonight's one of them. I hope we're in time. Do you think the police have picked Fielding up yet or do you think he'd be at his home? He's at home. I'll bet my bottom dollar on that. Nick, do you know what time it is? Stop worrying about the time and come on. I'm right with you. The place is still dark. There's a little light shining in the hallway. Now, he's here, all right. Watch your step, Betsy. Don't worry about me. I slipped the latch in the front door when we left. Let's see if it's been bolted. No, nope, still open. All right, come on. Where do you think he is? The library, probably. Oh, I hear someone, Nick. Yeah, they're both here. Well, that's Mrs. Waldron's voice. Open the door, Nick. No, it's locked. I'll try to pick it. Oh, Nick, hurry. I am hurrying. Stay away from me! Help! Help! Oh, he's killed her. There. Oh, Mrs. Waldron. 
Oh, thank heaven you came. He was just going to shoot me. I got the gun away from him. Who oh, I... shot him? Yes, Mr. Carter. But it was self-defense. Anyone can see that. Oh, I'm so sorry for you, Mrs. Walton. It was worth it. It was worth it. Now Johnny will be safe. He won't have to die in the chair. Nick, you've only got seven minutes to call it. Seven minutes to twelve. Hurry, Mr. Carter. Just a minute. Now. Calm yourself, Mrs. Walton. Here, have a cigarette. A cigarette? All right. May I light it for you? Thanks. Wait a minute till I get my cigarette holder out of my bag. So, you do use a cigarette holder. I thought so. Nick, the time is getting awfully short for your call to the DA. I'm not going to make that call. Why, Nick, not going to make it. No, Mrs. Waldron. It was a nice frame-up you and your husband tried against Tom Fielding, but it didn't work. Frame-up? Yes, frame-up. You and Johnny staged this whole thing to get him a last-minute reprieve. It was pretty clever, but you made a couple of mistakes. For example, this gold-tipped cigarette butt I found in your apartment tonight. What about it? When I found this butt in your apartment, all pinched in at the end from having been smoked in a holder, I knew you'd lied about not having seen Tom Fielding. These particular cigarettes are made to order for him. I didn't leave it there. I couldn't be sure of that until I found that you used a cigarette holder. Then I knew I was right. You did leave it here. Go on, prove it. Another thing. Patsy, Hmm? take a look at Mrs. Walden's hands. My hands? Why, they're beautiful. Beautifully manicured. Exactly. Mrs. Walden, with hands like yours, you don't scrub floors for a living. That dingy apartment of yours is merely a front. Look out, Nick. Gun, huh? Yes, and I know how to use this gun, too, and I'm going to. Uh, oh! So sorry to hate you, Mrs. Walden. Patsy. Yes? Take a look at Tom Fielding. See if he's still alive. Right, Nick. You haven't got anything on me. You can't get he's me still for still breathing, anything. Nick. Good. Phone for an ambulance. Quick. Okay. Oh, but Nick, can you prove this charge against Mrs. Walden? Can you be positive she and her husband frame Fielding? Not yet, Patsy, but I'm so sure I'm right that I'll risk my reputation on it. But Nick, as long as there's the slightest doubt about it, shouldn't you call the DA and give Johnny Walden the benefit of the doubt? No, Patsy. As far as I'm concerned, there's no doubt whatsoever. I'm so sure I'll even risk Johnny's life on it. Nick Carter's office. Oh, yes, Lieutenant. Yes. Yes. It was. He is. Oh, I see. Well, thank you, Lieutenant. Yes, I'll tell Nick. Goodbye. Was that the report from police headquarters, Pansy? Yes, it was Lieutenant Riley. And you were right, Nick. That gun you took from Mrs. Walden was registered in Johnny's name. And she lied about taking the gun away from Fielding and shooting him in self-defense. Fielding's fingerprints weren't on the gun anywhere, but hers were all over it. Did they check with the bullet when you picked out of that desk? The one that was fired at us? Yes, and it came from the same gun. Fine. And what about Fielding? Did Riley say? He's going to live. What's more, he regained consciousness long enough to make a statement. Good. Oh, Nick, that Mrs. Walden was certainly clever. She was planting the jewels in Fielding's safe when he came in the room and caught her. So she... She held him at the point of her gun and knocked him out, bound his wrists and ankles, gagged him, and hid him away in another room. What? Right. How did you know that? Very simple, Betsy. The marks we'd been tied were still on his wrists when I examined him, and also oh. there was a bump on his head. Nick, you're always holding out on me. And one other thing. What made you think Fielding's life would be in danger way back when we were in Mrs. Walden's apartment the second time? Curious, huh? Well, Patsy, after your inspired remark about hands, I suddenly realized what it was about Mrs. Walden that puzzled me. It was her hands. I knew that with hands like hers, she couldn't be earning her living scrubbing floors. Oh, I see. And if she were lying about that, it was very probable she was lying about everything. And the whole thing was a plot to make Fielding look guilty. But why should that make you suddenly afraid that something might be going to happen to Fielding? That's if she and Johnny were so anxious to get Johnny a reprieve that they were willing to give up the jewels to make it look as if Fielding were really the guilty man, it was entirely possible that she might go further and kill Fielding and try to make it look as if he killed himself. But how would that help Johnny Waldron? Well, if it was downright... It would look as if he were remorseful at having let Johnny take the blame. And she almost got away with it. But she didn't, because Nick arrived in the nick of time. You're a wonderful detective, Mr. Carter. And so, ladies and gentlemen, at midnight last night, Johnny Waldron went to the electric chair to pay for the crime of having murdered Mrs. Cornelius Fielding. His dramatic last-minute attempt to get a reprieve failed, thanks to the quick action of that master detective, Nick Carter. In those few short hours that Carter was actually on the case, he found the missing jewels, uncovered a well-laid plot between Johnny and his wife to pin the murder on Tom Fielding and save Fielding's life. Tom Fielding and the entire community owe a debt of gratitude to Nick Carter.
This has been another of the strange adventures of Nick Carter, Master Detective, which are brought to you regularly at this time by WOR Mutual. Well, Nick, what happens in your next week's story? I want to tell you the story of the time that I quite accidentally stumbled onto a terrible crime. Or to be more correct, I stumbled onto evidence that a terrible crime had been committed. That doesn't sound like a very unusual thing for you to do. Except for one little fact, Mr. Ripley. We didn't know where or when the crime had been committed. In spite of the fact that we heard the story of the murder from the victim's own lips. As a matter of fact, we even heard the murder committed. And we were powerless to do anything about it. If you're trying to make me curious about it... We are. You're certainly succeeding. Well, it's as unusual a tale as I've had the pleasure of telling in a long while, I assure you. So, until next week, so long. So long, folks. And so long to you, Nick and Patsy. In the strange adventure you have just heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark... Patsy by Helen Choate. The story was written for Nick Carter by Barth Conray. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was under the direction of Jock McGregor. Next week, at this same time... Listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter entitled... Records of Death. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Unclaimed Box. This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. The return of Nick Carter is produced in the studios of WOR and is broadcast over most of these stations every Saturday evening at 7 o'clock Eastern Wartime. And don't forget that the adventures of Nick's adopted son, Chick Carter, are broadcast over most of these stations Mondays through Fridays at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Wartime. This is Mutual. Another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure, Records of Death. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Unclaimed Box. The fact of the matter is, Mr. Carter, that I have quite accidentally stumbled on a terrible crime. Or, to be more correct, I've stumbled on evidence that a terrible crime has been committed. But even so, Mr. Field, why do you come to me with it? That sort of thing should be reported to the police. Mr. Carter, what police would I have reported to? Where was the murder committed? I don't know. Well, how can you know that a murder's been done if you don't know where it was done? Well, that's what makes this particular crime different from any other. Somewhere, sometime, a murder has been committed. Yet I don't know when or where. As a matter of fact, I doubt if anyone in the world knows of it, except those who did it, and me. And how do you happen to know all this? Because the victim, a young and beautiful girl, has told me so in her own words. I have the knowledge from her own lips. Oh, then you've seen and talked to her? Well, here's the story, Mr. Carter. About a month ago, I attended one of the sales of unclaimed packages that the express company holds twice a year. Among other things, I bought was a box about one-third the size of a steamer trunk. It contains some miscellaneous articles of clothing and ten phonograph records. Phonograph records, huh? Regular professional records? No, Mr. Carter. They were small record blanks you buy when you make home recordings for yourself. I immediately played the records, and since then I've played them so often, I almost know them by heart. And you learned about this crime from those records? Yes. Mr. Field, you want to arouse my curiosity. You certainly succeeded. When can I hear these records? Immediately, Mr. Carter. I have them in my room. If you'll go there with me, we can listen to them at once. Splendid. You mind if I take my assistant, Patsy Bowen, with me? Of course not. Then as soon as she's ready, we'll go. Patsy! Yes, Nick? Get your hat. We're leaving at once to listen to a murder. This is the box, Mr. Carter. Beautiful, isn't it? 
Now, Mr. Field, before we go further, there are a few things I should like to know. How long ago did you buy this box at the auction? A little over a month ago. Mm-hmm. And the express company must have had it for about a year or so. Now, another thing. Were there any wrappings on the box when you bought it? Yes, it was well wrapped in heavy burlap. You have those wrappings now? I'm sorry to say I don't. By the time I realized that the wrappings might have furnished a clue to the mystery, they'd been burned in the incinerator. Too bad. Well, do you by any chance, whatever, recall the name and address to which the box was consigned? Fortunately, I do. It was addressed to an Alex Delanois in New York City. But I've searched every city directory, every telephone book, every place where names are listed, and I can find no such name anywhere. There was no street address, and the rest of the label, as I remember it, was practically obliterated. I see. All right, Mr. Field, let's listen to the records. And gladly. I'm very anxious to get your opinion of them. Are they in any kind of order? <laughs> After hearing them over and over, as I've done, I believe that I've finally arranged them in their proper order. I see. They're so peculiar, I can hardly wait to see if you can tell me the answer. Here's the first one. I have a terrible story to tell. But even while I try to tell it, I'm afraid that you who may listen to this will not believe me. But I beg you, if justice means anything to you, believe me and avenge me. I shall rest easier in my grave if I know that those who hope to profit by my death have been deprived of the fortune they plan to get by killing me. I am very rich, but I am not rich enough to avoid the fate that is in store for me. She sounds as if she meant it, doesn't she? I thought he was coming in, but he went away. I've tried several times to escape, but I've failed each time. I wish I could tell you where I am, but I can't. Because I was drugged when they brought me here. Oh, I, I forgot to say, my name is Nancy Deering, and I'm 22 years old. You who listen to this will recognize the name at once, of course. I only hope they don't murder me until I can... Is that the end of it? Not quite. He almost caught me that time. But now he's left me alone again. Maybe I can... That's all. Apparently, he came back before she expected him. Well, she certainly had plenty of trouble getting a story out of the records, didn't she? Yes. She was interrupted many times, generally in the wrong places. I imagine no trouble is too great if you're really desperate. What a terrible feeling it must be to expect to be killed any minute. Here's the second record, if you're ready. Okay, Keith. I don't know where I left off with my story last time. And I dare not play it back. If they should ever hear what I'm trying to do, they take the machine away from me then I'd be completely lost. I feel that my end is coming very soon now. They may carry out their plans to... In the gloaming, oh, my darling, when the lights are soft and low, and the flip I think he's gone now. I'm sure Ralph was listening at the door, but the singing apparently convinced him I was listening to the radio. When the time comes, I know it will be Ralph who kills me. Olive will undoubtedly help him, but Ralph is the leader. I found that out the other day when they tried to get me to sign the papers which will give them possession of my fortune. I shall never sign, but that... When the light... The rest of the records are that song. They did her best to get story out of those records. Mm, too bad she didn't succeed better. Well, she managed to get most of her story on the records, one way or another. The only thing she really missed out on was telling us more about herself than just her name. Probably never occurred to her that the records might travel thousands of miles before someone would hear them. Yeah, here's the third record. Last night, somebody searched my rooms while I was in bed. Maybe they suspect that I'm making these records. Although I'm very careful. I play the radio all the time, so they'll be used to hearing the noise. Ralph told me yesterday he was sure I was going crazy. Maybe I... Nancy, Olive asked me to tell you that. And that ends that. 
Whose voice do you suppose that was there at the end? I suspect it was Ralph's. It's amazing how much of the scene she recreates this way without really saying anything definite. You can feel the tension and the suspense right along with her. Yes. On the fourth record, she was able to get part of the visit that Ralph paid her one day. She must have known he was coming and prepared for it by putting the record blank on the machine in advance. Then when she heard him at the door, she probably turned it on. Got this. Well, put it on quickly, Mr. Field. Uh, you are, Miss Bourne. Have you decided to sign over your fortune to me? I told you long ago I'd never do that. If you sign, we'll set you free, just as we promised. You don't fool me, Ralph. The minute I sign my name to that paper you have there, you'll kill me. You know that as well as I do. You'll set me free. <laughs> That's funny. Ah, you don't know when you're well off, Nancy. If you did, you'd sign and go free. You don't think I'm a fool, Ralph. I do. And I also think it won't be long before you wish you had it, son. <clears throat> oh, I wish this were all over. I wonder how they'll kill me. Ralph would prefer to strangle me, I'm sure. With those great, hairy hands of his. It's for Olive. Yes, she'd use poison on the boot. And that's all there is on that one. It's a pity she couldn't have put more on each record than she did. She really used only a small portion of each blank. Yes, Patsy, but she had trouble enough to get even that much on them, the way they watched her. Nick, where could she get the blank records in the first place? They certainly wouldn't have let her have them knowingly. If I were to make a guess, Patsy, I'd say that when they took her to the place where she was kept prisoner, they probably took along her clothes and some of her furnishings. Mm -hmm. And among them probably was this radio phonograph. Perhaps she specially asked for it because she loved music or something, and the record blanks were probably the machine along with the other records. Mm, that could be. Uh, how about the fifth record, Mr. Field? I've never been able to make much out of this one. Maybe you'll have better luck. You mean it's not like the others? I'm quite different. Here, I'll start it near the end. The whole first part is just scratch and nothing else. <laughs> started the record. For some reason, she waited before saying anything. Then Ralph and Olive came, found the door locked, and, being suspicious, broke it down. Nancy hid, and they dragged her out. There was an argument about something that I didn't get. Nancy grabbed Ralph's pistol and took a quick shot at him, but she missed. Before she could pull the trigger again, he took the gun away from her. Good grief, Mr. Carter. It's clear enough when you tell it. Well, here's the sixth one. I must hurry. The time is very short. I may be interrupted any minute. I'm seldom left alone anymore. They seem to be afraid of what I'll do if I'm left alone. I wonder that they haven't killed me before this. I wonder if they... There's nothing but scratch for quite a bit here, but she starts again. Olive came in. I had to stop. Now she's gone for a few minutes at least. Yesterday I wrote a letter to my father and I threw it out the window, hoping someone would find it and mail it. But Ralph found it and brought it back to me and laughed at me. I keep asking him for news of my father, but he'll tell me nothing. If father only knew where I am, he'd rescue me. Maybe if I can jump. And that's the end of that. Well, we didn't get much out of it. I wonder where father comes into this. You'll see all. before we're through. And this seventh record is more interesting. Because it records a complete conversation between Nancy and Ralph. Good. Let's hear it. How are you today? If you had your way, I'd be dead. <laughs> Why don't you kill yourself and save us the trouble? You mean save you from having a murder on your conscience? 
You have such a thing? Murder is a very ugly word, Nancy. You're murdering me inch by inch every day that I stay here. Well, I don't object to doing it that way if I can. <laughs> if you ever throw anything at me like that again, I'll... I'll tie you up so you won't be able to move out of your chair. Ralph, if you really want me to sign those papers for you, just let me go to my father. If you do, I'll sign anything you want. That's out of the question, Anne. But if you sign, we'll, we'll see that your father finds you soon enough. And it's only because I'm your half-brother that I offer you this. You sneak in my house! I wish we could have heard more of that. Yes. We might have learned something really important. You will. Nancy knew the record was near the end, and that glass of water was merely an excuse to get Ralph out of the room while she put on a new one. Good for her. She's a clever girl. Oh, what a terrible ordeal she went through, never knowing from one day to the next whether it was her last. Quiet, Patsy, please. Thank you. You were gone quite a long time. I met all of them in the hall. She reminded me to tell you... We've decided that unless you do as we want you to, you have just one more day to live. Just one. Do you think that frightens me? I'll almost welcome death. Because I know it's the only way I'll ever get away from you two. And I'm firmly convinced you'll never succeed in getting possession of my fortune. Uh, of course we'll get it. No doubt about that. I don't think you will. No? No. That is, you won't get it unless you're planning on murdering my father, too. After you forged a new will for him to leave behind him. Smart, aren't you? Guessed it the first time. No. No, you wouldn't. You couldn't. No, why not? He's not my father. And we want his fortune for ourselves. I can't believe such inhuman creatures as you two really exist. <laughs> Our mother bore a strange lot of children, didn't she? On one hand, we have you, my saintly Nancy. And on the other hand, we have the twins, Olivet and me, who are anything but saintly. <laughs> yes, life is very strange sometimes. Get out! Get out of me, you boy! I've got to die to be with you! That's an excellent idea, Nan. I'll be gone for about 15 minutes. If you're wise, you won't be alive when I return. <laughs> Goodbye. I hope forever. You heard what he said? It was the best evidence I could get. Ralph really made a full confession without knowing that every word he said was being preserved for you to hear. My father. Why must he die? Oh, I beg you. Whoever you are, hears these words. If you can do anything to avenge our death, in heaven's name, do it. I go to my death believing that through you I shall have my revenge at last. Oh, please don't fail me. I see the records coming to an end. Good night. <laughs> if you didn't know she was in deadly earnest, you'd almost think she was putting on an act. I still feel terribly moved when I hear that record. She never had a chance, really. Well, let's hear the next one. That's the ninth, isn't it? Yeah, uh, number nine is almost a blank. But here it is. They almost caught me that time. They mustn't do that because they might find the records I've already made and destroy them. They're both coming back in a few minutes, but maybe I can... 
Is that all there is on that one? That's all. That's the end of the record. There's one more, isn't there? Yes. And number ten. The first two thirds of it's blank. It starts here. Stand back, both of you. Well, no, what did you what? see? I'm armed. You know I can shoot and shoot straight. I'll kill the first one of you to move. Come on, your ass. That's my gun. Where'd you get it? Olive gave it to me so I could defend myself. That's a lie and you know it. What is it? the end of the last record. Poor Nancy. She certainly got a tough break. I truly believe that's the most remarkably told tragedy in history. Oh, Mr. Carter, have you got any ideas? I have, but I'm not ready to talk about them yet. Well, what's the next step now, Nick? Well, first of all, Patsy, I want to examine the other contents of the box thoroughly. I can look them over more intelligently now that I've heard the records. Then I want to play those records over and over until I know them by heart. And then? Then I expect to be able to give you the answer to the problem. sandwich in your pocket, Patsy? Oh, Nick, I thought you'd never finish listening to those records. Well, I want to be sure I didn't miss anything anyway. And I believe I've learned everything those records could tell me. You mean you really found some clues, Nick? Yes, indeed, Patsy. There are several clues marked out for us very plainly. Oh, that's wonderful. But first, I want to go over that list from here of the other things that were in that box addressed to Alex Delanois. Of course, Nick. Let me see now. Um, yes, here it is. Alpha Cloak with label Felix and Company Toronto. And a beautiful and expensive thing it was, too. Mm hmm? Silk slip with the name Olivette Dupre pinned on it. Wish I could wear silk like that. That's it. A silk slip with the name Nancy Deering pinned to it. A New Testament with the name Evangeline Dupre on the flyleaf. Several rings, all very valuable. A real pearl necklace. And some beautiful and very expensive lace. Also, of course, the bloodstained nightdress, which must have been the one that Nancy was murdered in. And the three snapshots, of course. Oh, yes. One with the name Olivette on the back one with the name Ralph, and one with the name Evangeline Dupre Deering. Whoever packed that box knew exactly what he was doing, Patsy. All ties together beautifully. He or she has given us all the clues he could to the people concerned in the affair. Evangeline Dupre Deering must have been the mother. Yes. She had two children, twins, Ralph and Olivet, by her first marriage. Then she married Nancy's father, a man named Deering. But that doesn't get as much nearer a solution, Nick. No, but it does, Patsy. Did you notice that all the voices we heard in the records were American? Well, yes, I guess they were. And yet the names are mostly French, aren't they? Mm-hmm. Now, where do we find a combination like that around here? Why, in Canada, I suppose. Exactly. And the label on the opera cloak says Toronto, which confirms the Canada idea perfectly. You mean that the Deerings lived in Toronto? Well, it's certainly quite logical to assume that the scene of the murder is Canada, and very possibly in the vicinity of Toronto. Well, we start there anyway. Maybe the Toronto police can help us. But, Nick, even if you're right, it doesn't mean that the police would know anything about the murder. It was all done so secretly. You're overlooking one thing, Patsy. I am? Well, what is it? The family from which these people came was a rich family. Very rich indeed, if we may guess from the beautiful laces and from the jewelry and other things packed in the box. Mm -hmm. And remember also that Nancy's father was probably killed too. Now, I can't believe that the head of a rich and probably well-known family could disappear without anyone knowing it. You mean you think the police will know that something happened to him about a year ago, even if they don't think that there's anything wrong about it? Exactly. So pack your bag, Patsy, and order a taxi to take us to the airport. We're flying to Toronto immediately. <laughs> I'm very happy to welcome you back to Toronto, Mr. Carter. It's been many years since you've been up here to see us. Well, thanks very much, Chief. Now, you mind if I ask you a few questions? No, of course not. Go right ahead. Did you get a letter about a year ago telling that a murder had been done and that if you wanted proof, you should claim an express box sent to New York City in the name of Alex Delanois? Wait a minute. Why, George Carter, we did get just such a letter. But we thought it was the work of a crank and destroyed it. Do you mean it was true? I have every reason to believe it was. Now, another question. Would you know anything about a girl named Nancy Deering or about her father? For heaven's sake, Carter, what do you know about the Deering family? You answer my question first, I'll answer yours. 
Well, what about the Deerings? Uh, the father, Charles Deering, is, is or was the younger son of an English nobleman. Mm -hmm. He was immensely rich. Had a house here in town, a country place called Deering Hall. He married a woman with two children, twins, I believe. And she died when his daughter Nancy was born. Ah. He was always prominent in local affairs up to about a year ago when he said to have disappeared. Hasn't been seen since. I understand he started for Deering Hall, but never arrived there, according to his two stepchildren. What about his daughter, Nancy? Nancy was brought up by relatives in Montreal. Few people here know her at all. But as I remember it, she was supposed to have disappeared just before her father did. Although I now understand that she was at Deering Hall with her half-brother and sister all the time. You say Nancy didn't disappear after all? I know. As a matter of fact, she was here in Toronto this past week. She believes her father is dead, so she's applied for letters of administration for the estate. I thought so. You did? What do you know about it? Enough to know that this girl who calls herself Nancy Daring isn't Nancy Daring at all. She's an imposter whom the stepchildren have brought in to impersonate her. Chief, we got to get out to Daring Hall at once. <laughs> into the Deering estate turns off somewhere right in here, Carter. I'm not quite sure. Oh, look, Chief. There's a man standing in the road up ahead. Oh, so there is. And he's motioning to us to stop. Hmm, looks almost like a dwarf, doesn't he? Ah, it's certainly a queer-looking individual. If perhaps you are going to the hall. Yes, we are. Why? Could you take me back there? I have walked so far. I am tired out. Oh, of course. Climb in. <laughs> well, you are a policeman, no? Yes, I am. Oh, then you can help me. And I need help so very much. What seems to be the trouble? My name is Alex Delanois. I am the... Alex Delanois? Yes, yes. You know me. You once sat a box packed with records and other things in New York City addressed to yourself? Oh, but yes, you have seen it. Yes, that's why we're here. Tell me, how did you ever happen Yes, to... yes, I will tell you everything. I was the caretaker at the hall. Miss Deering let me stay in one of the old tower rooms because I am, as you see, a cripple. Sometimes I, I do not get out of bed for days at a time. About a year ago, the two stepchildren of those so very wicked devils came to the hall. They brought a girl who was kept a prisoner in one of the bedrooms. Alex, isn't that the hall road to the hall just ahead? Then? No, but yes. The hall is about a half a mile in off this road. You go on with your story, Alex. Yeah. Uh, the, the girl was so carefully guarded by those two, uh, I could not get to her room. <laughs> I could not help her. I am a cripple. No, you did what you could, Alex. You being there helped her, I know. How did you manage to get the things packed in the box? After they killed Nancy, they did not guard their room so carefully. I got in, I took the records and the other things and packed them in the box. A fisherman I know up by the lake sent the box by experts for me. I wrote to the police in Toronto and in New York and told them what had happened and asked them to claim this box. But I am afraid they did not do it. No, we didn't. We thought the letter was just a hoax. What about Nancy's father? Uh, the day after Nancy was killed, he came here and they tried to kill him too. Tried to? You mean they didn't succeed? No, no, not quite. They hit him on the head with a pistol and threw him into the lake from the high cliff. Ah, but I saw them do it, and I rescued him. I took him to my room and nursed him myself until he could get a doctor. Well, how is he now? Well, he's about well now, I think. There's the house right ahead, Nick. Drive right up to the door, Chief. I'll go ahead. You keep in the background in case they know you. Okay, Carter. Well, I'll be right behind you. Alex, you and Patsy stay here in the car. Oh, but of course. Sure, Nick. Yes? What is it, please? Please tell Miss Deering that we've come to take some affidavits concerning her application as administratrix for the estate. Yes, sir. Well, come in, please. I'll announce you. It's your turn now, Chief. I'll stand here one side of the door, just in case. I can handle them, Carter. Maybe, but they're going to be quiet. Here they come. Well, gentlemen, what can we I'll do? Dr. Gray, I arrest you and your sister Olivette for the murder. I'll take that gun to play with me. Get it, oh, no, you don't, lady. This pair of handcuffs will take care of you. Get rid of you. Do you need any help? No, no, I can take care of him. There. Oh. Oh. 
Nice work, Carter. Well, handcuffs on him. They both keep safely till we can put them behind the bars. And we can now restore Deering Hall to his rightful owner once more. Even though it's almost a year later, the box that Alex Ellenwell packed has fulfilled its destiny. has been another of the strange adventures of Nick Carter, Master Detective, which are brought to you regularly at the same time by WOR Mutual. What's your story going to be about next week, Nick? Well, next week I'm going to tell you the tale of the thief and murderer who had to be caught twice before he was really caught at all. And when Nick caught him the second time, it was because he was able to guess in advance exactly what the criminal was going to do as well as exactly what he was going to think. And what did you say the crime was? Merely a matter of murder and robbery. Well, there was nothing unusual in the crime itself. The excitement came, and the way Nick chased him, outsmarted him, and finally caught him. It's a very special example of the criminal who was just a little too clever for his own good. He overrated himself and underrated Nick. That's <laughs> always dangerous where Nick Carter is concerned. Thanks for the compliment. And so long till next week. So long, everybody. And so long to you both. In the strange adventure you've just heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark, Patsy by Helen Choate. Original music was played by Lou White, and the entire production was written and directed by Jock McGregor. Next week at the same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter entitled... The Unwilling Accomplice. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Society Burglar. This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. This is Mutual. Another case for Nick Carter, Master Detective. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure... The Unwilling Accomplice. Or Nick Carter... And the mystery of the society burglar. Hello, Lieutenant. What's new and interesting? Well, well, if it ain't my old friend Nicholas Carter, him that used to be a detective. Yeah, what do you mean, used to be? Uh, sure, my boy, tell me. How does it feel to be old and retired? Oh, come now, Riley, I get it. A little peeved because I've turned down those few cases you've offered me lately. It's not a few separate cases, Nick. It's all been the same gang, I'm sure of it. Uh, they're the slickest bunch this department's ever been up against. We need your help, Nick. Look at this. Came over the wire only this morning. Hmm. Another society robbery. Quite a haul. Yes, my boy, quite a haul. $75,000 in gems right out of the vault. What do you say now, Nick? Riley, I think you're right. Looks like the same hand in every job. Well... Well, I suggest that for your criminal, you look for someone who's accepted in the homes of society. And is just about the greatest safecracker in the country as well. Oh, thank you, Nick. That's a very great help, I'm sure. Oh, I'm sorry, Riley, but really, I'm not interested. You know I don't take a case unless... Well, what in the name of... Wow, that was close. That stone missed you by inches. Sure, somebody's trying to bean me now, is it? Well, I'll fix that. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, Riley. That isn't it. This seems to be a little matter of communication. Communication? Yes, look. There's a note tied to that stone. Well, now, hand that over here. Here you are. Uh, let's see what it... What is... Well, I... Listen to this, Nick. My dear Lieutenant Riley, since the jobs I have pulled off lately have so completely mystified your department, may I suggest that you call upon the services of your very good and able friend, Nicholas Carter. What's that? Uh, it won't help much, of course. But at least I'll then have an adversary more worthy of my talents. Hmm. You see, I'm varying the pattern and going on to much bigger things. Today it has been the National Loan and Trust Company. It is not only theft, but murder as well. Hmm. Well, Nick, what do you make of that? Very interesting. Interesting, is it? Why, the cheek of him! 
The, the National Loan and Trust Company, he says. And, and murder, he says. We're dealing with a conceited maniac. Give me that phone. I'm going to check up on this. Unless it's now 5.30 on Saturday afternoon, Riley. I doubt that you'll find anyone at the bank. Uh, Excuse me, Lieutenant. Yeah? There's a lady and gentleman here to see you. They say it's most urgent. Well, what are you waiting for? Show them in. Yes, sir. This way, please. Thank you. Lieutenant Riley. Yes? Permit me to introduce myself. I'm Butler Pierce. And this is Miss Olive Belden, my fiancée. I'm pleased to make your acquaintance. Now, well, what can I be doing for you? You can help us find Miss Belden's father. He's missing. Oh, missing, huh? Yes, Lieutenant. Dad's been gone for hours, and I'm beginning to fear something dreadful may have happened. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. This is Nick Carter, Miss Belden and Mr. Pierce. Nick Carter, the detective? The same, Miss Belden. Oh, I'm so glad, Mr. Carter. Will you... Would you, I mean... Isn't your alarm somewhat unwarranted? Your father hasn't been missing very long, I take it. That's true, Mr. Carter. Only three hours to be exact, but under the circumstances... What Miss Belden means, Mr. Carter, is that it seems as if her father had disappeared into thin air. How do you mean, Mr. Pierce? Well, the last time she saw him, it was through the living room window. From there, she could look out over the court into his private office at the bank. And when she... bank? Did you say bank, Mr. Pierce? Why, yes. Olive's father is Wayne Belden, president of the National Loan and Trust Company. Did you hear that, Nick? The National Loan and Trust Company. Yes, Riley. There's not a minute to be lost. Come on. Now, let me get this straight, Miss Belden. You say your father came into his private office here through that special passageway that leads from the house to the bank. That's right, Mr. Carter. Father often spent Saturday afternoons here writing letters. I see. And there was no one else in the bank at that time? No. This is Saturday, you know, and it was after banking hours, of course. Hmm. When was the last time you saw your father? About one o'clock, Mr. Carter. He was sitting at his desk here writing a letter. But when I looked through the window again a few hours later, he wasn't there. You sure he hadn't returned to the house? Positive. I'd have seen him. The passageway opens right into the living room where I was reading. Hmm. Well, what happened when you looked for him... And it wasn't there. Well, just about then, Mr. Pierce called on me. I told him about Father's absence, and we both went to look for him. I see. About what time was that? Oh, about four o'clock. Mm-hmm. And so you you both went into the bank as soon as you missed your father? Yes. We found Mr. Belden's office, just as you see it now. Then we looked all through the bank. There wasn't a sign of him anywhere. Now, wait a minute, all of you. What was to prevent Mr. Belden from walking right out the front door of the bank? As easy as that. Well, that's not very likely, Lieutenant. He was wearing his house slippers at the time, and he had no coat or hat. Oh, and not only that, Riley. You see this letter here on Belden's desk? Mm -hmm. He was writing it when something interrupted him. Mm. You notice anything peculiar about it? Well, no, except that he broke off in the middle of a sentence. More important than that, Riley. He stopped in the middle of a word. Belden was interrupted very abruptly. Oh, that must be the cashier now. Hello, Mr. Cook. Come in. Hello, Miss Belden. I got here just as soon as I could. This is Mr. Carter and Lieutenant Riley. Good afternoon, oh, yeah. gentlemen. Now, what's all this I hear about Mr. Belden disappearing? That's right, Mr. Cook. But I've an idea. He'll soon be found. What do you mean by that, Mr. Carter? I've asked Mr. Cook to come down here because, as the cashier of the bank, he's the only one beside Mr. Belden who knows the combination to the large vault. And I want that vault opened. Immediately. But that's impossible, Mr. Carter. The large vault operates on a time lock. It can't be opened until 9 o'clock Monday morning. We can't wait that long. It must be open now. I'm sorry, Mr. Carter. That's impossible. Then I'll do it myself. But it's impossible, I tell you. Give me one hour and we'll see how impossible it is. don't seem to be having much luck, do you, Mr. Carter? Don't you worry about that, Mr. Pierce. I never saw the lock yet that could keep its secrets from Nick Carter very long. But not that kind of lock, Lieutenant. Why, there isn't anybody in the world that could... <coughs> By heavens, he did it. There we are, gentlemen. I told you so, Pierce. Rally. Huh? Look there. Yeah, wait, what is it, Nick? There in the corner. Oh, his father! <gasps> yes, Miss Belden. Your father's been murdered. <laughs> How's Miss Belden, Riley? Oh, she's all right now, Nick. Mr. Pierce took her back to the house. Good. Well, Mr. Cook, have you finished examining the contents of the vault? Yes, Mr. Carter, and you were right. There has been a robbery. $50,000 is missing. Well, I'll be just as the note said, Nick. Remember? 
Theft and murder. Yes, Riley. But the theft, I'm sure, was just an afterthought. Mr. Cook, did Mr. Belden have any enemies? Why, uh, not that I know of. What can you tell me about Mr. Pierce? What do you mean? Well, was he friendly with Mr. Belden? Oh, yes, yes, quite. They were very good friends. They'd known each other for years. And was Mr. Pierce in the habit of visiting Mr. Belden in his office at the bank? Oh, yes, yes, very often. He uh, had an account here, a rather large one, I might add. Mr. Pierce, you know, is a very wealthy man. Indeed? Yes, sir. Hey, well, what's that you've got in your hand there, Nick? Hmm? Oh, this, this. It's part of a cufflink, Riley, mm-hmm. with a very interesting stain on it. Mm-hmm. A fresh blood stain. Where'd you find it, Nick? In the dead man's hand. But there was no blood on the body. He he was done in by a crack on the skull. There there was no bleeding. Exactly, Riley. It's undoubtedly the murderer's own blood. Probably tore his hand on the broken edge of the cufflink in the scuffle. Do you uh, want me for anything else, Mr. Carter? Oh, uh, no, thank you, Mr. Cook. That'll be all. Well, good day. Good day, sir. Oh, Mr. Cook, one more thing. Yes? Tell me, is Mr. Pierce in the habit of wearing his gloves indoors? His gloves? Why, uh, why, no, never. But, uh, wait, come to think of it. He was wearing them just now, wasn't he? Yes, he was. Well, thank you, Mr. Cook. Thank you very much. Confounded, Patsy, this is the strangest case I've ever worked on. Well, you've certainly been acting strangely, Nick. Pacing up and down, muttering to yourself. There just isn't a shred of evidence anywhere, Patsy. As far as I can see, no motive whatsoever. Yet I'm positive that Butler Pierce is our man, that he's not only the murderer of Wayne Belden, but is also the society robber that's been baffling the police for months now. But, Nick, he's a rich man. And Wayne Belden was one of his best friends. I know, I know, Patsy, but it still adds up to Butler Pierce. Look, he was thoroughly familiar with the bank, thoroughly familiar with Wayne Belden's habits. He called at the Belden house after the crime had been committed. He wore his gloves indoors, which might have been to conceal a bad scratch from a broken cufflink. He arrived at police headquarters immediately after that stone had been thrown through the window. But, Nick, Miss Bellin was with him when he called to see Riley. Surely you don't think he could have thrown that stone? No, Patsy. But his chauffeur could have. While they were entering the building. His chauffeur? Yes. It was he who set me thinking on this line originally. Well, what do you mean by that? Patsy, I got a good look at that chauffeur. And I'm sure I've seen him somewhere before. A long time ago. Oh. And he wasn't on the right side of the law either. Well, it all sounds like a big hunch to me, Nick. Yes, you're right, Patsy. It's just what it is. A big hunch. Although I have to admit your hunches are usually pretty good. Patsy, I feel so sure this hunch is right, I'm going to play it for all it's worth. What are you going to do? I'm going to start playing it right now. That's Gubby for me. We're going calling on Mr. Butler Pierce. You're taking a long time opening that safe, Nick. Well, it's a tough baby, Scubby. But I've almost got it now. Well, I sure hope so, Nick. I don't think Mr. Pierce would like to come home and find us here in his library. Well, at this stage, I grant you, that would be a trifle embarrassing. But when I get through... Ah, I did it. Now, let's see what we have here. No, not there. Stop it. Look at this. Why, it's full of jewelry. And it's the real stuff. Yes. Unless I miss my bet, every piece of it will answer the description of some stolen gem. Well, let's see what else now. Uh Uh-oh. What's that, Nick? What does it look like? It looks like a package of bills. And all big ones, too. Exactly what it is, Scubby. Let's see how much. Five, ten. Boy, look at those thousand-dollar bills. Twenty, twenty, forty, forty-five, fifty thousand dollars, Scubby. The exact amount stolen from the bank. Well, of course, it could be a coincidence, Nick. Yes, it could be, but I doubt it. Ah, this does it. Scubby, we don't have to speculate any further. No. This letter I found on the drawer here clears up everything. Listen to this. Yeah. Dear Butler, this is a warning to you to permit you to escape if you care to do so. I have definite proof that you're a thief. And on Monday morning, I shall place that proof before the proper authorities. You have until that time to escape. Signed, Wayne Belden. Gosh, Nick. Yes, Scubby, gosh. And there we have the motive for Wayne Belden's murder. So your hunch was right after all, Nick. The rich Mr. Pierce is nothing but a thief and a murderer, Scubby. Oh, well, look, Nick, you better get out of here. Scubby, it just came to me. What? Butler Pierce's chauffeur is really Jim Martin. I knew I'd seen him before. Jim Martin? I never heard of him, Nick. No, that was before your time. Oh. I tangled with him many years ago on the West Coast. One of the cleverest cracksmen in the business. He could open almost any safe I could. Oh, so that's it. 
He and Pierce have been working together. Yes. Pierce were the front and real brains, while Martin supplied the technical skills, so to speak. Oh, I see. Well, what now, Nick? Scubby? Yeah. I want you to clear out of here quick. Take Wayne Belden's letter with you. Mm-hmm. Get it to Lieutenant Riley immediately and tell him to pick up Jim Martin. Oh, well, what about Butler Pierce? Don't you worry about him, Scubby. I'm staying right here. I want to tackle Butler Pierce myself. <laughs> Good evening. Nick Carter, what are you doing in my house? Waiting for you, Mr. Pierce. What do you want? I want you to be reasonable and not make any fuss. This isn't the water pistol I've got in my hand. Have you gone mad? What in the world are you talking about? It's no go, Pierce. You can drop the act. I took the liberty of going through your safe. Oh, so that's it. You're pretty clever at getting into safes, aren't you? Yes. As good at it as your pal, Jim Martin. Oh, I see. Well, I guess I underrated you, Carter. No, Pierce. You overrated yourself. Perhaps. What's your next move? My next move is to turn over to the law a thief and a murderer. Turn around. Get your hands behind you. Uh Uh-huh. So there is a scratch on your wrist, just as I expected. There. Guess those handcuffs ought to hold you for a while. Sit down on that chair. And stay there. Police headquarters. Riley speaking. Oh, hello, Riley. This is Nick. Oh, yes, Nick. What is it? Riley, I got the murderer of Wayne Belden for you. Oh, you have, eh? Mm-hmm. Good work. Who is it, Nick? Butler Pierce. Butler Pierce? Uh, Nick, are you sure you're not making a mistake? Quite sure. Scubby should be at my headquarters any minute now, with all the proof you want. Uh, where are you calling from, Nick? From Pierce's home. He's sitting in a chair right behind me with a pair of handcuffs on him. Oh. I'll expect you to... Nick! Nick, what is it? Hello! Hello! Oh, Nick, are you all right? Oh. He's coming to now, Patsy. How do you feel, uh, Nick? Oh, I'm all right, I guess. Oh, brother, my head. Yeah, that was a nasty bump you got, my boy. Oh, well, I'll take it easy, Nick. Here, give me your hand. Uh, I'll, I'll help, help you up. you go, Nick. Take yeah. it easy. All right, I'm so now. Sorry. Well, well, can you stand up all right, boy? Yeah, I guess I'm okay now. Well, what happened? Your guess is as good as mine, Patsy. All I know is that I had Butler Pierce in my hands, and now he's gone. Uh, that's too bad, Nick. Hey, look at the safe. It's empty. Well, naturally it would be. You couldn't leave all that evidence lying around. Well, it's a good thing we got that letter at least. Yes, but the important thing is to find Pierce. He must be pretty clever, Nick, getting away from you like that. Yes, Patsy. He's all of that and more. He got away this time. But I'll bring him to justice if it's the last thing I ever do. Nick, we got Jim Martin anyway. Picked him up late last night. Good work, Riley. Well, that's half the gang anyway. Yeah, now if we only had Butler Pierce. Yes, but I think it's going to be a lot easier now with Jim Martin in our hands. Well, what do you mean? Got an idea, Riley. If it works, it won't be long before we catch up with Wayne Belden's murderer. <laughs> meet again. Yeah. Been a long time, ain't it, Carter? Yes. But I never forget a face, Martin. No matter how much has been changed. I must say, though, that the doctor did a pretty good job on you. But it just isn't quite good enough. Yeah, you're a smart egg, all right. I guess the boss knows that by now. He's a pretty keen one himself, Martin. I had him, but he got away. Yeah, huh? Mm-hmm. Boy, he sure is a slick one. And I thought when I had the cuffs on him... Say, you didn't make the mistake of trying to hold him with a pair of handcuffs, did you? Yes. Why? (laughs) There ain't a pair made that could hold Butler Pierce. He's a regular whiz. Maybe so. Martin, you're in a pretty tough spot. Murder's serious business. Murder? Oh, no. You're barking up the wrong tree, Carter. I didn't have nothing to do with that. 
But you did open the vault at the bank. Sure. Like I don't all the job for Pierce after he paid the way. But murder, that ain't my racket. Uh, maybe not. But it'll go a lot easier with you, Martin, if you play ball. Meaning? You know where Pierce's hideout is. Sure. What about it? We want you to help us put the finger on him. <laughs> now, you ought to know me better than that, Carter. That's what I thought you'd say. I have a proposition for you, Martin. You help us track him down, we'll set you free. The answer is still the same. I'm no stool pigeon. Well, Martin, we're going to let you walk out of here anyway. What do you say to that? I say it won't work, Carter. What do you mean? Listen, I'm on to your game. You're going to set me loose so you can tail me. Ain't that it? Because that's the last thing I'd ever do. And I'm telling you that right now. And yet, Martin, that's exactly what you're going to do. Lead us right to Butler Pierce. <laughs> you must be off your nut. I wouldn't even try to go near him. In fact, I'd do everything I could to throw you off. I know that, Martin. And yet, in spite of yourself, you're going to help us catch Butler Pierce. Uh, Clerk. Yes, sir? Any mail for me today? Name's Martin. James Martin. Just a minute. I'll see. No, nothing, Mr. Martin. Thanks. Hello, Martin. You expecting a letter from someone? Who are you? I'll give you one guess. That ought to be enough. Oh, you must be the guy that's following me. One of the guys, Martin. I'm Scubby Wilson. I work with Nick Carter. Ah, glad to see you. You know, I've been getting sort of anxious the last few days to know what you guys look like. <laughs> yes, I can understand that. Must have been quite a strain on you, knowing that you were being watched every minute of the day and not knowing who was doing the watching. Yeah, it was sort of getting me down a little. <laughs> well, that's what Mr. Carter was figuring on, I guess. Oh, yeah? Mm-hmm. <laughs> a lot of good it's going to do him. You never know, Martin. Hey, I can't figure this thing at all. Oh, you're not supposed to, Martin. No, you just keep on having a good time, that's all. You bet I will. And as for Nick Carter, you can tell him from me... Whatever his scheme is, it ain't working, see? How do you know it isn't working? I haven't led you to Pierce yet, have I, pal? No, not yet. But you will. <laughs> You're nuts, too. You're all nuts. Good night. Good night. Oh, but Martin, uh, knowing Nick Carter as I do, I don't think we're the ones that are nuts. <laughs> Nicky, you don't look like that little plan of yours is going to pay off, does it now? Be patient, Riley. Just a question of time is all. Uh, but, but Martin's been on the loose now for over two weeks. How, how much longer are we going to wait, Nick? As long as necessary. Who oh, are we now? Yes, Riley, you agreed. Yeah. I'm positive that what we're doing is the one sure way of getting on Pierce's trail. Well, it sure don't seem very positive to me. You've got plain clues men and detectives out looking for him, haven't you? Well, sure. We set out a general alarm just as soon as Pierce got away from you. Have they brought him in yet? Well, uh, no. See what I mean? My way is slow, Riley, but it's sure. Well, Nick, all I can say is I wish I was as sure of that as you are. If we don't get pierced this way, they're going to laugh me right out of the department. Using up valuable men and time, just keeping an eye on his counter that they should be behind bars this very second. He will be, Riley. Just as soon as we get pierced, too. They keep him company. Uh, 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 police headquarters. Lieutenant Riley speaking. Yeah, 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 he's here. For you, Nick. Yeah. Mm, thanks, Ray. Hello? Oh, yes, Gubby. Yeah? Uh, oh, you did it. Okay, that's fine, Scubby. Good work. So long, Scubby. Well, Riley, it looks like this is it. Yeah? What happened? Did Martin finally get in touch with Pierce? No, Riley. It happened as I expected. The mountain came to Mohammed. Who did what? Unless I'm very much mistaken, Pierce has finally got in touch with Martin. Who is it? It's me, Jim. Oh. Don't you recognize my voice? Hello, Jimmy. Hello. 
Who are you? May I come in? Uh, look, lady, I'm afraid there's some mistake. You got the wrong party. There's no mistake, Martin. Holy Mac, it's you, Pierce. Yes, it's me. Gosh, boss, I've seen most of your disguises, but this beats them all. You really look like a woman. Thanks. Hey, uh, you shouldn't have come here, though, boss. It's dangerous. Yes, Martin, very dangerous. For you? What, what do you mean, boss? I don't like a squealer, Martin. A squealer? Me? Hey, you got this all wrong. Have I? I never ratted on anyone, boss. I wouldn't start now. Not even to save your own neck? You were in this thing as deep as I, you know. Sure, I know that, but whatever gave you the idea, I'd rat on you. What gave me the idea? <laughs> oh, well, I get it. You mean, why am I out of jail? Well, honest, boss, this wasn't my idea. Carter let me go. You see, he That's had That's enough, a... Martin. You think I'm a fool? Let you go, huh? Just like that. Well, I won't be so generous, stool pigeon. Hey, what are you doing, boss? No, well, you ain't gonna use that gat on me. Guess again, Squealer. You're making a mistake, boss. Please, you gotta listen to me. Let me tell you how it happened. No, Martin, you listen to me and I'll tell you. Carter didn't have a thing on me. Not a thing, do you understand? Yeah, sure. Then he spotted your ugly mug and put two and two together. I didn't think anybody would recognize that pan of yours anymore. But somehow Carter did. So he had you picked up. And what he got out of you must have been plenty. I swear to you. Shut up. Why else would Carter have let you go? I, I don't know. I'll tell you why. Because you spilled the works, Martin. Spilled the works and got your freedom for it. No, that ain't why they let me go. It was all a scheme they had. What are you talking about? Sure, boss. They told me they'd let me go if I steered them to the hideout. But I wouldn't do it. Not me. No. So they let you out anyway. Yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Okay, Squealer, I've heard enough. No, no, boss, no. Oh. Oh. Great shooting, Nick. You knocked the gun right out of his hand. Nick Carter. Yes, Mr. Butler Pierce. We meet again. You all right, Martin? Yeah, I guess so, but we didn't get here any too soon. Oh, so I was right, you rat. You were expecting... Relax, huh? Pierce, relax. Martin wasn't expecting anyone. He played square with you right along. Yes, then what was he doing on the loose? Just a temporary arrangement, Pierce. It was a trap we set for you, and you obliged us by walking right into it. Very clever of you, Carter. Not at all. You see, Mr. Pierce, I based my plan on the belief that at bottom you were not so clever. Really? And how do you mean that? Because instead of doing the really clever thing, getting as far away from here as you possibly could, I felt sure that your personal vanity would lead you to expose yourself to almost any risk in order to get the man you thought had betrayed you. All gangsters react that way. You can hardly consider me a gangster, Mr. Carter. At heart, that's exactly what you are. And that's what I counted on. So you had it all figured out. Yes. I also counted on your pal Martin doing exactly as he did. After we let him go, he laid low for a while. He prayed of what we were going to do. But after a few days of that, he got bored doing nothing, just as I figured he would. He made a lot of money out of jobs you two did together, and now he wanted to spend some of it. So we stepped out, visited the high spots, stayed at a fine hotel. So I heard. Yes, I knew you would. Matter of fact, I counted on him. You figured we'd let him loose and had paid him well for squealing on you. Well, Pierce, you put two and two together, all right, but you got the wrong answer. And the wrong answer you got is going to send you to the electric chair. It's the end of the road for you, Mr. Pierce. Mr. Carter, I'm going to take my hat off to you. Really, Martin? And to what am I indebted for this great honor? Well, you said I'd lead you to Pierce, and I said I wouldn't. And you made me do it. And you even knew what I was thinking all the time I did it. Yes, Carter. You're cleverer than I thought you were. Thank you, gentlemen. I'm uh, very happy I can't say the same for you two. <laughs> This has been another of the strange adventures of Nick Carter, Master Detective, which are brought to you regularly at the same time each week by WOR Mutual. Uh, what's your story going to be next week, Nick? Well, the title of the story that I want to tell you next week really gives you the clue to the whole thing. I call it The Corpse in the Cab. Oh, you mean, I suppose, that you're going to tell us how the corpse got into the cab, who the corpse was, and so on. Is that the idea? That's the idea, Mrs. Scott. But it's not nearly as simple as it sounds when you tell it. There were no clues on the corpse. No means of identification at all. That isn't quite true, Patsy. It would have been literally true if you hadn't been called in on the job. You know, Lieutenant Riley was completely stumped. Yes, but I'm not sure just how little it takes to stump our friend Riley completely. <laughs> anyway, Mr. Scott, 
If Nick hadn't been able to apply a little real deductive reasoning to the few bits of evidence he could find, the case would still be a mystery. I know that. Well, Patsy, however that may be, I can assure you that next week's story will keep your guessing right to the very end. And until then, so long, folks. So long, everybody. And so long to you both, Nick and Patsy. In the strange adventure you have just heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark, Patsy by Helen Choke, Scubby by John Kane. The story was written for Nick Carter by Ralph Berkey. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was under the direction of Jock McGregor. Next week at the same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter entitled... The Corpse in the Cab. For Nick Carter and the mystery of the murder in the park. This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. The Return of Nick Carter is produced in the studios of WOR and is broadcast over most of these stations every Saturday evening at 7 o'clock Eastern War Time. And don't forget the adventures of Nick's adopted son, Chick Carter, are broadcast over most of these stations Monday through Friday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern War Time. This is Mutual. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the case of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure... The Corpse in the Cab. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Murder in the Park. Taxi? Taxi? Uh, Mr. Ramsey, you are very kind indeed to take such an interest in this uh, problem. Well, dear fellow, I consider it my civic duty. Uh, Taxi! Ah, here's a cab now. Yes. Okay, gents, make it snappy. We're blocking traffic. All right. You get in first. My party, you know, my party. Uh, Thank you. Where to, gents? I guess the quickest way to get there is through the park. Yes, drive through the park. I'll tell you where to turn. Okay. I believe it is on West 54th Street. And there's a flag out there. Excuse me, uh, uh, driver. Yeah? Uh, Do you mind if I shut this glass partition between us? Go right ahead, boss. You're paying the fare. Here, let me do it for you. Ah, well, that's better. Nice winter evening. Stars twinkling. Ought to pick us up for the grim business ahead. Ah, lucky thing I ran into you. Lucky thing. <laughs> yes, indeed, Mr. Ramsey. It seems fate destined me to make your acquaintance this afternoon. Yes, lucky thing. <laughs> Mr. Ramsey. <laughs> Just my little way of keeping air out of the windpipe. <laughs> Oh, there you are, my dear fellow. (sighs) Mighty lucky thing I ran into you tonight. You gotta help me, Nick. You gotta. They'll slap me in stir. Now take it easy, Shorty. Take it easy. Now, tell me again exactly what happened. Like I said, two guys hail my cab. One of them says to drive through the park. He'll tell me where to turn out. And when you get out of the park? The one guy opens the petition again and says to pull up. He's getting out. He tells me to drive the other guy to the precinct police station. And, Nick, if I hadn't looked around when I came to the intersection and seen what I seen, 
I'd have driven right up to the bull house with a dead body in my cab. Me, Shorty Bentano. You don't remember what the man looked like, Shorty. In the dark? I ain't got cat's eyes, Nick. <laughs> Gee, what's that? You are jumpy. And just Patsy buzzing me in the talkback. Oh. Nick, in the inimitable words of Mr. Winchell, my stomach and my backbone are now a twosome. When do we eat? You'll have to order yourself a sandwich, Patsy. We've got work to do. Work? Tonight? Mm-hmm. And Patsy, get me a police headquarters. Lieutenant Riley. Okay, Nick. You're going to turn me in, Nick? I thought you'd help me. I am going to help you, Shorty. But the sooner the police know about the murdered man outside in your cab, the better it is for you. You're crazy, Nick. I done time. I ain't got a chance. If the cops find that stiff in my buggy, it's curtains for me. I'm getting out of here. Shorty, sit down there. Nick, they'll give me the hot seat for something I never done. No, they won't, Shorty. Not while my name's Nick Carter. <laughs> Nobody gets through here. I'll beat Halnick. Not one bit of identification on this body. No bullet trace, no knife, no nothing. Well, what did you want the murderer to do, Riley? Leave his calling card? Uh, I'm always getting stuck with one of these dud cases. It takes months to solve them. We don't even know who this tiff is. Now, Riley, flash your light inside here again. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. You see something? I'm just looking. You see, his pockets are turned inside out. Uh, the motive was robbery, all right. No, Riley, I don't think so. Huh? Doesn't look prosperous enough to rob. Ah, uh, Nick, you're always looking for what's not there. That might mean something, too. Huh? Now, Riley, evidently the murderer didn't care to have his victim's identity uncovered too soon. Say, what are you looking at his hands for, Nick? Riley, have your laboratory analyze this white powder under the nail of his right index finger. Well, say, that there is something under his fingernail. Yes. I have an idea. You'll find it's chalk. Chalk? Well, sure, you're a smart one, Nick. Yeah, with these lily white hands, it... hey, this guy was a pool player, a professional, maybe, huh? Maybe. But don't bank on it. Now, Riley, about Shorty. I'm holding him, Nick. Never fear about that. Now, look, Riley, he's a favor to me. Don't pull him in yet. Oh, great jumping banshees, Nick. I've got to. Listen, Riley, he had nothing to do with his murder. If he were a party to it, he'd have dumped the body out somewhere, wouldn't he? Well... Well, Certainly he would. Shorty's been on the right side of the fence ever since he got out of the big house. And he's given me a hand on cases from time to time. I know. You owe him a favor, and I owe you a barrel of them. Well, that's about it. Well, okay. I'll shut my eyes for 24 hours. No longer, though, mind you. Thanks, Riley. Uh, Nick, where, where are you going? To find a murderer. Boy, this is some buggy you got here, Nick. Four speeds ahead, a siren, two searchlights... Anytime you need a chauffeur regular, I'll hire Ron. Like driving my car, huh? It's like handling a baby carriage. Uh-oh, we're turning into 54th Street now, Nick. All right, Shorty. Slow down a little. Now, what was it you heard your passenger say? One says the quickest way to get there is through the park. I'll tell you where to turn off. And then the other guy says it's on West 54th Street and there's a flag out. And then the other guy shuts the partition and I don't hear no more. Well, 54th Street doesn't run very far here on this side. I don't see nothing on this block. Flags, flags. Usually in public buildings, aren't they? You think maybe this is going to be a clue, Nick? Shorty, everything's a clue when you don't have much to go on. Nick, look. Flagpole. Yeah, very handsome flagpole. Yeah, but it's a police station. A police station? Good. What's good about it? Let's get out of here. You're safe until tomorrow night, Riley. Riley keeps his word. You want I should uh, keep going slow? Nope. I got the first link in our chain. You can put the speed on again. Where to now? To pick up Patsy. I sent her to the Bureau of Missing Persons on 30th Street. Ah, oh, Nick. Another cop house. I don't like them places. George Day, 
2345 Elmhurst Drive, occupation truck driver. When last seen, was wearing gray coveralls. No, he's not the one. Gee, Nick, the guy ain't been missing long enough for anybody to get excited about it. He's only been dead a few hours. I'm playing a hunch, Shorty. Oh. You want me to read the rest of the names on the list, Nick? Wait a minute, Patsy. Hmm? Do you have a school teacher on the list? Yes. How did you know? Never mind. What did it look like? Well, uh, let me see. Um, yeah. Ivan Johnson, number two, St. Anne's Drive, occupation, professor of ancient history. Good. When last seen, was wearing dark blue overcoat, gray hat, white shirt, blue tie, and always wears... Wears pince nez glasses. Yes. So did our corpse. The glasses were missing at the time, but the bridge of his nose bore prints of them. Boy, I'm glad I'm going straight. Even the dead wake up and talk when Nick Carter gets on the case. Nick, how in the world did you know it would be a school teacher? Well, I didn't for sure. But nose glasses, plus chalk under the nail of the index finger, plus a sensitive face and the general appearance added up to teacher for me when I looked at the corpse. Next, I figured if he were a school teacher, he'd be expected home by five o'clock. His wife or family would be unduly worried if he hadn't showed up by eight or so and would call the missing persons bureau. But who'd want to murder a poor school teacher? One step at a time, Betsy. And we know this much already. Our Mr. Johnson intended going to the 54th Street police station when he and his murderer hailed Shorty's cab. Oh, I see, Nick. Then you think that Professor Johnson was killed because of something he intended to tell the authorities. Mm -hmm. Simple the way he tells it, ain't it? One, two, three. Yes, you're very clever, Mr. Carter. But don't you think maybe his wife could tell us what it was he was going to tell the cops? Perhaps he told her first. Yes, Patsy, that's just what I do think. Uh, what was his address? Mm, just a minute. Oh, yes, here it is. Number 2 St. Anne's Drive. Right. Okay, Shorty. Take us to number 2 St. Anne's Drive and hurry. <laughs> Mrs. Johnson, I'm Nick Carter. And this is my assistant, Patsy Bowen. How do you do? How do you do, Mrs. Johnson? Did the police send you, Mr. Carter? Did they find him? Did they find my husband? I'm only here to ask you a few questions concerning your husband. Oh, then they haven't found him. I, uh, I really can't say. Now, tell me, did your husband mention whom he was going to see after school hours today? Ivan always comes right home after his classes. I thought that he might have had some special appointment today. Oh, no, no. Mr. Johnson, uh, how was your husband feeling when he left for school this morning? Oh, he, he was in such a mood this morning. Talked about right and justice until my, my head fairly whirled. You know, he doesn't like to see people cheated, Mr. Carter. Ivan's a very honest person. What do you mean, cheated, Mrs. Johnson? He said he wasn't going to stand by and see the students in his school tricked out of their dimes and quarters. He was going to see right and justice done. The kids were being cheated. Uh, what school is this? Central High School. Ivan is the ancient history professor. He's taught there for 12 years. And where's his office there? Why, he's at the same office all that time. Number 12 on the first floor. I've always been happy about that. It's such a sunny little room. Well, Mrs. Johnson, you've been very helpful. Do you think they'll find him tonight? Do you think something terrible has happened? Why, the police will keep you informed. Good night. Good night, Mrs. Johnson. Try to get some sleep. Oh, thank you, but I, I, I couldn't. Not till Ivan's home. Safe. Nick, I thought you were going to the school where Professor Johnson taught. That's not over here in the West Side Business District. Glad to see you on your toes, Patsy, and working on all four cylinders. Nose to the grindstone, shoulder to the wheel, and all that. I'm proud of you. All right, all right. But what are we doing over here? In just a moment, you'll see for yourself. This is the place, Nick. Right, Shorty. All right, come on, Patsy. Want me to go with you, Nick? No, you stay here and keep your eyes open. Okay, and good luck. Come on, Patsy. We still got a lot to do if we want to keep Shorty out of Lieutenant Riley's foul clutches. I'm glad they didn't lock the front door in this office building tonight. Hey, that's funny. There's no night watchman here. There usually is. Well, Patsy, never look a gift horse in the teeth. No watchman, no trouble. Hey, it's spooky in here. There's one little light in this whole foyer. Wish we'd brought Shorty in with us. He'll do us more good, keeping watch outside. 
You really think this is where Ivan Johnson was this afternoon? Well, we know Shorty picked him up in front of this building. And this is the only office building in this block. All the rest are warehouses. It's pretty deserted, if you ask me. Mm-hmm. And the elevators, of course, have stopped for the night. And this is a ten-story building. Well, Nick, maybe if we look at the directory board, we'll be able to figure out what office Professor Johnson might have visited. Well, that's what I'm hoping. Now, let's see. Ah, hmm. uh, doesn't seem to be a name on this directory that helps us out at all. There isn't, is there? Oh, Nick, what'll we do? Doesn't take much brain work to figure that one. Maybe we can tell if we have a look at the doors of the offices in this building. So, we'll just have to go from office to office. Now, come on, let's start climbing. Well, there's nobody on this floor. All doctors and dentist offices. Don't think Johnson's business was with any of them today. Come on, up we go. See anything on this floor, Nick? No, nobody or nothing to interest a school teacher. Nick, I don't think I can make another floor. You've got to, Patsy. We must cover every floor. This is the top. Yeah. And we don't know any more than we did before. Nick, this place is as empty as the number two ration book. We might as well... Shh. What is it? thought I heard something. Nick, there's someone in that office. Yeah. And yet the lights are out. The name on the door says Gerald Ramsey, promotion counselor. Let's pay him a visit. Stay behind me now. To the left of my flash. All right. <laughs> and who is flashing that pretty light in my office at this time of night? Mr. Ramsey. That's my name. And yours? Nick Carter. Surely you don't mean that you're Nick Carter, the great detective. That's who he is, Mr. Ramsey. Sorry to bother you, Mr. Ramsey, but my assistant and I were just having a look around this building. Oh, well, too bad the fuse is blown out of my office here. Or you could have a good look. <laughs> Who are you after? You don't happen to know of any business in this building that might have dealings with a school teacher, do you? A school teacher? Mm hmm. Let me see. A school teacher? Why, no, uh, no, if there is, I never heard of it. But then there's such a lot I never heard of. Uh oh. Oh, you. You knocked over that whole stack of packages. Oh, I'm so sorry, Mr. Ramsey. I, I dropped my handkerchief and I was leaning over to pick it up. Uh, anything breakable in them? Oh, no, 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 it's. Quite all right. Oh, thank goodness for that. Yes, uh, just some things a friend of mine left here until he came back. Just leave them there. I'll take care of them. No, at least let me pick them up. No, 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 no. Uh, never mind. Just leave them there. They uh, they won't mind staying where they are for a while, I'm sure. Well, all right, if you say so. Yes, I do. So you can just run along and continue your search for whatever it was you were looking for. Good evening. Good evening. Now, Patsy, if you're okay, we better be on our way. Sorry we disturbed your uh, reverie, Mr. Ramsey. Reverie? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> really? He was an odd specimen. You think he knows anything, Nick? Well, if he does, he isn't talking. Come on. Oh, gosh, Nick, all that climbing up and downstairs just for nothing. I'm worn out. Maybe it wasn't all for nothing, Patsy. You mean you found a clue somewhere here? I don't mean anything yet. Oh, but Nick... I hope you can still walk well enough to get down the ten flights of stairs ahead of us, Patsy. I don't feel quite like carrying you just now. I guess I can make it under my own power. Where to now? Central High School. Time's a-wasting. And we still haven't uncovered a clue to the murder of the man in Shorty's cab. Nick, what do you expect to find in a schoolhouse at this time of night? Clues to Johnson's murder, I hope. Well, no use, Nick. The janitor's not here. I'll have one more try. That racket should wake up the ghost of Hamlet. Hmm. No answer. 
So? So Nick Carter's trusty pick lock will do the trick. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's black as pitch in there. Stay right beside me. Mm, seems to me I heard that one before tonight. And look, Nick. Hmm? I barked my shins in the dark in that, that character's office. And so if you don't mind, this time I'd like to see where I'm going. Okay, Betsy. I'll use my flash and keep it down low. Shin height. No, well, that's better. Now, come on. Better hurry or our friend Shorty's going to be sitting in the clink with a murder rap pinned on him. Okay. And she said his office was on the first floor, didn't she? Mm, yes, number 12. All bright and sunny. Here we are, Nick, number 12. I wish it were bright and sunny in here now. This time we'll just dispense with the formalities of announcing ourselves. Well, the door's open, Nick. Yes, so it is. Come on. Snap on the light, Betsy. Switch is right behind you. Okay. Hey. Well, looks like somebody else has given Mr. Johnson's room a going over. I'm afraid we got here too late. Papers all over the floor, window wide open. What do you suppose they were looking for? Same thing we are, Patsy. Clues. Except for a different reason. You think it was the murderer? Could be. Well. What are you reading, Nick? There's a poster on the wall here. Oh. A dollar buys a destroyer, high school students. Subscribe just one dollar to the high school victory league. And helped by a destroyer. That's the second time tonight I've seen something like that. A dot. Do- do- <laughs> oh, where's my hanky? Need any help? No, I've got one right here in my pocket. There. Hey, wait a minute. Where'd you get this? What? The sticker that came out of your pocket with a handkerchief. Well, I don't know, Nick. Why? Why? It's got the same legend stamped on it that that poster has. Victory League. Well, so it has. Did you buy this sticker? No, I buy my destroyers by buying war bonds. Well, think, Patsy. Where did you get it? It was in your pocket with your handkerchief. Well, I don't know, Nick. I, I never put anything in this little pocket except my handkerchief. I can swear this sticker was... Wait, Patsy. Ah! See anybody? No. No, nobody here now. Are you okay, Patsy? Well, I guess so. What happened? I just happened to look up in time to see a man poking a gun through the open window. So that's why you pushed me out of the way so fast. Yes, there was no time to be polite. Thanks, Nick. Did you recognize the man at the window? No. Too bad. But he got away. Gee, Nick, you certainly shot that light out fast. Well, if he can't see us, he can't shoot us. A very logical deduction, Mr. Carter. Hey, Patsy. Hmm? Give me that sticker you picked up tonight. You think it means something to this case? You bet I do. I've just remembered where I've seen one like it. Where, Nick? Never mind now. Well, Patsy, this case is beginning to add up. I'm not mistaken, the sticker splits it wide open. Come on, I've got a job for you to do on your own, and right now. That means you've got a job that you're going to do on your own. Right. Now, this is the plan. And if it works, we'll nail our murderer red-handed. Boss, you in here? My dear fellow, you know I'm in here. Did you get the fuse fixed? Yeah, and while I was fixing it, I got something else, too. Come on in, you. Hey, snap on the light and see what I picked up snooping around down the basement of this building. See? Nick Carter. Well, well, well. Mr. Carter, back again. Still looking for the same thing? No, I found what I was looking for. Oh, good. Good. It's very fine. I already lifted his rod, boss. What'll I do with him now? Huh? You've had your chance, my dear fellow. Now it's mine. You know, I have the general impression you men don't like me very well. Oh, sure, Mr. Carter. We love you. But we'll love you a lot better when you don't talk no more. Put very bluntly, Mr. Carter, but that is the idea. Now, Mr. Ramsey, just what do you think I could say that would harm you? Now, don't let him fool you, boss. When I was hiding in the bushes outside the window back there at the schoolhouse, I heard him tell the dame the case was wide open. Shut up, Lefty. Oh, so it was you who took those shots at us through the window. Yeah, and you ain't going to do nothing about it. Yeah, you was pretty smart, though, figuring out it was Mr. Ramsey what rubbed out the school teacher. You are a complete idiot. Stop that fool tongue of yours. Ah, what's a dip, boss? He ain't going to live to tell it. Hmm, true. That's true, Yes, yeah, since you know so much already, we have only one recourse, Mr. Carter. 
Give me the gun, Lefty. Here you are, boss. Uh, this one's on me. Just a minute, Ramsey. As long as I'm not going to live to tell it, maybe you'll confirm a deduction I made. Certainly, my dear fellow. A condemned man is always granted one last request. Speak up. This high school victory league's a fauna, isn't it? You're playing on the patriotism of school kids to get them to donate their money to build destroyers and planes. But the money never gets any further than your own pocket. Isn't that it? Oh, yes, Mr. Carter. Since you put it bluntly that way, I am forced to admit that you're entirely correct. But may I ask what it was that led you to believe that I was behind the league? Yes. When I was at Professor Johnson's office, I saw a poster on the wall advertising your dirty league. Oh, please, Mr. Carter. I mean just that. Swindling high school students out of their few dollars in the name of a patriotism that you never knew the meaning of is about the lowest form of stealing that I know of. Boy, just let me take a poke at <laughs> him, will you? No, no, no. We can afford to be good-natured. Mr. Carter hasn't much time left, you know. Do go on, Mr. Carter. As I said, I saw the poster on the wall advertising your dirty racket. And then Patsy found one of your stickers in her handkerchief where she'd picked it up off your floor. I recall then seeing that each of the packages she knocked over in here had a sample sticker pasted on it. It was easy enough then to put two and two together and get the required four. It's too bad that your undoubted excellence in mathematics can't save you. And all because one little school teacher suspected his kids were being cheated. Poor Professor Johnson. It is too bad for him that I found him wandering around this building, looking for the offices of the high school victory league. He told me he suspected it was a phony outfit, and he was going to see right and justice done. <laughs> I offered to take him right to the police station. And I did. <laughs> Although I wasn't with him when he got there. <laughs> Very funny. Yes. Hurry up, boss. We got work to do. Yes. Well, Mr. Carter, this is it. Blast and banshees, Nick. Don't do this to me again. I tell you, my nerves won't stand it. Oh, what's the matter, Riley? You got your men. A lion on the ground here, howling like stuck pigs. Yeah, sure, but but what if I hadn't hit him when he aimed at you, Nick? What if I'd missed? Oh, Nick, your plan worked beautifully, the whole thing. Getting yourself found by Ramsey's henchman and my getting Riley up here to hear the confession and everything. Yeah, Patsy, but, but gee, don't run such a split-second chance of life and death again, Nick. My heart won't stand it. Well, that was worth it. Just to see Ramsey walk into the trap like a bear looking for honey. Hey, Nick. Oh, Shorty, come on in. Take a look at our handiwork. Gee, so that's the bum who tried to frame me to the hot seat. He'll be getting it himself before long, thanks to Nick Carter. Early, I want to tell you something. Of all the criminals I've tracked down, catching Ramsey gave me the most pleasure. A fellow like that, trading on the patriotism of school kids, is about the lowest rat in the world. Why, bad as the Nazis are, a guy like this is worse. You're right, Nick. You said it, Nick. Well, Riley, you've got all the evidence you need. Mm -hmm. The package of posters in the next room, the package of stickers here, and the confession. Right, Nick. We can take over from here. Thanks. Okay, Riley. So long. So long, Nick. So long, Patsy. So long, Lieutenant. Well, Patsy, come on. Chin up. Carry on and all that sort of thing. It's oh. not my chin that's worrying me, Nick. It's having to walk down those ten flights of stairs again. That'll be the fourth trip tonight. Why, Patsy. And at your age, too. Look, Nick. Can't we just sit here on the top step for the next six hours? You think you'd be rested enough then to walk down the ten flights? I think that by then the elevators will be running again. And what a wonderful invention the elevator is. This has been another of the strange adventures of Nick Carter, Master Detective, which are brought to you regularly each week at this same time by WOR Mutual. Now, tell us a little about next week's story, Nick. Well, next week's story includes rather more adventure than actual detecting. But if Nick hadn't been able to make the first few deductions that really started him off on the right track, there would have been no adventure. And there was adventure and plenty of it. I came nearer to meeting my match when I met Dr. Donaldson than in any other time in my career. This Dr. Donaldson was a specialist in secret and dangerous poisons, and he tried one of them out on Nick. But in the end, I managed to get the better of him and solve a mystery that had the police completely stopped. We call it the empty coffin because it was an empty coffin that gave us the first clue. And it was two different doctors making out two separate death certificates for the same death that led to that first clue. Well, that's enough for now. Join us next week for the story of the empty coffin. So long. So long, folks. And so long to you, Nick and Patsy. Until next week. In the strange adventure you have just heard, 
Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark. Patsy by Helen Choate. The story was written for Nick Carter by Barth Conry. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was under the direction of Jock McGregor. Next week at this same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter entitled The Empty Coffin or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Doctor's Poison. This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. The return of Nick Carter is produced in the studios of WOR and is broadcast over most of these stations every Saturday evening at 7 o'clock Eastern Wartime. And don't forget that the adventures of Nick's adopted son, Chick Carter, are broadcast over most of these stations Mondays through Fridays at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Wartime. This is Mutual. for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure... Missing Harold Ascot. For Nick Carter and the great kidnapping mystery. And here's Nick Carter himself to tell you the story. As you probably already noticed, I'm not going to tell you the story that I announced last week. Instead, I want to tell you a rather different kind of tale. One which started as Patsy and I rang the doorbell at the rather magnificent home of Mrs. Philip Ascord, just off the upper end of the park at about 10.30 one morning. Yes? I'm Nick Carter. Mrs. Ascord's expecting me. Yes, Mr. Carter. Won't you come in, please? Thank you. If you and the young lady will go into the living room, I'll tell Mrs. Ascord you're here. Certainly. Gosh, Nick, the Ascots must have more money than they know what to do with. Just look at this place. Yes, Patsy, the Ascots belong to one of the oldest families in the city. Old and conservative, rich but never ostentatious. Mm, so I see. Gee, I wish I could oh, have... Quite. Put... I think I hear Mrs. Ascot coming. Oh, Mr. Carter, I want to thank you for coming so very promptly. I know how busy you are, but I really am in trouble, desperate trouble, and I, I don't know who else to turn to but you. Why, Mrs. Ascot, I'd be very happy to help you if I can. This is my assistant, Patsy Bourne. How do you do? You do. Now, what's wrong? It's my son, Harold, Mr. Carter. He's been kidnapped. I found this note inside my newspaper this morning. Hmm. Well, what does it say, Nick? It says we've got your son. If you want him back, don't call the cops. We'll tell you what to do later. There's no signature. Can you tell anything by that letter, Mr. Carter? Well, first, the handwriting is obviously disguised. Half printing and half writing. Papers, good bond paper. Ah, has a watermark that looks like a dragon's tail. Ah, the top of the sheet of paper's been cut off. A pair of scissors, apparently, as the cut isn't quite even. Why do you suppose they did that? Well, there was probably a letterhead on it, and the writer didn't want the paper traced, of course. Oh. But they didn't cut quite all of the pinning off. Can't read what's left, but later on it may help to identify it. It looks like hotel stationery, doesn't it, Nick? Yes, Patsy, that's what I was thinking. I'll have Scubby make a round of the hotels and see if he can find the one it came from. Oh, Mr. Carter, do you think you can find my boy? Well, I certainly hope so, Mrs. Ascord. And I'll do my best. But in the meantime, just sit tight and wait until you hear from me again. Or until the kidnapped gang makes its next move. Oh, hiya, Nick. Didn't take you long to get here. It's no time to waste in a kidnap case, Cubby. You never can be sure when the gang will get frightened or annoyed and kill their victim. Now, you find the same kind of newspaper here, you say? I sure did, Nick. The same size, same watermark. 
And as near as I can tell from what's left in the kidnap note, the same printing at the top. Good. But what now, Nick? How does knowing that the paper came from here help you any? If the paper came from here, it's quite possible that whoever wrote the kidnap note was staying here in the hotel at the time. Yeah. And if he was, the hotel register may give us a further clue. Oh, but the handwriting on the note was disguised, Nick. Not quite so, Scubby. But it's impossible to completely disguise any writing so that it may not be identified. Even when the writing's apparently completely changed, there will always be some peculiar characteristic left that'll give it away. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, clerk. Yes? Do you mind if we look at your register a moment? Not at all, sir. Here you are. Now, let's see. Young Ascot disappeared on Tuesday afternoon, and it's possible that the signature we want might be under Sunday or Monday's date. Well, do you know what to look for? Yes or no, Skippy. I've memorized the looks of the writing in the kidnapped note, and I expect to recognize any similar peculiarities in the signature here. Mm, no, nothing here under Sunday's date. Uh -huh. Let's try Monday. Okay, right over here. Look at this one. James Scannett. I never heard of him. Of course you haven't. Neither have I. But look at that S. Yeah. And the J. Uh -huh. Note how oddly they're made? This signature, like sure. the kidnap note, is half written and half printed, too. Evidently the work of a man who learned to write late in life. And a man who never writes easily. Oh, I see what you mean, Nick. No yeah. question, Scubby. This is our man. Clerk. Uh, yes, sir. Is this James Scannett in the hotel? <laughs> James Scannett? Uh, no, sir. He checked out this morning. Mm, I was afraid of that. You recall what he looked like? Oh, medium height, sandy-haired, little mustache. He had a crooked little finger on his right hand. I remember him because he asked a lot of questions last night. Mm, thanks, Bert. Well, do you know him, Nick? Why, yes, Skelly. But I sent that man up the river three years ago for a five-year stretch. Oh. Well, maybe he's out. Yeah, maybe. Hmm. I know a man who can tell me. I'll give him a ring and see. Come on. Well, whom did the description fit, Nick? Sounds like Jack Vincent, Scabby. Yeah? Forger and a con man. An old-timer at the business. I can't see for the world how... Oh, pardon me for a minute. Oh, sure, Nick. I'll wait here. It should turn out to be Jack Vincent. This case may prove to be quite interesting for both. Oh, hello, Bill. How are you? This is Nick Carter. Oh, fine, fine, thanks. Say, uh, Bill, is Jack Vincent still up at state prison? Oh, two weeks ago. Huh? No, nothing special yet. Well, thanks, Bill. Good luck. Goodbye. Well, what'd he say, Nick? Vincent was pardoned two weeks ago. Uh, uh, He's our man, all right. You know, it's a funny thing, Nick, but while you were in there phoning, a couple of men went by me, and I heard one of them say to the other, I saw Vincent Grady's bar last night. Well, maybe that's where he hangs out. You say you just heard that now, Scubby? Yeah, just now. That's queer. Well, how do you mean, Nick? Scubby, things are going a bit too easily. The note paper that can be traced, the name in the register, the description, and now the conversation you say you overheard. You mean you think it's some kind of a frame-up? Might be, Scubby. Might be. Well, gee, if it is, Nick, you if better If it is, take... I'm going ahead just as I was before. Just be a little bit more careful, that's all. Well, if they want me to go to Grady's bar, that's where I'm going. See you at the office later, Scubby. Fell for him, Jack. Hook, line, and sinker, just like you said. I gotta hand it to you. And you told him where he could find me? I said it real loud, right beside that stooge of his. I said I'd seen you in Grady's place here. He's coming here now? Yeah. I beat it on ahead to let you know he was coming. Good. We'll take care of him when he gets here. Gee, you're awful smart, Jack. Ain't no wonder I kind of go for you. Yeah, but don't forget, I owe him one, too. He sent my pop to the chair for bumping off that old rat of a watchman last winter. I ain't forgot that, you betcha. Okay, Gertie, cut the gab. Huh? Looks like Carter's coming in now. Ah, uh, he can't see us where we're sitting. Yeah, that's him. Hey, do I look okay in this apron I borrowed from Pete? Sure, you look like a regular waiter, Ben. Hey, got a tray? Yeah, yeah, right here. You sure he don't know you, Ben? Nah, he broke up my racket last year, but he never seen me. Gee, we all got it in for him, ain't we? You bet we have. And here's where I pays off. Watch me. Waiter. Yes, sir. Bring me a large ginger ale and coke, will you? Coming right up. Well, Nick, lots of familiar faces here, but nobody I really know. I wonder if Vincent might have moved out of town after he had the snatch. 
Can't that conversation Scubby overheard if he did over here. It sounds to me like... Here you are, sir. Oh, thanks. Here, give the change. Thank you, sir. <sighs> well, at least this ginger ale's cold. Doesn't taste that bad. Yeah, it's an odd flavor to it, though. There must be a new brand of Cokes they mix with it. Can't say that I enjoy it. Why, that's queer. Isn't hot enough in here to make me dizzy like this. You seem to be... Nick, you fool. You've been doped. You've been... You've been... Do <sighs> yeah, look it. He's out cold. Gee, Ben, you must have made it strong. You bet I did. I ain't taking no chances. I put three of them <laughs> in. I go on, Gertie, and get the car and make it fast. I don't want none of Carter's friends to come looking for him before we can get him out of here. Okay. This is the day I've been waiting for for three years. Well, he don't look much like a great detective, does he? All tied up and gagged like that. I'll say he don't. <laughs> he looks more like a trussed up chicken. Or a dead duck. And that's what he's <laughs> going to be as soon as he wakes up. A dead duck. You mean you ain't going to kill him now? No. Nah, there's no fun in killing him when he don't know who's doing it. I want him to look me in the eye when I send a bullet into his brain. Oh, gee, Jack, I thought you'd let me kill him. Nothing doing. This is my party. Private and exclusive. Did you get his guns? Yeah, both of them. Hey, should we leave him here in the back room for now, Jack? Yeah, he won't come to for another couple of hours. He'll be safe here. Yeah. Now, you and Gertie stay here and watch him. I got some stuff I want to take care of. I'll be back by the time he wakes up. Okay. Here you go, Mr. Master Detective. <clears throat> and there you stay till we're ready for you. Have a nice sleep. And keep your eye on Gertie, Ben. She might forget and bump him off all by herself. Nicholas Carter's office. Well, this is Mr. Vascourt speaking. Is Mr. Carter there? Why, no, he isn't. Has something else come up? Yes. Yes, I've got another note from the kidnappers. They want a hundred thousand dollars immediately. Good heavens, a hundred thousand dollars. Oh, what shall I do? Mr. Carter said to do nothing until I heard from him. Oh, I've no idea where he is. He should have been back here long ago. You better just do nothing, as he said, until we hear from him. He's bound to call me pretty soon. Unless unless something's happened to him. Well, it served me right for being such an idiot. I knew what I was walking into, and I walked right into it. Gosh, but it's dark in here. I wish I could sit. Wait a minute. What's that? Hey, Carter. You sent my pup to the chair, did you? And you'll never send nobody else there. Because you ain't going to live no longer. I'm going to fix you right now. I'm going <gasps> to... What the... So I'd have to be so rough with you, lady. But it's my life or yours. You're only stunned. Now, if I can reach that knife she dropped before she gets her senses back, I can cut these ropes and get free from... Just a little more. If I could only see behind my back, where is that knife? I want to be able to reach it now. Just... Ah! Uh, this rope on my wrist. <laughs> there, a little bit more. There, that's got it. Now for the leg ropes. Oh, oh. Quiet, uh, quiet, uh, you. You try to call for help, I'll be forced to kill you. You? How did you... I heard you coming in, so I sat up, stuck my legs out, and tripped you. You dropped your knife. I mm. knocked your head on the floor, and I stunned you. Then I found the knife, cut my ropes. Oh. Now I'm getting out of here. Oh, no, 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 you can't. Jack will kill me. He'll murder me. You should have thought of that before. Don't try anything. Your friends overlook this little pistol I carry in my shoulder holster. It's very small but effective, I assure you. What are you going to do? Why'd you dope and bring me here? To kill me? Well, Jack and Ben were scared you'd try to break up their plans for the kidnap yes, job. Yes, I knew it. Now, listen carefully. 
Who else is in this house now? Only Ben. He's in the next room. Good. And when I tell you to, call Ben. Tell him you're afraid I'm waking up. Ask him to come in here, but don't you warn him. You want me to, 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 to ask him to come in here? Yes, but no funny business. Now call him. All right. Ben? Ben? What do you want? I think Nick Carter's waking up. You better come have a look at him. You're quick. Yeah. Okay, don't touch him. You wait till Jack gets back and then... Look out, Up with your hands. I warned you. Now stand aside. I'm leaving here and don't try to stop me. I'll be seeing you both later under different circumstances. Nick, where in the world have you been? We've been waiting for you for hours. Sorry, Patsy. Anything special been going on? Anything special? I should say so. Mrs. Ascord has called five times. She got a note from the kidnappers telling her it would cost her $100,000 to get her son back. And she's going crazy waiting for you to tell her what to do. Hey, Patsy, have you heard anything from... From me, Scubby? Well, Nick, what happened to you? Jack Vincent laid a trap for me and I walked into it. Did you learn anything? No, Scubby, I didn't. Except that it all has to do with the kidnap case we're working on. Well, did you have any trouble, Nick? Well, depends on what you call trouble, Scubby. More of that later. Now, what about Mrs. Ascot? Well, she wants you to call her as soon as you come in. I'll get her for you. All right, Patsy. We've got to move fast. Maybe too late even now. My being there and getting away doesn't help any. Mrs. Ascot, just a minute, please. Here she is, Nick. All right. Hello, Mrs. Ascot. Sorry I've been uh, held up where you couldn't get hold of me. What's up? Oh, Mr. Carter, I received a note from my son. It says that I'll have to pay his kidnappers $100,000 if I want to get him back. The note also says that, that I've got to take you off the case or he will be killed. He says that, that, that so far they've not mistreated him, but he begs me to pay the money and get him free. Is the note in your son's handwriting? Oh, yes, yes, I'm sure of that. What shall I do, Mr. Carter? Well, does the note give you any way of getting in touch with him? Yes. Yes, it, it says to put an ad in the personal column of the clarion, address to safety. And let them know what I decide. Good. Put the ad in the clarion. Tell them you're willing to pay the money and ask them how they want it paid. All right, Mr. Carter, but but how about, well, what they have to say about getting rid of you? You know what I... I understand, Mrs. Ascord. Tell them in the ad that you'll guarantee that I'll have nothing further to do with the case. Oh, but that... that would be a lie, wouldn't it? Yes, of course it would. But would you prefer that the kidnappers kill your son? Oh, oh no, of course not, Mr. Carter. All right, then. Put the ad in, just as I said. And let me know the minute you get an answer. Then we'll plan our next step. Oh, Mr. Carter, I'm so glad you've come. An answer to the ad that I put in the paper just came in the morning mail. Here it is. Thank you. On Route 77B, five and two-tenths miles north of Route 31, is a large single oak tree right beside the road. It's the only tree around. Make up a bundle of ten, twenty, and fifty-dollar bills, one hundred thousand dollars in all. Throw the bundle out at the foot of the tree this afternoon at five o'clock sharp. Drive by at not less than twenty-five miles an hour, and do not stop. Your son will be sent back to you tomorrow morning. You'll be alive if you follow directions. He'll be dead if you don't. Gosh. Mm -hmm. Patsy, hmm? where's that map I asked you to bring along? Here it is, Nick. Well, I still don't know how you could tell what section of the state we're going to need a map of. Well, Patsy, when I went back to the gang's hideout yesterday afternoon, it was deserted. The only things I could find that interested me were a rough draft of the original kidnap note made in the back of an envelope addressed to Jack Vincent. Mm -hmm. And also a timetable showing trains running to a certain part of the state. Well, what part was that, Nick? The part I asked you to bring the map of. Very simple. Very simple. To you. Well, where is it? Here. Now, let's see. Route 77B is here. Route 316 crosses it right here. Mm -hmm. It's about 45 miles out of the city in a very thinly settled section. What shall we do about it, Mr. Carter? We'll do just exactly as the note says. Have your bankers make up the bundle of $100,000 in 10s, 20s, and 50s. Yes. Sir. Take Patsy with you. And have your chauffeur drive you up to the spot designated in this note. Throw the bundle out, and then leave the rest to me. Well, 
Well, I'm sure glad it's clear today. Otherwise, we'd be out of luck. See anything, Scubby? No, not yet. Hey, Nick, do you suppose anything has gone wrong? No, I doubt it. I have entire faith in Patsy's ability to follow instructions. Gee, sure is sort of deserted around here, isn't it? Yes. Only a few scattered houses and very little traffic. Oh, here, Scubby. Suppose you take over the controls of the plane for a while while I take the glasses and have a look around. Oh, sure, Nick. Here you are. Thanks. Got the stick? Yeah. All set. These glasses are really high-powered, aren't they? Hey. I think I could... Yes, yes, there they are. And right on time. Are you sure this is the right road, James? Yes, Miss Asgore, this is the right road. Oh, I'd feel so much safer if Mr. Carter were here. Why, if any little thing were to go wrong, it it might mean my boy's life. That's why I'm here, Mrs. Asgore, just to see that nothing does go wrong. Uh, the place you want is about a half a mile ahead, Mrs. Asgore. Oh, dear, so soon? Oh, I... Oh, I'm all of a jitter, Miss Bowen. You'll have to throw the package out. I, I just can't do it. Now, don't you worry, Mrs. Asgore. I'll take care of everything. Uh, uh, slow down just a little, will you please, James? Yes, miss. Well, I wish I knew how Nick is planning to get the money back. The gang could go anywhere from here and we'd never know where it was. Oh, I hope Mr. Carter won't do anything to, to interfere with my getting my boy back. He's worth all the money I have. You can trust Nick to do the right thing. There's the tree, just ahead. Oh. Now, help me up with the package. All right. That's it. Careful now. I'm going to let it go out the window. There it goes. Well, that's that. Oh, you're wonderful, Miss Bowen. Did you see anybody? No. No, nobody. Not a soul around here anywhere. I still can't see anybody. The bundle is still right by the side of the road where it fell. Oh, heck, this curve cuts off the view entirely. Well, at least we've done our part. Yes, we've done our part. The rest is up to Nick. Yep, those are Nick's orders, Sheriff. Drive as close to the house as you can and then park your car in the bushes just off the road. Okay. Uh, where's Carter now? Oh, well, he went on ahead to get the layout of the place. Wants to get his plan set by the time we get there. I don't understand how you know them fellas are hiding out there. You say neither you nor Carter have ever been near the house. Well, I'll tell you, Sheriff, it's really very simple. When Mrs. Ascourt dropped the bundle of money out of her car this afternoon, Nick and I were overhead in Nick's plane watching everything through his extra high-powered field glasses. Huh, well. Yeah. We saw the crooks come and pick up the money, and then we watched them beat it back to the farmhouse. <laughs> they took every back road and cow path they could find to keep from being followed, but we could see them, no matter where they went. Yeah. Well, All the time, the one man that they were really afraid of was up there over their heads watching them. <laughs> hey, that's quite a stunt. I've heard tell this Nick Carter's quite a feller. <laughs> Darn if I don't believe it now. Well, darn if you don't head better. <laughs> well, we better stop here, huh? Don't dare go no closer to the house with the car. I'll just run her off into the bushes here. <sighs> well, I wonder where Nick is. He ought to be here any minute. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So good. They haven't seen me yet. Yeah. yeah, this is the window where the boys can be, if I'm right. Hmm. Too dark to see what's inside the room. I'm gonna have to take a chance and climb through the window and see for myself. Locked. Well, I want to be able to slip the latch on an old window like this. This knife will do it, I think. It all my longer. I guess it's safe to use my flashlight here. Yeah, there he is. Oh, Harold. Harold. Oh. Quiet, quiet. Not a sound. Keep absolutely quiet. You all right? Yeah. Caught a pretty bad cold yesterday, though. But who are you? You're not one of the kidnappers. No, 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 no. I'm not one of the gang. I'm, I'm Nick Carter. Nick Carter? Yes. Gee, I've heard of you. You're going to save me, huh? That's just what I'm going to do. I'll get these ropes off your arms and legs first. Yeah. <coughs> there we are. Uh, if 
Feel better? Gosh, yes. Now see if you can stand up. Well, it's not very easy yet, but I'll be all right. Good boy. Now, we've got to get you out of here pronto before one of the gang comes up to have a look at you. All right. How do we get out? Out of the window, same as I came in. All right, come on now. Quiet. Okay. Whatever you say, Mr. Carter. Climb out the window under the roof. Easy now. Easy. That's the boy. Gee, it's dark out here. Can't see anything, hardly. Just follow me. There's a post in the corner of the porch we can slide down. I came up it. Careful now. There it is. Here we are. Okay. I'll come right behind you. You go ahead, Mr. Carter. Not Mr. Carter, Harold. Just call me Nick. Gosh, Nick. <laughs> Am I going to have something to tell the fellas when I get back home? All right. Here uh, we come. That's uh, the boy. Gee, that was easy, wasn't it? All right, son? Sure. Let's get going away from here. All right. My friend Scubby and the sheriff want to be over there on the edge of the brush. Hey, is that you, Nick? Yes, Scubby. And I have the boy, too. Suffer and catfish, Mr. Carter. How in heaven's name do you get him out of there without getting caught? It was easy. Nick's a good detective. I bet he can do anything. Well, thanks for the plug, Harold. Now, here's my idea. Are the three of them still in the living room where they were a few minutes ago? Yeah, I just took a look and they're still there. What's your idea, Carter? Well, this is it. They think Harold is still tied up nice and snug in his attic room. Now, if they should happen to hear him out here in front of the house, they'd probably come rushing out to see what's up, wouldn't they? Sure. Well, go on, Nick. Well, I don't want any shooting if I can help it. Somebody might get hurt. So you and I will stand one on each side of the front door, Scubby, while the sheriff goes around to the back door, ready to come up from behind them. Yeah, yeah. Then Harold will stand out here in front of the house and shout good and loud. They'll come out to see what's what. And we'll poke our guns in their backs. No shooting, no trouble. All nice and simple. Gee, that's swell. What'll I yell, Nick? Oh, whatever comes into your head. Anything at all. Okay, Sheriff? Yep. Sounds nice and simple, if it works. Well, here goes your rear guard. Come on, Scubby, and get your guns ready. Okay. And Harold, if anything goes wrong, you run for the woods. They'll never find you out there on a back night like this. Okay, Nick. When do I yell? Count five slowly. That'll give Scubby and me time to get into position beside the door. Okay. One, two, three, four, five. Range of the Mounted. Yippee! Wow! What the devil is the kid doing out here? Get your hands, hands up, up and fast. Place. Don't try reaching for your guns. We've got you surrounded. Nick Carter, how did you... Just say? keep those hands in the air, Vincent. Okay. All right, Scubby, get the guns. Okay, Nick. Here it Ah, only one on Ben. And two on our friend Jack. All right, just come along here now. Stop it. Hey, Why this gal trying to skip out the back way, so I brought her along. She belongs to this outfit? Well, I'll say she does. She was the one who watched me while the men went out for the money. Well, looks like we got everything, don't it? Yeah, it certainly does, Sheriff. Everything but the ransom money, which must be here in the house somewhere. Nick, hmm? can I hold a gun on one of them? Why, sure, son. Yeah, take Jack's gun. And keep it pointed right at him all the time. Hey, Carter, don't let that kid have that gun. He don't know nothing about guns. It might go off and somebody'd get hurt. You're quite right, Vincent. But would it interest you to know that I wouldn't care if it did? As far as I'm concerned, kidnappers are pretty filthy things. The lowest of the low. Oh, Mr. Carter. How can I ever repay you for what you've done for me and my boy? Well, I'm very happy that we were able to get the boy back for you, Mrs. Ascot. And the money, too. Oh, please tell me how much I owe you, Mr. Carter. I want to send you a check at once, a, a big one. You owe me nothing, Mrs. Ascot. Oh, but Mr. Carter... If you really I... want to repay me, I suggest that you put at least an extra $10,000 into war bonds in this fourth war loan drive and give the bonds to the Associated Boys Clubs of the city. I can think of no better way to spend money right now. Buying the bonds helps the boys who are fighting for us today. And giving the bonds to the boys' clubs helps the boys of tomorrow. It's a wonderful combination. This has been another of the strange adventures of Nick Carter, Master Detective which are brought to you regularly at this same time by WOR Mutual. What can you tell us about next week's story, Nick? Well, all I'm going to tell you about it is this. There's such a weird and unusual case that for the only time in my life, I was almost compelled to believe that vampires really do exist. 
I call it Death After Dark, or the mystery of the vampire killing. So long. So long, Nick. See you next week. In the strange adventure you have just heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark, Patsy by Helen Choate, Scubby by John Kane. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was written and directed by Jock McGregor. Next week at the same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter entitled... Death After Dark. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Vampire Killings. This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. The return of Nick Carter is broadcast in the studios of WOR and is broadcast over most of these stations every week. This is Mutual.